The Treasure Ship by Hector Hugh Munro. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Treasure Ship. The great galleon lay in a semi-retirement under the sand and weed and water of the northern bay, where the fortune of war and weather had long ago ensconced it. Three and a quarter centuries had passed since the day when it had taken the high seas as an important unit of fighting squadron, precisely which squadron the learned were not agreed. The galleon had brought nothing into the world, but it had, according to tradition and report, taken much out of it. But how much? There again the learned were in disagreement. Some were as generous in their estimates as an income tax assessor. Others applied a species of higher criticism to the submerged treasure chests and debased their contents to the currency of goblin gold. Of the former school was Lulu, Duchess of Dulverton. The Duchess was not only a believer in the existence of a sunken treasure of alluring proportions. She also believed that she knew of a method by which the said treasure might be precisely located and cheaply disembedded. An aunt of her mother's side of the family had been maid of honor at the court of Monaco and had taken a respectful interest in the deep-sea researches, in which the throne of that country, impatient perhaps of the terrestrial restrictions, was wont to immerse itself. It was through the instrumentality of this relative that the Duchess learned of her invention, perfected and very nearly patented by a Monegascan savant, by means of which the home life of the Mediterranean sardine might be studied at a depth of many fathoms in a cold white light of more than ballroom brilliancy implicated in this invention and in the duchess's eyes the most attractive part of it was an electric suction dredge specially designed for dragging to the surface such objects of interest and value as might be found in the more accessible levels of the ocean bed the rights of the invention were to be acquired for a matter of eighteen hundred francs and the paradise for a few thousand more the Duchess of Dulverton was rich, as the world counted wealth. She nursed the hope of being one day rich at her own competition. Companies had been formed and efforts had been made again and again during the course of three centuries to probe for the alleged treasures of the interesting galleon. With the aid of this invention, she considered that she might go to work on the wreck privately and independently. After all, one of her ancestors on her mother's side were descended from Medina Sidonia. So she was of the opinion that she had as much right to the treasure as anyone. She acquired the invention and brought the parrot. Among other family ties and encumbrances, Lulu possessed a nephew, Vasco Honiton, a young gentleman who was blessed with a small income and a large circle of relatives, and lived impartially and precariously on both. The name Vasco had been given him, possibly in the hope that he might live up to its adventurous tradition. But he limited himself strictly to the home industry of adventurer, preferring to exploit the assured rather to explore the unknown. Lulu's intercourse with him had been restricted of recent years to the negative processes of being out of town when he called on her and short of money when he wrote to her. Now, however, she bethought herself of his imminent suitability for the direction of a treasure-seeking experiment. If anyone could extract gold from an unpromising situation, it would certainly be Vasco, of course, under the necessary safeguards in the way of supervision. Where money was in question, Vasco's conscience was liable to fits of obstinate silence. Somewhere on the west coast of Ireland, the Dulverton property included a few acres of shingle, rock, and heather, too barren to support even an agrarian outrage. But embracing a small and fairly deep bay where the lobster yield was good in most seasons. There was a bleak little house on the property, and for those who liked lobsters and solitude and were able to accept Irish cook's ideas as to what might be perpetrated in the name of mayonnaise, Innes Gluther was a tolerable exile during the summer months. Lulu seldom went there herself, but she lent the house lavishly to friends and relations. She put it now at Vasco's disposal. It will be the very place to practice and experiment with the salvage apparatus, she said. The bay is quite deep in places, and you will be able to test everything thoroughly before starting on the treasure hunt. In less than three weeks, Vasco turned up in town to report progress. The paratus works beautifully, he informed his aunt. The deeper one got, the clearer everything grew. We found something in the way of a sunken wreck to operate on, too. A wreck in Innesgluther Bay? exclaimed Lulu. A 
a submerged motorboat, the Sub Rosa, said Vasco. No, really, said Lulu. Poor Billy Utley's boat. I remember it went down somewhere off that coast some three years ago. His body was washed ashore at the point. People said at that time that boat was capsized intentionally, a case of suicide, you know. People always say that sort of things when anything tragic happens. In this case, they were right, said Vasco. What do you mean? asked the Duchess hurriedly. What makes you think so? I know, said Vasco simply. No? How can you know? How can anyone know? The thing happened three years ago. In a locker of the Sub Rosa, I found a watertight strong box. It contained papers. Vasco paused with dramatic effect and searched for a moment in the inner breast pocket of his coat. He drew out a folded slip of paper. The Duchess snatched at it in almost indecent haste and moved appreciably nearer the fireplace. Was this in the Sub Rosa strong box? she asked. Oh no, said Vasco carelessly. This is a list of the well known people who would be involved in a very disagreeable scandal if the Sub Rosa's papers were made public. I put you at the head of it. Otherwise, it follows alphabetical order. The Duchess gazed helplessly at the string of names, which seemed for the moment to include nearly everyone she knew. As a matter of fact, her own name at the head of the list exercised an almost paralyzing effect on her thinking faculties. Of course, you have destroyed the papers, she asked, when she had somewhat recovered herself. She was conscious that she made the remark with an entire lack of conviction. Vasco shook his head. But you should have, said Lulu angrily. If, as you say, they are highly compromising. Oh, they are. I assure you of that, interposed the young man. Then you should put them out of harm's way at once. Supposing anything should leak out, think of all these poor, unfortunate people who would be involved in the disclosures, said Lulu, tap the list with an agitated gesture. Unfortunate, perhaps, but not poor, corrected Vasco. If you read the list carefully, you will notice that I haven't troubled to include anyone whose financial standing isn't above question. Lulu glared at her nephew for some moments in silence. Then she asked hoarsely, What are you going to do? Nothing for the remainder of my life, he answered meanly. A little hunting, perhaps, he continued, and I shall have a villa at Florence. The Villa Sabrosa would sound rather quaint and picturesque, don't you think? And quite a lot of people would be able to attach a meaning to the name. And I suppose I have a hobby. I shall probably collect ribbons. Lulu's relative, who lived at the court of Monaco, got quite a snappish answer when she wrote recommending some further invention in the realm of marine research. End of The Treasure Ship by Pooja Dube, Mumbai, India An Ancient Ghost Story by Pliny the Younger Translated by William Melmoth Translation revised by R. W. Stedman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. An Ancient Ghost Story by Pliny the Younger. There was in Athens a house, spacious and open, but with an infamous reputation as if filled with pestilence, for in the dead of night a noise like the clashing of iron could be heard, and if one listened carefully, it sounded like the rattling of chains. At first the noise seemed to be at a distance, but then it would approach nearer, nearer, nearer. Suddenly a phantom would appear, an old man, pale and emaciated, with a long beard and hair that appeared driven by the wind. The fetters on his feet and hands rattled as he moved them. Any dwellers in the house passed sleepless nights under the most dismal terrors imaginable. The nights without rest led them to a kind of madness. And as the horrors in their minds increased, onto a path to a death. Even in the daytime, when the phantom did not appear, the memory of the nightmare was so strong that it still passed before their eyes. The terror remained when the cause of it was gone. Damned as uninhabitable, 
the house was at last deserted, left to the spectral monster but in hope that some tenant might be found who was unaware of the malevolence within it, the house was posted for rent or sale. It happened that a philosopher named Athenodorus came to Athens at that time. Reading the posted bill, he discovered the dwelling's price. The extraordinary cheapness raised his suspicion. Yet when he heard the whole story, he was not in the least put off. Indeed, he was eager to take the place and did so immediately. As evening drew near, Athenodorus had a couch prepared for him in the front section of the house. He asked for a light, and his writing materials, then dismissed his retainers. To keep his mind from being distracted by vain terrors of imaginary noises and apparitions, he directed all his energy toward his writing. For a time the night was silent. Then came the rattling of fetters. Athenodorus neither lifted up his eyes nor laid down his pen. Instead, he closed his ears by concentrating on his work. But the noise increased and advanced closer, till it seemed to be at the door, and at last in the very chamber. Athenodorus looked around and saw the apparition exactly as it had been described to him. It stood before him, beckoning with one finger. Athenodorus made a sign with his hand that the visitor should wait a little, and bent over his work. The ghost, however, shook the chains over the philosopher's head, beckoning as before. Athenodorus now took up his lamp and followed. The ghost moved slowly, as if held back by his chains. Once it reached the courtyard, it suddenly vanished. Athenodorus, now deserted, carefully marked the spot with a handful of grass and leaves. The next day he asked the magistrate to have the spot dug up. There they found, intertwined with chains, the bones that were all that remained of a body that had long lain in the ground. Carefully the skeletal relics were collected and given proper burial at public expense. The tortured ancient was at rest, and the house in Athens was haunted no more. End of An Ancient Ghost Story by Pliny the Younger Translated by William Melmoth Revised translation by R. W. Stedman. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. Captain Murderer by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Captain Murderer by Charles Dickens If we all knew our own minds in a more enlarged sense than the popular acceptation of that phrase, I suspect we should find our nurses responsible for most of the dark corners we are forced to go back to against our wills. The first diabolical character who intruded himself on my peaceful youth was a certain Captain Murderer. This wretch must have been an offshoot of the Bluebeard family. But I had no suspicion of the consanguinity in those times. His warning name would seem to have awakened no general prejudice against him, for he was admitted into the best society and possessed immense wealth. Captain Murderer's mission was matrimony, and the gratification of a cannibal appetite with tender brides. On his marriage morning, he caused both sides of the way to church to be planted with curious flowers. And when his bride said, Dear Captain Murderer, I never saw flowers like these before. What are they called? He answered, They are called garnish for house lamb. And laughing at his ferocious practical joke in a horrid manner, disquieting the minds of the noble bridal company with a very sharp show of teeth, then displayed for the first time. He made love in a coach and six, and married in a coach and twelve, and all his horses were milk-white horses, with one red spot on the back, which he caused to be hidden by the harness. For the spot would come there, even though every horse was milk-white when Captain Murderer bought him. And the spot was young bride's blood. To this terrific point I am indebted for my personal experience of a shudder and cold beads on the forehead. 
when Captain Murderer had made an end of feasting and revelry, and had dismissed the noble guests and was alone with his wife on the day month after their marriage, it was his whimsical custom to produce a golden rolling pin and a silver pie bode. Now, there was this special feature in the captain's courtships, that he always asked if the young lady could make pie crust, and if she couldn't, by nature or education, she was taught. Well, when the bride saw Captain Murderer produce the golden rolling pin and silver pie board, she remembered this, and turned up her laced silk sleeves to make a pie. The captain brought out a silver pie dish of immense capacity, and the captain brought out flour and butter and eggs and all things needful, except the inside of the pie, of materials for the staple of the pie itself. The captain brought out none. Then said the lovely bride, Dear Captain Murderer, what pie is this to be? He replied, A meat pie. Then said the lovely bride, Dear Captain Murderer, I see no meat. The captain humorously retorted, Look in the glass. She looked in the glass, but still she saw no meat. And then the captain roared with laughter, and suddenly frowning and drawing his sword, bade her roll out the crust. So she rolled out the crust, dropping large tears upon it all the time, because he was so cross. And when she had lined the dish with crust, and had cut the crust all ready to fit the top, the captain called out, I see meat in the glass. And the bride looked up at the glass, just in time to see the captain cutting her head off. And he chopped her in pieces, and peppered her, and salted her, and put her in the pie, and sent it to the bakers, and ate it all, and picked the bones. Captain Murderer went on this way, prospering exceedingly, until he came to choose a bride from two twin sisters, and at first didn't know which to choose. For though one was fair and the other dark, they were both equally beautiful. But the fair twin loved him, and the dark twin hated him, so he chose the fair one. The dark twin would have prevented the marriage if she could, but she couldn't. However, on the night before it, much suspecting Captain Murderer, she stole out and climbed his garden wall, and looked in at his window through a chink in the shutter, and saw him having his teeth filed sharp. Next day she listened all day, and heard him make his joke about the house lamb. And that day month he had the paste rolled out, and cut the fair twin's head off, and chopped her in pieces, and peppered her, and salted her, and put her in the pie, and sent it to the baker's, and ate it all and picked the bones. Now the dark twin had had her suspicions, much increased by the filing of the captain's teeth, and again by the house lamb joke. Putting all things together, when he gave out that her sister was dead, she divined the truth and determined to be revenged. So she went up to Captain Murderer's house, and knocked at the knocker, and pulled at the bell. And when the captain came to the door, said, Dear Captain Murderer, marry me next, for I always loved you and was jealous of my sister. The captain took it as a compliment, and made a polite answer, and the marriage was quickly arranged. On the night before it, the bride again climbed to his window, and again saw him having his teeth filed sharp. At this sight she laughed such a terrible laugh at the chink in the shutter that the captain's blood curdled, and he said, I hope nothing has disagreed with me. At that she laughed again, a still more terrible laugh, and the shutter was opened and search made, but she was nimbly gone, and there was no one. Next day they went to church in a coach, and twelve, and were married. And that day month she rolled the pie crust out, and Captain Murderer cut her head off, and chopped her in pieces, and peppered her, and salted her, and put her in the pie, and sent it to the baker's, and ate it all, and picked the bones. But before she began to roll out the paste, she had taken a deadly poison of a most awful character, distilled from toad's eyes and spider's knees, and Captain Murderer had hardly picked the last bone when he began to swell and to turn blue and to be all over spots and to scream, and he went on swelling and turning bluer and being more all over spots and screaming until he reached from floor to ceiling and from wall to wall, and then at one o'clock in the morning, 
he blew up with a loud explosion. At the sound of it, all the milk-white horses in the stables broke their halters and went mad, and then they galloped over everybody in Captain Murderer's house, beginning with the family blacksmith who had filed his teeth, until the whole were dead. And then they galloped away. End of Captain Murderer by Charles Dickens Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama Reality or Delusion by Mrs. Henry Wood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. Reality or Delusion by Mrs. Henry Wood This is a ghost story. Every word of it is true. And I don't mind confessing that for ages afterwards, some of us did not care to pass the spot alone at night. Some people do not care to pass it yet. It was autumn, and we were at Crab Cot. Lena had been ailing, and in October Mrs. Todd Hetley proposed to the squire that they should remove with her there to see if the change would do her good. We Worcestershire people call North Crab a village, but one might count the houses in it, little and great, and not find four and twenty. South Crab, half a mile off, is even so much larger. But the church and school are at North Crab. John Ferrer had been employed by Squire Todd Hetley as a sort of overlooker on the estate, or working bailiff. He had died the previous winter, leaving nothing behind him except some debts, for he was not provident. And his handsome son Daniel, Daniel Ferrer, who was rather superior as far as education went, disliked work. He would make a show of helping his father, but it came to little. Old Ferrer had not put him to any particular trade or occupation, and Daniel, who was as proud as Lucifer, would not turn to it himself. He liked to be a gentleman. All he did now was to work in his garden, and feed his fowls, ducks, rabbits, and pigeons, of which he kept a great quantity selling them to the houses around, and sending them to market. But, as every one said, poultry would not maintain him. Mrs. Lees, in the pretty cottage hard by Ferrer's, grew tired of saying it. This Mrs. Lees and her daughter, Maria, must not be confounded with Lees the pointsman. They were in a better condition of life, and not related to him. Daniel Ferrer used to run in and out of their house at will when a boy, and he was now engaged to be married to Maria. She would have a little money, and the leases were respected in North Crab. People began to whisper a query as to how Ferrer got his corn for the poultry. He was not known to buy much, and he would have to go out of his house at Christmas, for its owner, Mr. Coney, had given him notice. Mrs. Lees, anxious about Maria's prospects, asked Daniel what he intended to do then, and he answered, make his fortune. He should begin to do it as soon as he could turn himself round. But the time was going on, and the turning round seemed to be as far off as ever. After midsummer, a niece of the schoolmistress's, Mrs. Timmins, had come to the school to stay. Her name was Harriet Rowe. Her father, Humphrey Rowe, was half-brother to Miss Timmins. He had married a Frenchwoman, and lived more in France than in England until his death. The girl had been christened Henriette, but North Crab, notwithstanding much French, converted it to Harriet. She was a showy, free-mannered, good-looking girl, and made a speedy acquaintance with Daniel Ferrer, or he with her. They improved upon it so rapidly that Maria Lees grew jealous, and North Crab began to say he cared for Harriet more than for Maria. When Todd and I got home, the latter end of October, to spend the squire's birthday. Things were in this state. James Hill, the bailiff, who had been taken on by the squire in John Ferrer's place, but a far inferior man to Ferrer, not much better, in fact, than a common workman, and of whose doings you will hear soon in regard to his little stepson, David Garth, gave us an account of matters in general. Daniel Ferrer had been drinking lately, Hill added, and his head was not strong enough to stand it, and he was also beginning to look as if he had some care upon him. 
A nice lot, he, for them two women to be fighting for, cried Hill, who was no friend to Ferrer. There'll be mischief between em if they don't draw in a bit. Maria Lise is next door to mad over it, I know, and to have her finding herself the best light crows over her. It's something like the Bible story of Leah and Rachel, young gents. Dan Ferrer likes the one, and he's bound by promise to the other. As to the French jade, concluded Hill, giving his head a toss, she'd make a show of liking any man that followed her. She would. A dozen of them on a string. It was very well for Surly Hill to call Daniel Ferrer a nice lot. But he was the best-looking fellow in the church on Sunday morning, well-dressed too. But his colour seemed brighter, and his hands shook as they were raised, often to push back his hair. That the sun shone upon through the south window, turning it to gold. He scarcely looked up, not even at Harriet Rowe, with her dark eyes rowing everywhere, and her streaming pink ribbons. Maria Lees was pale, quiet and nice, as usual. She had no beauty, but her face was sensible, and her deep grey eyes had a strange and curious earnestness. The new parson preached, a young man just appointed to the parish of Crabbe. He went in for great observances on saints' days, and told his congregation that he should expect to see them at church on the morrow, which would be the feast of all saints. Daniel Ferrer walked home with Mrs. Lees and Maria after service, and was invited to dinner. I ran across to shake hands with the old dame, who had once nursed me through an illness, and promised to look in and see her later. We were going back to school on the morrow. As I turned away, Harriet Rowe passed, her pink ribbons and her cheap gay silk dress gleaming in the sunlight. She stared at me, and I stared back. And now, the explanation of matters being over, the real story begins. But I shall have to tell some of it as it was told by others. The tea things waited on Mrs. Lee's table in the afternoon waited for Daniel Ferrer. He had left them shortly before to go and attend to his poultry. Nothing had been said about his coming back for tea. That he would do so had been looked upon as a matter of course. But he did not make his appearance, and the tea was taken without him. At half-past five, the church bell rang out for evening service, and Maria put her things on. Mrs. Lees did not go out at night. "'You are starting early, Maria. You'll be in church before other people.' That won't matter, mother. A jealous suspicion lay on Maria, that the secret of Daniel Ferrer's absence was his having fallen in with Harriet Rowe. Perhaps he had gone of his own accord to seek her. She walked slowly along. The gloom of dusk and a deep dusk had stolen over the evening, but the moon would be up later. As Maria passed the schoolhouse, she halted to glance in at the little sitting room window. The shutters were not closed yet, and the room was lighted by the blazing fire. Harriet was not there. She only saw Miss Timmins, the mistress, who was putting on her bonnet before a hand-glass propped upright on the mantelpiece. Without warning, Miss Timmins turned and threw open the window. It was only for the purpose of pulling to the shutters, but Maria thought she must have been observed and spoke. "'Good evening, Miss Timmins.' "'Who is it?' cried out Miss Timmins in answer, peering into the dusk. "'Oh, it's you, Maria Lise. Have you seen anything of Harriet?' She went off somewhere this afternoon and never came in to tea. I have not seen her. She's gone to Batley's, I'll be bound. She knows I don't like her to be with the Batley girls. They make her ten times flightier than she would otherwise be. Miss Timmins threw in her shutters with a jerk, without which they would not close, and Maria Lees turned away. Not at the Batley's, not at the Batley's, but with him, she cried in bitter rebellion as she turned away from the church. From the church, not to it. Was Maria to blame for wishing to see whether she was right or not, for walking about a little in the thought of meeting them? At any rate, it is what she did, and had her reward, such as it was. As she was passing the top of the witty walk, their voices reached her ear. People often walked there, and it was one of the ways to South Crab. Maria drew back amidst the trees, and they came on. Harriet Rowe and Daniel Ferrer, walking arm in arm. "'I think I had better take it off,' Harriet was saying. "'No need to invoke a storm upon my head, and that would come in a shower of hail from stiff old Aunt Timmins.' The answer seemed one of quick accent, but Ferrer spoke low. 
Maria Lees had hard work to control herself. Anger, passion, jealousy, all blazed up. With her arms stretched out to a friendly tree on either side, with her heart beating, with her pulses coursing on to a fever heat, she watched them across the bit of common to the road. Harriet went one way then, he another, in the direction of Mrs. Lees's cottage. No doubt to fetch her, Maria, to church, with a plausible excuse of having been detained. Until now she had had no proof of his falseness, had never perfectly believed in it. She took her arms from the trees and went forward, a sharp faint cry of despair breaking forth on the night air. Maria Lees was one of those silent-natured girls who can never speak of a wrong like this. She had to bury it within her, down, down, out of sight and show. She went into church with her usual quiet step. Harriet Rowe with Miss Timmins came next, quite demure, as if she had been singing some of the infant scholars to sleep at their own homes. Daniel Ferrer did not go to church at all. He stayed, as was found afterwards, with Mrs. Lees. Maria might as well have been at home as at church, better perhaps that she had been. Not a syllable of the service did she hear. Her brain was a sea of confusion, the tumult within it rising higher and higher. She did not hear even the text, Peace be still, or the sermon, both so singularly appropriate. The passions in men's minds, the preacher said, raged and formed just like the angry waves of the sea in a storm, until Jesus came to still them. I ran after Maria when church was over, and went in to pay the promised visit to old Mother Lees. Daniel Ferrer was sitting in the parlour. He got up and offered Maria a chair at the fire, but she turned her back and stood at the table under the window, taking off her gloves. An open Bible was before Mrs. Lees. I wonder whether she had been reading aloud to Daniel. "'What was the text, child?' asked the old lady. No answer. Do you hear, Maria? What was the text? Maria turned at that, as if suddenly awakened. Her face was white, her eyes had in them an uncertain terror. The text? she stammered. I, I forgot it, mother. It was from Genesis, I think. Was it? Was it, Master Johnny? It was from the fourth chapter of St. Mark. Peace, be still. Mrs. Lee stared at me. Why? That is the very chapter I have been reading. Well, now, that's curious. But there's never a better in the Bible, and never a better text was taken from it than those three words. I have been telling Daniel here, Master Johnny, that when once that peace, Christ's peace, is got into the heart, storms can't hurt as much. And you are going away again tomorrow, sir, she added after a pause. It's a short stay. I was not going away on the morrow. Toad and I, taking the squire in a genial moment after dinner, had pressed to let stay until Tuesday, Toad using the argument and laughing while he did it, that it must be wrong to travel on All Saints' Day, when the parson had especially enjoined us to be at church. The squire told us we were a couple of encroaching rascals, and if he did let us stay, it should be upon condition that we did go to church. This I said to them. He may send you all the same, sir, when the morning comes remarked Daniel Ferrer. Knowing Mr. Todd Hetley as you do, Ferrer, you may remember that he never breaks his promises. Daniel laughed. He grumbles over them, though, Master Johnny. Well, he may grumble tomorrow about our staying, saying it is wasting time that ought to be spent in study. But he will not send us back until Tuesday. Until Tuesday. If I could have foreseen then what would have happened before Tuesday. If all of us could have foreseen, seen the few hours between now and then, depicted as in a mirror, event by event, would it have saved the calamity, the dreadful sin that could never be redeemed? Why, yes, surely it would. Daniel Ferrer turned and looked at Maria. Why don't you come to the fire? I am very well here, thank you. She had sat down where she was, her bonnet touching the curtain. Mrs. Lees, not noticing that anything was wrong, had begun talking about Lena, whose illness was turning to low fever, when the door opened and Harriet Rowe came in. "'What a lovely night it is,' she said, taking off own accord the chair I had not cared to take. For I kept saying I must go. "'Maria, what went with you after church? I hunted for you everywhere.' Maria gave no answer, 
she looked black and angry, and her bosom heaved as if a storm were brewing. Harriet Rose slightly laughed. "'Do you intend to take holiday tomorrow, Mrs. Lees?' "'Me take holiday? What is there in tomorrow to take holiday for?' returned Mrs. Lees. "'I shall,' continued Harriet, not answering the question. "'I have been used to it in France. All Saints' Day is a grand holiday there. We go to church in our best clothes and pay visits afterwards. Following it, like a dark shadow, comes the gloomy Jour des Morts. "'The what?' cried Mrs. Lees, bending her ear. "'The Day of the Dead, All Souls' Day. But you English don't go to the cemeteries to pray.' Mrs. Lees put on her spectacles, which lay upon the open pages of the Bible, and stared at Harriet. Perhaps she thought they might help her to understand. The girl laughed. On All Souls' Day, whether it be wet or dry, the French cemeteries are full of kneeling women draped in black, all praying for the repose of their dead relatives, after the manner of the Roman Catholics. Daniel Ferrer, who had not spoken a word since she came in, but sat with his face to the fire, turned and looked at her, upon which she tossed back her head and her pink ribbons, and smiled till all her teeth were seen. Good teeth they were. As to reverence in her tone, there was none. I have seen them kneeling when the slosh and wet have been ankle-deep. Did you ever see a ghost? added she, with energy. The French believe that the spirits of the dead come abroad on the night of All Saints' Day. You scarcely get a French woman to go out of her house after dark. It is their chief superstition. What is the superstition? questioned Mrs. Lees. Why that? cried Harriet. They believe that the dead are allowed to revisit the world after dark on the eve of all souls, that they hover in the air, waiting to appear to any of their living relatives who may venture out, lest they should forget to pray on the morrow for the rest of their souls. "'Well, I never!' cried Mrs. Lees, staring excessively. "'Did you ever hear the like of that, sir?' turning to me. "'Yes, I've heard of it.' Harriet Rowe looked up at me. I was standing at the corner of the mantelpiece. She laughed a free laugh. "'I say, wouldn't it be fun to go out tomorrow night and meet the ghosts? Only, perhaps, they don't visit this country, as it is not under Rome.' "'Now you just behave yourself before your betters, Harriet Rowe,' put in Mrs. Lees sharply. "'That gentleman is young Mr. Ludlow of Crab Cot. "'And very happy I am to make young Mr. Ludlow's acquaintance,' returned Easy Harriet, flinging back her mantle over her shoulders. "'How hot your parlour is, Mrs. Lees!' The hood of the cloak had caught in a thin chain of twisted gold that she wore round her neck, displaying it to view. She hurriedly folded her cloak together, as if wishing to conceal the chain. But Mrs. Lee's spectacles had seen it. "'What's that you've got on, Harriet? A gold chain?' A moment's pause, and then Harriet Rowe flung back her mantle again, defiance upon her face, and touched the chain with her hand. "'That's what it is, Mrs. Lee's, a gold chain. And a very pretty one, too. Was it your mother's?' It was never anybody's but mine. I had it made a present to me this afternoon, for a keepsake. Happening to look at Maria, I was startled at her face. It was so white and dark, white with emotion, dark with an angry despair that I for one did not comprehend. Harriet Rowe, throwing at her a look of saucy triumph, went out with as little ceremony as she had come in, just calling back a general good night and we heard her footsteps outside getting gradually fainter in the distance. Daniel Ferrer rose. "'I'll take my departure, too, I think. You are very unsociable tonight, Maria.' "'Perhaps I am. Perhaps I have cause to be.' She flung his hand back when he held it out, and in another moment, as if a thought struck her, ran after him into the passage to speak. I, standing near the door in the small room, caught the words. I must have an explanation with you, Daniel Ferrer. Now, tonight, we cannot go on thus for a single hour longer. Not tonight, Maria. I have no time to spare. And I don't know what you mean. You do know. Listen. I will not go to my rest. No, though it were for twenty nights to come until we have had it out. I vow I will not. There. You are playing with me. 
Others have said so, and I know it now. He seemed to speak some quieting words to her, for the tone was low and soothing, and then went out, closing the door behind him. Maria came back and stood with a face and its ghastliness turned from us. And still the old mother noticed nothing. "'Why don't you take your things off, Maria?' she asked. "'Presently,' was the answer. I said good-night in my turn and went away. Halfway home I met Todd with the two young Lexums. The Lexums made us go in and stay to supper. And it was ten o'clock before we left them. "'We shall catch it,' said Todd, setting off at a run. They never let us stay out late on a Sunday evening on account of the reading. But, as it happened, we escaped scot-free this time, for the house was in a commotion about Lena. She had been better in the afternoon, but at nine o'clock the fever returned worse than ever. Her little cheeks and lips were scarlet as she lay on the bed. Her wide-open eyes were bright and glistening. The squire had gone up to look at her and was fuming and fretting in his usual fashion. "'The doctor never sent the medicine.' said patient Mrs. Todd Hetley, who must have been worn out with nursing. She ought to take it. I'm sure she ought. These boys are good to run over to Coles for that, cried the squire. It won't hurt them. It's a fine night. Of course, we were good for it. And we got our caps again, being charged to enjoin Mr. Cole to come over the first thing in the morning. Do you care much about my going with you, Johnny? Toad asked as we were turning out at the door. I am awfully tired. Not a bit. I'd as soon go alone as not. You'll see me back in half an hour. I took the nearest way, flying across the fields at a canter and startling the hares. Mr. Cole lived near South Crab, and I don't believe more than ten minutes had gone by when I knocked at his door. But to get back as quickly was another thing. The doctor was not at home. He had been called out to a patient at eight o'clock and had not yet returned. I went to wait. The servant said he might be expected to come in from minute to minute. It was of no use to go away without the medicine, and I sat down in the surgery in front of the shelves, and fell asleep counting the white jars and physic bottles. The doctor's entrance awoke me. "'I'm sorry you should have had to come over and to wait,' he said. "'When my other patient with whom I was detained a considerable time was done with, I went on to crab cot with a child's medicine which I had in my pocket.' They think I'm very ill tonight, sir. I left her better, and going quietly to sleep. She will soon be well again, I hope. Why, is that the time? I exclaimed, happening to catch sight of the clock as I was crossing the hall. It was near twelve. Mr. Cole laughed, saying time passed quickly when folk were asleep. I went back slowly. The sleep or the canter before it had made me feel as tired as Todd had said he was. It was a night to be abroad in, and to enjoy. Calm, warm light. The moon, high in the sky, illumined every blade of grass, sparkled on the water of the little rivulet, brought out the moss in the grey walls of the old church, played on its round-faced clock, then striking twelve. Twelve o'clock at night at North Crab answers to about three in the morning in London, for country people are mostly in bed and asleep at ten. Therefore, when loud and angry voices struck up in dispute, just as the last stroke of the hour was dying away on the midnight air, I stood still and doubted my ears. I was getting near home then. The sounds came from the back of a building standing alone in a solitary place on the left-hand side of the road. It belonged to the squire, and was called the Yellow Barn, its walls being covered with a yellow wash. But it was, in fact, used as a storehouse for corn. I was passing in front of it when the voices rose upon the air. Round the building I ran and saw Maria Lee's and something else that I could not at first comprehend. In the pursuit of a vow not to go to rest until she had had it out with Daniel Ferrer, Maria had been abroad searching for him. What ill fate brought her looking for him up near our barn, perhaps because she had fruitlessly searched in every other spot. At the back of this barn, up some steps, was an unused door unused partly because it was not required, the principal entrance being in front, partly because the key of it had been for a long time missing. Stealing out at this door, a bag of corn upon his shoulders had come Daniel Ferrer in a smock frock. Maria saw him and stood back in the shade. She watched him lock the door and put the key in his pocket, 
She watched him give the heavy bag a jerk as he turned to come down the steps. Then she burst out. Her loud reproaches petrified him, and he stood there as one suddenly turned to stone. It was at that moment that I appeared. I understood it all too soon. It needed not Maria's words to enlighten me. Daniel Ferrer possessed the lost key, and could come in and out at will in the midnight hours when the world was sleeping, and help himself to the corn. No wonder his poultry throve. No wonder there had been grumblings at crab caught at the mysterious disappearance of the good grain. Maria Lees was decidedly mad in those first few moments. Stealing is looked upon in an honest village as an awful thing, a disgrace, a crime, and there was the night's earlier misery besides. Daniel Ferrer was a thief. Daniel Ferrer was false to her. A storm of words and reproaches poured forth from her in confusion, none of it very distinct. Living upon theft, convicted felon, transportation for life, Squire Todd had least scorn, fattening poultry on stolen goods, burying gold chains with the profits for that bold, flaunting French girl Harriet Rowe, taking his stealthy walks with her. My going up to them stopped the charge. There was a pause, and then Maria, in her mad passion, denounced him to me as a representative, so she put it, of the squire, the breaker-in upon our premises, the robber of our stored corn. Daniel Farrow came down the steps. He had remained still there as a statue, immovable, and turned his white face to me. Never a word in defence, said he. The blow had crushed him. He was a proud man, if any one can understand that and to be discovered in this ill-doing was worse than death to him. "'Don't think of me more hardly than you can help, Master Johnny,' he said in a quiet tone. "'I have been almost tired of my life this long while.' Putting down the bag of corn near the steps, he took the key from his pocket and handed it to me. The man's aspect had so changed, there was something so grievously subdued and sad about him altogether, that I felt as sorry for him as if he had not been guilty. Maria Lees went on in her fiery passion. "'You'll be more tired of it tomorrow, when the police are talking to you in Worcester Gow. Squire Todd Hetley will not spare you, though your father was his many years bailiff. He could not, you know, if he wished. Master Ludlow has seen you in the act.' "'Let me have the key again for a minute, sir,' he said as quietly as though he had not heard a word, and I gave it to him. I'm not sure, but I should have given him my head had he asked for it. He swung the bag on his shoulders, unlocked the granary door, and put the bag beside the other sacks. The bag was his own, as we found afterwards, but he left it there. Locking the door again, he gave me the key and went away with a weary step. Goodbye, Master Johnny. I answered back good night civilly, though he had been stealing. When he was out of sight, Maria Lees, her passion full upon her still, dashed off toward her mother's cottage, a strange cry of despair breaking from her lips. "'Where have you been lingering, Johnny?' roared the squire who was sitting up for me. "'You have been throwing at the owls, sir. That's what you have been at. You have been scudding after the hares.' I said I had waited for Mr. Cole, and had come back slower than I went. But I said no more, and went up to my room at once. And the squire went to his. I know I am only a muff. People tell me so, often, but I can't help it. I did not make myself. I lay awake till nearly daylight, first wishing Daniel Ferrer could be screamed, and then thinking it might perhaps be done, if he would only take the lesson to heart and go straight for the future. What a capital thing it would be. We had liked old Ferrer. He had done me and Todd many a good turn, and for that matter we liked Daniel so I never said a word when morning came of the past night's work. "'Is Daniel home?' I asked, going to Ferrer's the first thing before breakfast. I meant to tell him that if he would keep right, I would keep counsel. "'He went out at dawn, sir,' answered the old woman who did for him, and sold his poultry at market. "'He'll be in presently. He have had no breakfast yet.' "'Then tell him when he comes to wait in and see me. Tell him it's all right.' Can you remember, Goody? It is all right. I'll remember, safe enough, Master Ludlow. Todd and I, being on our honour, went to church, and found ten people in the pews. 
Harriet Rowe was one, with her pink ribbons, the twisted gold chain showing outside a shortcut velvet jacket. "'No, sir, he has not been home yet. I can't think where he can have got to,' was the old goody's reply, when I went again to Ferrer's. And so I wrote a word in pencil and told her to give it to him when he came in, for I could not go dodging there every hour of the day. After luncheon, strolling by the back of the barn, a certain reminiscence, I suppose, taking me there, for it was not a frequented spot, I saw Maria Lees coming along. Well, it was a change. The passionate woman of the previous night had subsided into a poor, wild-looking, sorrow-stricken thing, ready to die of remorse. Excessive passion had wrought its usual consequences, a reaction, a reaction in favour of Daniel Ferrer. She came up to me, clasping her hands in agony, beseeching that I would spare him, that I would not tell of him, that I would give him a chance for the future. And her lips quivered and trembled, and there were dark circles round her hollow eyes. I said that I had not told and did not intend to tell, upon which she was going to fall down on her knees, but I rushed off. "'Do you know where he is?' I asked when she came to her sober senses. "'Oh, I wish I did know, Master Johnny. He is just the man to go and do something desperate. He would never face shame. And I was a mad, hard-hearted, wicked girl to do what I did last night. He might run away to sea. He might go and enlist for a soldier. I dare say he is at home by this time. I have left a word for him there, and promised to go in and see him tonight. If he will undertake not to be up to wrong things again, no one shall ever know of this from me. She went away easier, and I sauntered on towards South Crab. Eager as Todd and I had been for the day's holiday, it did not seem to be turning out much of a boon. In going home again, there was nothing worth staying out for. I had come to the spot by the three-cornered grove where I saw Maria, when a galloping policeman overtook me. My heart stood still, for I thought he must have come after Daniel Ferrer. "'Can you tell me if I am near to grab caught, Squire Todd Headley's?' he asked, reining in his horse. You will reach it in a minute or two. I live there. Squire Todd Hetley is not at home. What do you want with him? It's only to give in an official paper, sir. I have to leave one personally upon all the county magistrates. He rode on. When I got in, I saw the folded paper upon the hall table. The man and horse had already gone onwards. It was worse indoors than out, less to be done. Todd had disappeared after church. The squire was abroad. Mrs. Todd Hetley sat upstairs with Lena, and I strolled out again. It was only three o'clock then. An hour or more was got through somehow. Meeting one, talking to another, throwing at the ducks and geese, anything. Mrs. Lees had her head smothered in a yellow shawl, stretched out over the palings as I passed a cottage. "'Don't catch cold, mother. I am looking for Maria, sir. I can't think what has come to her today, Master Johnny,' she added dropping a voice to a confidential tone. The girl seems demented. She has been going in and out ever since daylight like a dog in a fair. If I meet her, I will send her home. And in another minute, I did meet her, for she was coming out of Daniel Ferrer's yard. I supposed he was at home again. No, she said, looking more wild, worn, haggard than before. That's what I have been to ask. I am just out of my senses, sir. He has gone for certain, gone. I did not like it. He would not be likely to go away without clothes. Well, I know he is, Master Johnny. Something tells me. I have been all about everywhere. There is a great dread upon me, sir. I have never felt anything like— Wait until night, Maria. I dare say he will go home then. Your mother is looking out for you. I said if I met you, I'd send you in. Mechanically she turned towards the cottage, and I went on. Presently, as I was sitting on a gate watching the sunset, Harriet Rowe passed towards the withy walk, and gave me a nod in her free but good-natured way. "'Are you going there to look out for the ghosts this evening?' I asked, and I wished not long afterwards that I had not said it. "'It will soon be dark.' "'So it will,' she said, turning to the red sky in the west. But I have no time to give to the ghosts tonight. Have you seen Ferrer today? I cried, an idea occurring to me. No. 
and I can't think where he has got to, unless he is off to Worcester. He told me he should have to go there some day this week. She evidently knew nothing about him, and went on away with another free and easy nod. I sat on the gate till the sun had gone down, and then thought it was time to be getting homewards. Close against the yellow barn, the scene of last night's trouble, whom should I come upon but Maria Lees? She was standing still, and turned quickly at the sound of my footsteps. Her face was bright again, but had a puzzled look upon it. "'I have just seen him. He is not gone,' she said in a happy whisper. "'You were right, Master Johnny, and I was wrong. Where did you see him?' "'Here, not a minute ago. I saw him twice. He is angry, very, and will not let me speak to him. Both times he got away before I could reach him. He is close by somewhere.' I looked around, naturally, but Pharaoh was nowhere to be seen. There was nothing to conceal him except the barn, and that was locked up. The account she gave was this and her face grew puzzled again as she related it. Unable to rest indoors, she had wandered up here again, and saw Pharaoh standing at the corner of the barn, looking very hard at her. She thought he was waiting for her to come up, but before she got close to him he had disappeared, and she did not see which way. She hastened past the front of the barn, ran round to the back, and there he was. He stood near the steps looking out for her, waiting for her, as it again seemed and was gazing at her with the same fixed stare. But again she missed him before she could quite get up, and it was at that moment that I arrived in the scene. I went all round the barn, but I could see nothing of Pharaoh. It was an extraordinary thing where he could have got to. Inside the barn he could not be. It was securely locked, and there was no appearance of him in the open country. It was, so to say, broad daylight yet, or at least not far short of it. The red light was still in the west. Beyond the field at the back of the barn was a grove of trees in the form of a triangle, and this grove was flanked by Crab Ravine, which ran right and left. Crab Ravine had the reputation of being haunted, for a light was sometimes seen dodging about its deep descending banks at night that no one could account for, a lively spot altogether for those who like gloom. "'Are you sure it was fairer, Maria?' "'Sure,' she returned in surprise. You don't think I could mistake him, Master Johnny, do you? He wore that ugly sealskin winter cap of his tied over his ears, and his thick grey coat. The coat was buttoned closely round him. I have not seen him wear either since last winter. That fairer must have gone into hiding somewhere seemed quite evident, and yet there was nothing but the ground to receive him. Maria had lost sight of him the last time in a moment. Both times, in fact and it was absolutely impossible that he could have made off to the triangle or elsewhere, as she must have seen him cross the open land. For that matter, I must have seen him also. On the whole, not two minutes had elapsed since I came up, though it seemed to have been longer in telling it, when, before we could look further, voices were heard approaching from the direction of Crab Cot, and Maria, not caring to be seen, went away quickly. I was still puzzled about Ferrer's hiding place, when they reached me, the squire, Todd, and two or three men. Todd came slowly, his face dark and grave. I say, Johnny, what a shocking thing this is. What is a shocking thing? You have not heard of it. But I don't see how you could hear it. I had heard nothing. I did not know what there was to hear. Todd told me in a whisper. Daniel Ferrer's dead, lad. What? He has destroyed himself not more than half an hour ago, hung himself in the grove. I turned sick, taking one thing with another, comparing this recollection with that, which I dare say you will think no one but a muff would do. Ferrer was indeed dead. He had been hiding all day in the three-cornered grove, perhaps waiting for night to get away, perhaps only waiting for night to go home again. Who can tell? About half-past two, Luke McIntosh, a man who sometimes worked for us, sometimes for old Coney, happening to go to the grove, saw him there, and talked with him. The same man, passing back a little before sunset, found him hanging from a tree, dead. McIntosh ran with the news to Crab Cot, and there they were now flocking to the scene. When facts came to be examined, there appeared only too much reason to think that the unfortunate appearance of the galloping policeman had terrified Pharaoh into the act 
Perhaps we all hoped it, had scared his senses quite away. Look at it as we would, it was very dreadful. But what of the appearance Maria Lees saw? At that time, Pharaoh had been dead at least half an hour. Was it reality or delusion? That is, as the squire put it, did her eyes see a real spectral Daniel Pharaoh, or were they deceived by some imagination of the brain? Opinions were divided. Nothing can shake her own steadfast belief in its reality. To her it remains an awful certainty, true and sure as heaven. If I say I believe in it too, I shall be called a muff and a double muff. But there is no stumbling block difficult to be got over. Pharaoh, when found, was wearing the sealskin cap tied over the ears and a thick grey coat buttoned up round him, just as Maria Lees had described to me. And he had never worn them since the previous winter, or taken them out of the chest where they were kept. The old woman at his home did not know he had done it then, but when told he had died in these things, she protested that they were in the chest, and ran up to look for them, but the things were gone. End of Reality or Delusion by Mrs. Henry Wood Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama The White Old Maid by Nathaniel Hawthorne This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto The White Old Maid by Nathaniel Hawthorne The moonbeams came through two deep and narrow windows and showed a spacious chamber richly furnished in an antique fashion. From one lattice the shadow of the diamond panes was thrown upon the floor. The ghostly light through the other slept upon a bed, falling between the heavy silken curtains and illuminating the face of a young man. But how quietly the slumberer lay! How pale his features! And how like a shroud the sheet was wound about his frame! Yes! It was a corpse in its burial clothes. Suddenly the fixed features seemed to move with dark emotion. Strange fantasy. It was but the shadow of the fringed curtain waving betwixt the dead face and the moonlight. As the door of the chamber opened and a girl stole softly to the bedside. Was there delusion in the moonbeams or did her gesture and her eye betray a gleam of triumph, as she bent over the pale corpse, pale as itself, and pressed her living lips to the cold ones of the dead? As she drew back from that long kiss, her features writhed, as if a proud heart were fighting with its anguish. Again it seemed that the features of the corpse had moved responsive to her own. Still an illusion, the silken curtain had waved a second time, betwixt the dead face and the moonlight, as another fair young girl unclosed the door and glided, ghost-like, to the bedside. There the two maidens stood, both beautiful, with the pale beauty of the dead between them. But she who had first entered was proud and stately, and the other a soft and fragile thing. Away! cried the lofty one. Thou hadst him living. The dead is mine. Thine! returned the other, shuddering. Well, hast thou spoken? The dead is thine. The proud girl started and stared into her face with a ghastly look. But a wild and mournful expression passed across the features of the gentle one, and, weak and helpless, she sank down on the bed, her head pillowed beside that of the corpse, and her hair mingling with his dark locks, a creature of hope and joy. The first draught of sorrow had bewildered her. Edith! cried her rival. Edith groaned as with a sudden compression of the heart, 
and removing her cheek from the dead youth's pillow, she stood upright, fearfully encountering the eyes of the lofty girl. "'Wilt thou betray me?' said the latter, calmly. "'Till the dead bid me speak, I will be silent,' answered Edith. "'Leave us alone together. Go and live many years, and then return, and tell me of thy life. He too will be here. Then, if thou tellest of sufferings more than death, we will both forgive thee. And what shall be the token? asked the proud girl, as if her heart acknowledged a meaning in these wild words. This lock of hair, said Edith, lifting one of the dark clustering curls that lay heavily on the dead man's brow. The two maidens joined their hands over the bosom of the corpse and appointed a day and hour, far, far in time to come, for their next meeting in that chamber. The statelier girl gave one deep look at the motionless countenance, and departed, yet turned again and trembled, ere she closed the door, almost believing that her dead lover frowned upon her. And Edith, too, was not her white form fading into the moonlight? Scorning her own weakness, she went forth and perceived that a negro slave was waiting in the passage, with a wax light which he held between her face and his own, and regarded her, as she thought, with an ugly expression of merriment. Lifting his torch on high, the slave lighted her down the staircase, and undid the portal of the mansion. The young clergyman of the town had just ascended the steps and bowing to the lady, passed in without a word. Years, many years rolled on. The world seemed new again. So much older was it grown. Since the night when those pale girls had clasped their hands across the bosom of the corpse, in the interval a lonely woman had passed from youth to extreme age, and was known by all the town as the old maid in the winding sheet. A taint of insanity had affected her whole life, but so quiet, sad, and gentle, so utterly free from violence, that she was suffered to pursue her harmless fantasies unmolested by the world, with whose business or pleasures she had not to do. She dwelt alone, and never came into the daylight except to follow funerals. Whenever a corpse was borne along the street, in sunshine, rain, or snow, whether a pompous train of the rich and proud thronged after it, or few and humble were the mourners, behind them came the lonely woman, in a long white garment which the people called her shroud. She took no place among the kindred or the friends, but stood at the door to hear the funeral prayer, and walked in the rear of the procession, as one whose earthly charge it was to haunt the house of mourning, and be the shadow of affliction, and see that the dead were duly buried. So long had this been her custom, that the inhabitants of the town deemed her a part of every funeral, as much as the coffin pall or the very corpse itself, and augured ill of the sinner's destiny, unless the old maid in the winding sheet came gliding, like a ghost, behind. Once, it is said, she affrighted a bridal party with her pale presence, appearing suddenly in the illuminated hall, just as a priest was uniting a false maid to a wealthy man, before her lover had been dead a year. Evil was the omen to that marriage. Sometimes she stole forth by moonlight, and visited the graves of venerable integrity, and wedded love and virgin innocence, and every spot where the ashes of a kind and faithful heart were mouldering. Over the hillocks of those favoured dead would she stretch out her arms with a gesture, as if she were scattering seeds, and many believed that she brought them from the garden of paradise, for the graves which she had visited were green beneath the snow, and covered with sweet flowers from April to November. 
her blessing was better than a holy verse upon the tombstone. Thus wore away her long, sad, peaceful, and fantastic life, till few were so old as she, and the people of later generations wondered how the dead had ever been buried, or mourners had endured their grief without the old maid in the winding sheet. Still, years went on, and still she followed funerals, and was not yet summoned to her own festival of death. One afternoon, the great street of the town was all alive with business and bustle, though the sun now gilded only the upper half of the church spire, having left the housetops and loftiest trees in shadow. The scene was cheerful and animated, in spite of the sombre shade between the high brick buildings. Here were pompous merchants, in white wigs and lace to velvet, the bronzed faces of sea captains, the foreign garb and air of Spanish creoles, and the disdainful port of natives of old England, all contrasted with the rough aspect of one or two hack settlers negotiating sales of timber from forests where axe had never sounded. Sometimes a lady passed swelling roundly in an embroidered petticoat, balancing her steps in high-heeled shoes, and curtsying, with lofty grace, to the punctilious obeisances of the gentleman. The life of the town seemed to have its very centre not far from an old mansion, that stood somewhat back from the pavement, surrounded by neglected grass, with a strange air of loneliness, rather deepened than dispelled by the throng so near it. Its site would have been suitably occupied by a magnificent exchange, or a brick block, lettered all over with various signs, or the large house itself might have made a noble tavern, with the king's arms swinging before it, and guests in every chamber, instead of the present solitude. But, owing to some dispute about the right of inheritance, the mansion had been long without a tenant decaying from year to year and throwing the stately gloom of its shadow over the busiest part of the town such was the scene and such the time when a figure unlike any that have been described was observed at a distance down the street i espy a strange sail yonder remarked a liverpool captain that woman in the long white garment the sailor seemed much struck by the object, as were several others, who at the same moment caught a glimpse of the figure that had attracted his notice. Almost immediately, the various topics of conversation gave place to speculations, in an undertone, on this unwonted occurrence. "'Can there be a funeral, so late this afternoon?' inquired some. "'They look for the signs of death at every door.' the sexton, the hearse, the assemblage of black-clad relatives, all that makes up the woeful pomp of funerals. They raised their eyes also to the sun-gilt spire of the church, and wondered that no clang proceeded from its bell, which had always tolled till now, when this figure appeared in the light of day. But none had heard that a corpse was to be borne to its home that afternoon, nor was there any token of a funeral except the apparition of the old maid in the winding sheet what may this portend asked each man of his neighbour all smiled as they put the question yet with a certain trouble in their eyes as if pestilence or some other wide calamity were prognosticated by the untimely intrusion among the living of one whose presence had always been associated with death and woe what a comet is to the earth was that sad woman to the town still she moved on while the hum of surprise was hushed at her approach and the proud and the humble stood aside that her white garment might not wave against them it was a long loose robe of spotless purity its wearer appeared very old pale emaciated and feeble yet glided onward without the unsteady pace of extreme age. At one point of a course, a little rosy boy burst forth from a door and ran with open arms towards the ghostly woman 
seeming to expect a kiss from her bloodless lips. She made a slight pause, fixing her eye upon him with an expression of no earthly sweetness, so that the child shivered and stood awestruck, rather than affrighted, while the old maid passed on. Perhaps her garment might have been polluted even by an infant's touch. Perhaps her kiss would have been death to the sweet boy within a year. She is but a shadow, whispered the superstitious. The child put forth his arms and could not grasp her robe. The wonder was increased when the old maid passed beneath the porch of the deserted mansion, ascended the moss-covered steps, lifted the iron knocker and gave three raps. The people could only conjecture that some remembrance, troubling her bewildered brain, had impelled the poor woman hither to visit the friends of her youth, all gone from their home, long since and forever, unless their ghosts still haunted it. Fit company for the old maid in the winding sheet. An elderly man approached the steps and reverently uncovering his grey locks, essayed to explain the matter. None, madam, said he have dwelt in this house these fifteen years are gone no not since the death of old colonel fenwick whose funeral you may remember to have followed his heirs being ill agreed among themselves have let the mansion house go to ruin the old woman looked slowly round with a slight gesture of one hand and a finger of the other upon her lip appearing more shadow-like than ever in the obscurity of the porch. But again she lifted the hammer and gave, this time, a single rap. Could it be that a footstep was now heard, coming down the staircase of the old mansion, which all conceived to have been so long untenanted? Slowly, feebly, yet heavily, like the pace of an aged and infirm person, the step approached more distinct on every downward stair, till it reached the portal. The bar fell on the inside. The door was open. One upward glance towards the church spire, whence the sunshine had just faded, was the last that the people saw of the old maid in the winding sheet. Who undid the door? asked many. This question, owing to the depth of shadow beneath the porch, no one could satisfactorily answer. Two or three aged men, while protesting against an inference which might be drawn, affirmed that the person within was a negro, and bore a singular resemblance to old Caesar, formerly a slave in the house, but freed by death some thirty years before. Her summons had waked up a servant of the old family, said one, half seriously. Let us wait here, replied another. No guests will knock at the door and on, but the gate of the graveyard should be thrown open. Twilight had overspread the town before the crowd began to separate, or the comments on this incident were exhausted. One after another was wending his way homeward, when a coach, no common spectacle in those days, drove slowly into the street. It was an old-fashioned equipage, hanging close to the ground, with arms on the panels, a footman behind, and a grave, corpulent coachman seated high in front, the whole giving an idea of solemn state and dignity. There was something awful in the heavy rumbling of the wheels. The coach rolled down the street, till, coming to the gateway of the deserted mansion, it drew up, and the footman sprang to the ground. "'Whose grand coach is this?' asked a very inquisitive body. The footman made no reply, but ascended the steps of the old house, gave three raps with the iron hammer, and returned to open the coach door. An old man possessed of the heraldic lore so common in that day examined the shield of arms on the panel. Azure, a lion's head he raised between three flower deluces, said he, then whispered the name of the family, to whom these bearings belonged. The last inheritor of its honours was recently dead, after a long residence amid the splendour of the British court, where his birth and wealth had given him no mean station. He left no child, continued the herald. 
and these arms being in a lozenge betoken that the coach appertains to his widow further disclosures perhaps might have been made had not the speaker suddenly been struck dumb by the stern eye of an ancient lady who thrust forth her head from the coach preparing to descend as she emerged the people saw that her dress was magnificent and her figure dignified in spite of age and infirmity a stately ruin but with a look at once of pride and wretchedness her strong and rigid features had an awe about them unlike that of the white old maid but as of something evil she passed up the steps leaning on a gold-headed cane the door swung open as she ascended and the light of a torch glittered on the embroidery of her dress and gleamed on the pillars of the porch after a momentary pause a glance backwards and then a desperate effort she went in the decipherer of the coat of arms had ventured up the lower step and shrinking back immediately pale and tremulous affirmed that the torch was held by the very image of old caesar but such a hideous grin added he was never seen on the face of mortal men black or white it will haunt me till my dying day meantime the coach had wheeled round with a prodigious clatter on the pavement and rumbled up the street disappearing in the twilight while the year still tracked its course scarcely was it gone when the people began to question whether the coach and attendants the ancient lady the spectre of old caesar and the old maid herself were not all a strangely combined illusion with some dark purport in its mystery the whole town was astir so that instead of dispersing the crowd continually increased and stood gazing up at the windows of the mansion now silvered by the brightening moon the elders glad to indulge the narrative propensity of age told of the long faded splendor of the family the entertainments they had given and the guests the greatest of the land and even titled and noble ones from abroad who had passed beneath that portal these graphic reminiscences seemed to call up the ghosts of those to whom they referred so strong was the impression on some of the more imaginative hearers that two or three were seized with trembling fits at one and the same moment protesting that they had distinctly heard three other raps of the iron knocker impossible exclaimed others see the moon shines beneath the porch and shows every part of it except in the narrow shade of that pillar there is no one there did not the door open whispered one of these fanciful persons didst thou see it too said his companion in a startled tone but the general sentiment was opposed to the idea that a third visitant had made application at the door of the deserted house a few however averred to this new marvel and even declared that a red gleam like that of a torch had shone through the great front window as if the negro were lighting a guest up the staircase this too was pronounced a mere fantasy but at once the whole multitude started and each man beheld his own terror painted in the faces of all the rest what an awful thing is this cried they a shriek too fearfully distinct for doubt had been heard within the mansion breaking forth suddenly and succeeded by a deep stillness as if a heart had burst in giving it utterance the people knew not whether to fly from the very sight of the house or to rush trembling in and search out the strange mystery amid their confusion and affright they were somewhat reassured by the appearance of their clergyman a venerable patriarch and equally a saint who had taught them and their fathers the way to heaven for more than the space of an ordinary lifetime he was a reverend figure with long white hair upon his shoulders a white beard upon his breast and a back so bent over his staff that he seemed to be looking downward continually as if to choose a proper grave for his weary frame it was some time before the good old man being deaf and of impaired intellect could be made to comprehend such portions of the affair as were comprehensible at all but when possessed of the facts his energies assumed unexpected vigour verily 
said the old gentleman, it will be fitting that I enter the mansion house of the worthy Colonel Fenwick, lest any harm should have befallen that true Christian woman whom ye call the old maid in the winding sheet. Behold then, the venerable clergyman ascended the steps of the mansion with a torch bearer behind him. It was the elderly man who had spoken to the old maid, and the same who had afterwards explained the shield of arms and recognized the features of the negro. Like their predecessors, they gave three raps with the iron hammer. Old Caesar cometh not, observed the priest. Well, I wot, he no longer doth service in this mansion. Assuredly, then it was something worse, in old Caesar's likeness, said another adventurer. Be it as God wills, answered the clergyman. See, my strength, though it be much decayed, hath sufficed to open this heavy door. Let us enter and pass up the staircase. Here occurred a singular exemplification of the dreamy state of a very old man's mind. As they ascended the wide flight of stairs, the aged clergyman appeared to move with caution, occasionally standing aside, and oftener bending his head, as it were in salutation, thus practising all the gestures of one who makes his way through a throng. Reaching the head of the staircase, he looked round with sad and solemn benignity, laid aside his staff, bared his hoary locks, and was evidently on the point of commencing a prayer. "'Reverend sir,' said his attendant, who conceived this a very suitable prelude to their further search, would it not be well that the people join with us in prayer? Well, a day, cried the old clergyman, staring strangely around him. Art thou here with me and none other? Verily, past times were present to me, and I deemed that I was to make a funeral prayer, as many a time heretofore from the head of the staircase. Of a truth I saw the shades of many that are gone. Yea, I have prayed at their burials, one after another, and the old maid in the winding sheet had seen them to their graves. Being now more thoroughly awake to their present purpose, he took his staff and struck forcibly on the floor, till there came an echo from each deserted chamber, but no menial to answer their summons. They therefore walked along the passage, and again paused, opposite to the great front window, through which was seen the crowd, in the shadow and partial moonlight of the street beneath. On their right hand was the open door of a chamber, and a closed one on their left. The clergyman pointed his cane to the carved oak panel of the latter. Within that chamber, observed he, a whole lifetime since did I sit by the deathbed of a goodly young man, who, being now at the last gasp, Apparently, there was some powerful excitement in the ideas which had now flashed across his mind. He snatched the torch from his companion's hand and threw open the door with such sudden violence that the flame was extinguished, leaving them no other light than the moonbeams which fell through two windows into the spacious chamber. It was sufficient to discover all that could be known. In a high-hacked oaken armchair, upright, with her hands clasped across her breast, and her head thrown back, sat the old maid in the winding sheet. The stately dame had fallen on her knees, with her forehead on the holy knees of the old maid, one hand upon the floor, and the other pressed convulsively against her heart. It clutched a lock of hair, once sable, now discoloured with a greenish mould. As the priest and layman advanced into the chamber, the old maid's features assumed such a resemblance of shifting expression that they trusted to hear the whole mystery explained by a single word. But it was only the shadow of a tattered curtain waving betwixt the dead face and the moonlight. Both dead, said the venerable man. Then who shall divulge the secret? Methinks it glimmers to and fro in my mind like the light and shadow across the old maid's face. And now is gone. End of The White Old Maid 
by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. The Kit Bag by Algernon Black. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Kit Bag by Algernon Blackwood. With the words not guilty sounded through the crowded courtroom that dark December afternoon, Arthur Wilbraham, the great criminal K.C., and leader for the triumphant defence, was represented by his junior. But Johnson, his private secretary, carried the verdict across to his chambers like lightning. "'It's what we expected, I think,' said the barrister, without emotion. "'And personally, I am glad the case is over.' There was no particular sign of pleasure that his defence of John Turk, the murderer, on a plea of insanity, had been successful. For no doubt he felt, as everybody who had watched the face felt, that no man had ever better deserved the gallows. "'I'm glad, too,' said Johnson. He had sat in the court for ten days, watching the face of the man who had carried out with callous detail one of the most brutal and cold-blooded murders of recent years. The counsel glanced up at his secretary. They were more than employer and employed. For family and other reasons, they were friends. "'Ah, I remember, yes,' he said with a kind smile. "'And you want to get away for Christmas. You're going to skate and ski in the Alps, aren't you?' If I was your age, I'd come with you. Johnson laughed shortly. He was a young man of twenty-six, with a delicate face like a girl's. I can catch the morning boat now, he said. But that's not the reason I'm glad the trial is over. I'm glad it's over because I've seen the last of that man's dreadful face. It positively haunted me. That white skin with the black hair brushed low over the forehead is a thing I shall never forget and the description of the way the dismembered body was crammed and packed with lime into that don't dwell on it my dear fellow interrupted the other looking at him curiously out of his keen eyes don't think about it such pictures have a trick of coming back when one least wants them he paused a moment now go he said presently and enjoy your holiday i shall want all your energy for my parliamentary work when you get back and don't break your neck skiing Johnson shook hands and took his leave. At the door he turned suddenly. "'I knew there was something I wanted to ask you,' he said. "'Would you mind lending me one of your kit bags? It's too late to get one tonight, and I leave in the morning before the shops are open.' "'Of course. I'll send Henry over with it to your rooms. You shall have it the moment I get home.' "'I promise to take great care of it,' said Johnson gratefully. Delighted to think that within thirty hours he would be nearing the brilliant sunshine of the high Alps in winter. The thought of that criminal court was like an evil dream in his mind. He dined at his club and went on to Bloomsbury, where he occupied the top floor in one of those old gaunt houses in which the rooms are large and lofty. The floor below his own was vacant and unfurnished, and below that were other lodgers whom he did not know. It was cheerless, and he looked forward heartily to a change. The night was even more cheerless. It was miserable, and few people were about. A cold, sleety rain was driving down the streets before the keenest east wind he had ever felt. It howled dismally among the big gloomy houses of the great squares, and when he reached his rooms he heard it whistling and shouting over the world of black roofs beyond his windows. In the hall he met his landlady, shading a candle from the draughts with a thin hand. This comes by a man from Mr. Wilbrim, sir. She pointed to what was evidently the kit-bag, and Johnson thanked her and took it upstairs with him. "'I shall be going abroad in the morning for ten days, Mrs. Monks,' he said. "'I'll leave an address for letters, and I hope you have a Merry Christmas, sir,' she said in a raucous, wheezy voice that suggested spirits. "'A better weather than this.' "'I hope so, too,' replied her lodger, shuddering a little as the wind went roaring down the street outside. When he got upstairs, he heard the sleet wallying against the window panes. He put his kettle on to make a cup of hot coffee, and then set about putting a few things in order for his absence. "'And now I must pack, such as my packing is,' he laughed to himself, and set to work at once. He liked the packing. 
for it brought the snow mountain so vividly before him and made him forget the unpleasant scenes of the past ten days besides it was not elaborate in nature his friend had lent him the very thing a stout canvas kit bag sack shaped with holes around the neck for the brass bar and padlock it was a bit shapeless true and not much to look at but its capacity was unlimited and there was no need to pack carefully he shoved in his waterproof coat his fur cap and gloves his skates and climbing boots his sweaters snow boots and ear caps and then on the top of these he piled his woolen shirts and underwear his thick socks putties and knickerbockers the dress suit came next in case the hotel people dressed for dinner and then thinking of the best way to pack his white shirts he paused a moment to reflect that's the worst of these kit bags he mused vaguely standing in the centre of the sitting room where he had come to fetch some string it was after ten o'clock a furious gust of wind rattled the windows as though to hurry him up and he thought with pity of the poor londoners whose christmas would be spent in such a climate whilst he was skimming over snowy slopes in bright sunshine and dancing in the evening with rosy-cheeked girls ah that reminded him he must put in his dancing pumps and evening socks he crossed over from his sitting-room to the cupboard on the landing where he kept his linen as he did so he heard someone coming up the stairs he stood still a moment on the landing to listen it was mrs monk's step he thought she must be coming up with the last post but then the step ceased suddenly and he heard no more they were at least two flights down and he came to the conclusion they were too heavy to be those of his bibulous lady no doubt they belonged to a late lodger who had mistaken his floor he went into the bedroom and packed his pumps and dress shirts as best he could the kit bag by this time was two-thirds full and stood upright on its own base like a sack of flour for the first time he noticed that it was old and dirty the canvas faded and worn and that it had obviously been subjected to rather rough treatment it was not a very nice bag to have sent him certainly not a new one or one that his chief valued he gave the matter a passing thought and went on with his packing once or twice however he caught himself wondering who it could have been wandering down below for mrs monks had not come up with letters and the floor was empty and unfurnished from time to time moreover he was almost certain he heard a soft tread of someone padding about over the bare boards cautiously stealthily as silently as possible and further that the sounds had been lately coming distinctly nearer for the first time in his life he began to feel a little creepy then as though to emphasize this feeling an odd thing happened as he left the bedroom having just packed his recalcitrant white shirts he noticed that the top of the kit bag locked over towards him with an extraordinary resemblance to a human face the canvas fell into a fold like a nose and forehead and the brass rings for the padlock just filled the position of the eyes a shadow or was it a travel stain for he could not tell exactly looked like hair it gave him rather a turn for it was so absurdly so outrageously like the face of john turk the murderer he laughed and went into the front room where the light was stronger that horrid case has got on to my mind he thought i shall be glad of a change of scene and air in the sitting-room however he was not pleased to hear again that stealthy tread upon the stairs and to realize that it was much closer than before as well as unmistakably real and this time he got up and went out to see who it could be creeping about on the upper staircase at so late an hour but the sound ceased there was no one visible on the stairs he went to the floor below not without trepidation and turned on the electric light to make sure that no one was hiding in the empty rooms of the unoccupied suite there was not a stick of furniture large enough to hide a dog then he called over the banisters to mrs monks but there was no answer and his voice echoed down into the dark vault of the house and was lost in the roar of the gale that howled outside every one was in bed and asleep every one except himself and the owner of this soft and stealthy tread my absurd imagination i suppose he thought it must have been the wind after all although it seemed so very real and close i thought he went back to his packing it was by this time getting on towards midnight he drank his coffee up and lit another pipe the last before turning in it is difficult to say exactly at what point fear begins when the causes of that fear are not plainly before the eyes 
Impressions gather on the surface of the mind, film by film, as ice gathers upon the surface of still water, but often so lightly that they claim no definite recognition from the consciousness. Then a point is reached where the accumulated impressions become a definite emotion, and the mind realizes that something has happened. With something of a start, Johnson suddenly recognized that he felt nervous, oddly nervous. Also, that for some time past the causes of this feeling had been gathering slowly in his mind, but that he had only just reached the point where he was forced to acknowledge them. It was a singular and curious malaise that had come over him, and he hardly knew what to make of it. He felt as though he were doing something that was strongly objected to by another person. Another person, moreover, who had some right to object. It was a most disturbing and disagreeable feeling, not unlike the persistent promptings of conscience, almost in fact as if he were doing something he knew to be wrong. Yet, though he searched vigorously and honestly in his mind, he could nowhere lay his finger upon the secret of this growing uneasiness, and it perplexed him. More, it distressed and frightened him. Pure nerves, I suppose, he said aloud with a forced laugh. Mountain air will cure all that. Ah, he added, still speaking to himself. And that reminds me, my snow glasses. He was standing by the door of the bedroom during this brief soliloquy, and as he passed quickly towards the sitting room to fetch them from the cupboard, he saw out of the corner of his eye the indistinct outline of a figure standing on the stairs, a few feet from the top. It was someone in a stooping position, with one hand on the banisters, and the face peering up towards the landing. And at the same moment he heard a shuffling footstep. The person who had been creeping about below all the time had at last come up to his own floor. Who in the world could it be? And what in the name of heaven did he want? Johnson caught his breath sharply and stood stock still. Then, after a few seconds' hesitation, he found his courage and turned to investigate. The stairs, he saw to his utter amazement, were empty. There was no one. He felt a series of cold shivers run over him, and something about the muscles of his legs gave a little and grew weak. For the space of several minutes he peered steadily into the shadows that congregated about the top of the staircase where he had seen the figure, and then he walked fast, almost ran, in fact, into the light of the front room. But hardly had he passed inside the doorway when he heard someone come up the stairs behind him with a quick bound and go swiftly into his bedroom. It was a heavy, but at the same time a stealthy footstep, the tread of somebody who did not wish to be seen. And it was at this precise moment that the nervousness he had hitherto experienced leaped the boundary line and entered the state of fear, almost of acute unreasoning fear. Before it turned into terror, there was a further boundary to cross, and beyond that again lay the region of pure horror. Johnson's position was an unenviable one. By Jove! That was someone on the stairs then, he muttered, his flesh crawling all over. And whoever it was has now gone into my bedroom. His delicate pale face turned absolutely white, and for some minutes he hardly knew what to think or do. Then he realized intuitively that delay only set a premium upon fear and he crossed the landing boldly and went straight into the other room, where, a few seconds before, the steps had disappeared. "'Who's there? Is that you, Mrs. Monks?' he called aloud, as he went, and heard the first half of his words echo down the empty stairs, while the second half fell dead against the curtains in a room that apparently held no other human figure than his own. "'Who's there?' he called again, in a voice unnecessarily loud, and that just only held firm. What do you want here? The curtain swayed very slightly, and as he saw it, his heart felt as if it almost missed a beat. Yet he dashed forward and drew them aside with a rush. A window streaming with rain was all that met his gaze. He continued his search, but in vain. The cupboards held nothing but rows of clothes hanging motionless, and under the bed there was no sign of anyone hiding. He stepped backwards into the middle of the room, and as he did so, something all but tripped him up, 
Turning with a sudden spring of alarm, he saw the kit bag. Odd, he thought. That's not where I left it. A few moments before it had surely been on his right between the bed and the bath. He did not remember having moved it. It was very curious. What in the world was the matter with everything? Were all his senses gone queer? A terrific gust of wind tore at the windows, dashing the sleet against the glass with a force of small gunshot, and then fled away howling dismally over the waste of Bloomsbury roofs. A sudden vision of the channel next day rose in his mind and recalled him sharply to realities. "'There's no one here, at any rate. That's quite clear,' he exclaimed aloud. Yet at the time he uttered them, he knew perfectly well that his words were not true, and that he did not believe them himself. He felt exactly as though someone was hiding close about him, watching all his movements, trying to hinder his packing in some way. And two of my senses, he said, keeping up the pretense, have played me the most absurd tricks. The steps I heard and the figure I saw were both entirely imaginary. He went back to the front room, poked the fire into a blaze, and sat down before it to think. What impressed him more than anything else was the fact that the kit bag was no longer where he had left it. It had been dragged nearer to the door. What happened afterwards that night happened, of course, to a man already excited by fear, and was perceived by a mind that had not the full and proper control, therefore, of the senses. Outwardly, Johnson remained calm and master of himself to the end, pretending to the very last that everything he witnessed had a natural explanation, or was merely delusions of his tired nerves. But inwardly, in his very heart, he knew all along that someone had been hiding downstairs in the empty suite when he came in, that this person had watched his opportunity, and then stealthily made his way up to the bedroom, and that all he saw and heard afterwards, from the moving of the kit bag to, well, to the other things the story has to tell, were caused directly by the presence of this invisible person. And it was here, just when he most desired to keep his mind and thoughts controlled, that the vivid pictures received day after day upon the mental plates exposed in the courtroom of the old Bailey came strongly to light and developed themselves in the dark room of his inner vision. Unpleasant haunting memories have a way of coming to life again just when the mind least desires them, in the silent watches of the night, on sleepless pillows, during the lonely hours spent by sick and dying beds. And so now, in the same way, Johnson saw nothing but the dreadful face of John Turk, the murderer, lowering at him from every corner of his mental field of vision. The white skin, the evil eyes, and the fringe of black hair low over the forehead, all the pictures of those ten days in court crowded back into his mind unbidden and very vivid. This is all rubbish and nerves, he exclaimed at length, springing with sudden energy from his chair. I shall finish my packing and go to bed. I am overwrought, overtired. No doubt, at this rate, I shall hear steps and things all night. But his face was deadly white all the same. He snatched up his field glasses and walked across to the bedroom, humming a music-hall song as he went, a trifle too loud to be natural. And the instant he crossed the threshold and stood within the room, something turned cold about his heart, and he felt that every hair on his head stood up. The kit bag lay close in front of him, several feet nearer to the door than he had left it, and just over its crumpled top he saw a head and face slowly sinking down out of sight, as though someone were crouching behind it to hide and at the same moment a sound like a long-drawn sigh was distinctly audible in the still air about him, between the gusts of the storm outside. Johnson had more courage and will-power than the girlish indecision of his face indicated, but at first such a wave of terror came over him that for some seconds he could do nothing but stand and stare. A violent trembling ran down his back and legs, and he was conscious of a foolish, almost a hysterical impulse to scream aloud. That sigh seemed in his very ear, and the air still quivered with it. It was unmistakably a human sigh. "'Who's there?' he said at length, finding his voice. 
but though he meant to speak with loud decision, the tones came out instead in a faint whisper, for he had partly lost the control of his tongue and lips. He stepped forward, so that he could see all around and over the kit bag. Of course, there was nothing there, nothing but the faded carpet and the bulging canvas sides. He put out his hands and threw open the mouth of the sack where it had fallen over, being only three parts full. And then he saw for the first time that round the inside, some six inches from the top, there ran a broad smear of dull crimson. It was an old and faded blood stain. He uttered a scream and drew back his hands as if they had been burnt. At the same moment, the kit bag gave a faint but unmistakable lurch forward towards the door. Johnson collapsed backwards, searching with his hands for the support of something solid, and the door, being further behind him than he realized, received his weight just in time to prevent his falling, and shut to with a resounding bang. At the same moment the swinging of his left arm accidentally touched the electric switch, and the light in the room went out. It was an awkward and disagreeable predicament, and if Johnson had not been possessed of real pluck, he might have done all manner of foolish things. As it was, however, he pulled himself together and groped furiously for the little brass knob to turn the lights on again. But the rapid closing of the door had set the coats hanging on it a-swinging, and his fingers became entangled in a confusion of sleeves and pockets so that it was some moments before he found the switch. And in those few moments of bewilderment and terror, two things happened that sent him beyond recall over the boundary into the region of genuine horror. He distinctly heard the kit bag shuffling heavily across the floor in jerks, and close in front of his face sounded once again the sigh of a human being. In his anguished efforts to find the brass button on the wall, he nearly scraped the nails from his fingers, but even then, in those frenzied moments of alarm, so swift and alert are the impressions of a mind keyed up by a vivid emotion, he had time to realize that he dreaded the return of the light, and that it might be better for him to stay hidden in the merciful screen of darkness. It was but the impulse of a moment, however, and before he had time to act upon it, he had yielded automatically to the original desire and the room was flooded again with light. But the second instinct had been right. It would have been better for him to have stayed in the shelter of the kind darkness. For there, close before him, bending over the half-packed kit bag, clear as life in the merciless glare of the electric light, stood the figure of John Turk the murderer. Not three feet from him the man stood, the fringe of black hair marked plainly against the pallor of the forehead, the whole horrible presentment of the scoundrel, as vivid as he had seen him day after day in the old bailey, when he stood there in the dock, cynical and callous, under the very shadow of the gallows. In a flash Johnson realized what it all meant. The dirty and much-used bag, the smear of crimson within the top, the dreadful stretched condition of the bulging sides. He remembered how the victim's body had been stuffed into a canvas bag for burial the ghastly, dismembered fragments forced with lime into this very bag, and the bag itself produced as evidence, it all came back to him as clear as day. Very softly and stealthily, his hand groped behind him for the handle of the door, but before he could actually turn it, the very thing that he most of all dreaded came about. And John Turk lifted his devil's face and looked at him. At the same moment, the heavy sigh passed through the air of the room, formulated somehow into the words, It's my bag, and I want it. Johnson just remembered clawing the door open, and then falling in a heap upon the floor of the landing, as he tried frantically to make his way into the front room. He remained unconscious for a long time, and it was still dark when he opened his eyes and realized that he was lying stiff and bruised on the cold boards. Then the memory of what he had seen rushed back into his mind, and he promptly fainted again. When he woke, the second time, the wintry dawn was just beginning to peep in at the windows, painting the stairs a cheerless, dismal grey, and he managed to crawl into the front room, 
and cover himself with an overcoat in the armchair, where at length he fell asleep. A great clamour woke him. He recognised Mrs. Monk's voice, loud and voluble. "'What? You ain't been to bed, sir? You ill, or has anything happened? And there's an urgent gentleman to see you, though it ain't seven o'clock yet, and—' "'Who is it?' he stammered. "'I'm all right, thanks. Fell asleep in my chair, I suppose.' "'Someone from Mr. Wilbraham's, and he says he ought to see you quick before you go abroad, and I told him. "'Show him up, please, at once.' said Johnson, whose head was whirling, and his mind was still full of dreadful visions. Mr. Wilbraham's man came in with many apologies, and explained briefly and quickly that an absurd mistake had been made, and that the wrong kit-bag had been sent over the night before. Henry somehow got hold of the one that came over from the courtroom, and Mr. Wilbraham only discovered it when he saw his own lying in his room, and asked why it had not gone to you, the man said. Oh, said Johnson stupidly. And he must have brought you the one from the murder case instead, sir, I'm afraid, the man continued, without the ghost of an expression on his face. The one John Turk packed the dead body in. Mr. Wilbraham's awfully upset about it, sir, and told me to come over first thing this morning with the right one, as you were leaving by the boat. He pointed to a clean-looking kit bag on the floor which he had just brought. And I was to bring the other one back, sir, he added casually. For some minutes Johnson could not find his voice. At last he pointed in the direction of his bedroom. Perhaps you would kindly unpack it for me. Just empty the things out on the floor. The man disappeared into the other room and was gone for five minutes. Johnson heard the shifting to and fro of the bag and the rattle of the skates and boots being unpacked. Thank you, sir, the man said, returning with the bag folded over his arm. And can I do anything more to help you, sir? What is it? asked Johnson, seeing that he still had something he wished to say. The man shuffled and looked mysterious. Beg pardon, sir, but knowing your interest in the Turk case, I thought you'd maybe like to know what's happened. Yes. John Turk killed himself last night with poison immediately on getting his release and he left a note from Mr. Wilbraham saying, as he'd be much obliged if they'd have him put away, same as the woman he'd murdered in the old kit bag. What time did he do it? asked Johnson. Ten o'clock last night, sir, the warder says. End of The Kit Bag by Algernon Blackwood Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama The Duelist by Bram Stoker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Duelists by Bram Stoker. Bis dat ki non sito dat. There was joy in the house of Bub. For ten long years had Ephraim and Sophonisba Bub mourned in vain the loneliness of their life. Unavailingly had they gazed into the emporia of baby linen, and fixed their searching glances on the basket-makers, warehouses, where the cradles hung in tempting rows. In vain had they prayed and sighed and groaned, and wished and waited and wept, but never had even a ray of hope been held out by the family physician. But now at last the wished-for moment had arrived. Month after month had flown by on leaden wings, and the destined days had slowly measured their course. The months had become weeks, the weeks had dwindled down to days. The days had been attenuated to hours. The hours had lapsed into minutes, the minutes had slowly died away, and but seconds remained. Ephraim Bub sat cowering on the stairs and tried with high-strung ears to catch the strain of blissful music from the lips of his firstborn. There was silence in the house, silence as of the deadly calm before the cyclone. Ah, Ephraim Bub, little thinkest thou that another moment may forever destroy the peaceful, happy course of thy life. 
and open to thy too craving eyes the portals of that wondrous land where childhood reigns supreme and where the tyrant infant with the wave of his tiny hand and the imperious treble of his tiny voice sentences his parent to the deadly vault beneath the castle moat as the thought strikes thee thou becomest pale how thou tremblest as thou findest thyself upon the brink of the abyss wouldst that thou could recall the past but hark the die is cast for good or ill the long years of praying and hoping have found an end at last from the chamber within comes a sharp cry which shortly after is repeated ah ephraim that cry is the feeble effort of childish lips as yet unused to the rough worldly form of speech to frame the word father in the glow of thy transport all doubts are forgotten and when the doctor cometh forth as the harbinger of joy he findeth thee radiant with new-found delight my dear sir allow me to congratulate you to offer twofold felicitations mr Bubsha, you are the father of twins halcyon days the twins were the finest children that were ever seen so at least said the cognoscenti and the parents were not slow to believe the nurse's opinion was in itself a proof it was not ma'am that they were fine for twins but they were fine for singles and she had ought to know for she had nussed a many in her time both twins and singles all they wanted was to have their dear little legs cut off and little wings on their dear little shoulders for to be put one on each side of a white marble tombstone cut beautiful sacred to the relic of ephraim bub that they might sir if so be that missus was to survive the father of two such lovely twins although she would make bold to say and no offence intended that a handsome gentleman though a trifle or two older than his good lady though for the matter of that she heard the gentleman was never too old at all and for her own part she liked them the better for it not like bits of boys that didn't know their own minds that a gentleman was the father of two such heavenly twins god bless them couldn't be called anything but a boy though for the matter of that she never knowed in her experience which it was much as had such twins or any twins at all so much for the matter of that the twins were the idols of their parents and at the same time their pleasure and their pain did zerubbabel cough Ephraim would start from his balmy slumbers with an agonized cry of consternation, for visions of innumerable twins black in the face from croup haunted his nightly pillow. Did Zachariah rail at ethereal expansion? Sophonisba, with pallid hue and dishevelled locks, would fly to the cradle of her offspring. Did pins torture or strings afflict, or flannel or flies tickle, or light dazzle, or darkness affright? or hunger or thirst assail the synchronous productions the household of bub would be roused from quiet slumbers or the current of its manifold workings changed the twins grew apace were weaned teethed and at length arrived at the stage of three years they grew in beauty side by side they filled one home etc rumors of war harry murford and tommy santon lived in the same range of villas as ephraim bub Harry's parents had taken up their abode in number twenty five. Number twenty seven was happy in the perpetual sunshine of Tommy's smiles, and between these two residences Ephraim Bubb reared his blossoms, the number of his mansion being twenty six. Harry and Tommy had been accustomed from the earliest times to meet each other daily. Their primal method of communication had been by the housetops, till their respective sires had been obliged to pay compensation to Bubb for damages to his roof and dormer windows and from that time they had been forbidden by the home authorities to meet whilst their mutual neighbour had taken the precaution of having his garden walls pebble dashed and topped with broken glass to prevent their incursions harry and tommy however being gifted with daring souls lofty ambitious impetuous natures and strong seats to their trousers defied the rugged walls of bub and continued to meet in secret Compared with these two youths, Castor and Pollux, Damon and Pythias, Eloisa and Abelard, 
are but tame examples of duality or constancy and friendship. All the poets from Hyginus to Scylla might sing of noble deeds and desperate dangers held as not for friendship's sake, but they would have been mute had they but known of the mutual affection of Harry and Tommy. Day by day, and often night by night, would these two brave the perils of nurse and father and mother, of whip and imprisonment and hunger and thirst and solitude and darkness to meet together. What they discussed in secret none other knew. What deeds of darkness were perpetrated in their symposia none could tell. Alone they met, alone they remained, and alone they departed to their several abodes. There was in the garden of Bub a summer house overgrown with trailing plants, and surrounded by young poplars which the fond father had planted on his children's natal day, and whose rapid growth he had proudly watched. These trees quite obscured the summer house, and here Harry and Tommy, knowing after a careful observation that none ever entered the place, held their conclaves. Time after time they met in full security and followed their customary pursuit of pleasure. Let us raise the mysterious veil and see what was the great unknown at whose shrine they bent the knee. Harry and Tommy had each given as a Christmas box a new knife, and for a long time, nearly a year, these knives, similar in size and pattern, were their chief delights. With them they cut and hacked in their respective homes all things which would not be likely to be noticed, for the young gentlemen were wary and had no wish that their moments of pleasure should be atoned for by moments of pain. The insides of drawers and desks and boxes, the underparts of tables and chairs, the backs of picture frames, even the floors, where corners of the carpets could surreptitiously be turned up, all bore marks of their craftsmanship, and to compare notes on these artistic triumphs was a source of joy. At length, however, a critical time came. Some new field of action should be opened up, for the old appetites were sated, and the old joys had begun to pall. It was absolutely necessary that the existing schemes of destruction should be enlarged, and yet this could hardly be done without a terrible risk of discovery, for the limits of safety had long since been reached and passed. But, be the risk great or small, some new ground should be broken, some new joy found, for the old earth was barren, and the craving for pleasure was growing fiercer with each successive day. Crisis had come. Who could tell the issue? The tucket sounds. They met in the arbour, determined to discuss this grave question. The heart of each was big with revolution. The head of each was full of scheme and strategy, and the pocket of each was full of sweet stuff, the sweeter for being stolen. After having dispatched the sweets, the conspirators proceeded to explain their respective views with regard to the enlargement of their artistic operations. Tommy unfolded with much pride a scheme which he had in contemplation of cutting a series of holes in the sounding boards of the piano, so as to destroy its musical properties. Harry was in no wise behindhand in his ideas of reform. He had conceived the project of cutting the canvas at the back of his great-grandfather's portrait, which his father held in high regard among his lairs and pennants, so that in time, when the picture should be removed, the skin of paint would be broken, the head fall bodily out from the frame. At this point of the council a brilliant thought occurred to Tommy. Why should not the enjoyment be doubled? and the musical instruments and family pictures of both establishments be sacrificed on the altar of pleasure. This was agreed to Nem Con, and then the meeting adjourned for dinner. When they next met it was evident that there was a screw loose somewhere, that there was something rotten in the state of Denmark. After a little fencing on both sides, it came out that the schemes of domestic reform had been foiled by maternal vigilance, and that so sharp had been the reprimand consequent on a partial discovery of the schemes that they would have to be abandoned, till such time, at least, as increased physical strength would allow the reformers to laugh to scorn parental threats and injunctions. Sadly, the two forlorn youths took out their knives and regarded them. Sadly, sadly, they thought, as erst did Othello, of all the fair chances of honour and triumph and glory gone for ever. 
They compared knives with the almost the fondness of doting parents. There they were, so equal in size and strength and beauty, dimmed by no corrosive rust, tarnished by no stain, and with unbroken edges of the keenness of Saladin's sword. So like were the knives that, but for the initials scratched in the handles, neither boy could have been sure which was his own. After a while they began mutually to brag of the superior excellence of their respective weapons. Tommy insisted that his was the sharper. Harry asserted that his was the stronger of the two. Hotter and hotter grew the war of words. The tempers of Harry and Tommy got inflamed, and their boyish bosoms glowed with manly thoughts of daring and hate. But there was abroad in that hour a spirit of a bygone age, one that penetrated even to that dim arbour in the grove of Bub. The world-old scheme of ordeal was whispered by the spirit in the ear of each, and suddenly the tumult was allayed. With one impulse the boys suggested that they should test the quality of their knives by the ordeal of the hack. No sooner said than done. Harry held out his knife edge uppermost, and Tommy, grasping his firmly by the handle, brought down the edge of the blade crosswise on Harry's. The process was then reversed, and Harry became in turn the aggressor. Then they paused, and eagerly looked for the result. It was not hard to see. In each knife were two great dents of equal depth, and so it was necessary to renew the contest and seek further proof. What needs it to relate seriatim the details of that direful strife? The sun had long since gone down, and the moon, with fair, smiling face, had long risen over the roof of Bub, where, wearied and jaded, Harry and Tommy sought their respective homes. Alas! The splendour of the knives was gone for ever. Ichabod, Ichabod, the glory had departed and not remained but two useless wrecks, with keen edges destroyed and now like unto nothing save the serried hills of Spain. But though they mourned for their fondly cherished weapons, the hearts of the boys were glad, for the bygone day had opened to their gaze a prospect of pleasure as boundless as the limits of the world. The First Crusade From that day a new era dawned in the lives of Harry and Tommy. So long as the resources of the parental establishments could hold out, so long would their new amusement continue. Subtly they obtained surreptitious possession of articles of family cutlery, not in general use, and brought them one by one to their rendezvous. These came fair and spotless from the sanctity of the butler's pantry. Alas, they returned not as they came. But in course of time the stock of available cutlery became exhausted and again the inventive faculties of the youths were called into requisition. They reasoned thus. The knife game, it is true, is played out, but the excitement of the hack is not to be dispensed with. Let us carry, then, this great idea into new worlds. Let us still live in the sunshine of pleasure. Let us continue to hack, but with objects other than knives. It was done. Not knives now engaged the attention of the ambitious youths. Spoons and forks were daily flattened and beaten out of shape. Pepper Castor met Pepper Castor in combat, and both were born dying from the field. Candlesticks met in fray to part no more on this side of the grave. Even epigonies were used as weapons in the crusade of Hack. At last all the resources of the butler's pantry became exhausted, and then began a system of miscellaneous destruction that proved in a little time ruinous to the furniture of the respective homes of Harry and Tommy. Mrs. Santon and Mrs. Murford began to notice that the wear and tear in their households became excessive. Day after day some new domestic calamity seemed to have occurred. Today a valuable edition of some book whose luxurious binding made it an object for public display would appear to have suffered some dire misfortune for the edges were frayed and broken, and the back loose if not altogether displaced. Tomorrow the same awful fate would seem to have followed some miniature frame. The day following the legs of some chair or spider table would show signs of extraordinary hardship. Even in the nursery the sounds of lamentation were heard. It was a thing of daily occurrence for the little girls to state that when going to bed at night they had laid their dear dollies in their beds with tender care. 
but that when again seeking them in the period of recess, they had found them with all their beauty gone, with legs and arms amputated, and faces beaten from all semblance of human form. Then articles of crockery began to be missed. The thief could in no case be discovered, and the wages of the servants from constant stoppages began to be nominal rather than real. Mrs. Murford and Mrs. Santon moaned their losses, but Harry and Tommy gloated day after day over their spoils, which lay in an ever-increasing heap in the hidden grove of Bub. To such an extent had the fondness of the hack now grown, that with both youths it was an infatuation, a madness, frenzy. At length, one awful day arrived. The butlers of the houses of Murford and Santon, harassed by constant losses and complaints, and finding that their breakage account was in excess of their wages, determined to seek some sphere of occupation where, if they did not meet with suitable reward or recognition of their services, they would at least not lose whatever fortune and reputation they had already acquired. Accordingly, before rendering up their keys and the goods entrusted to their charge, they proceeded to take a preliminary stock of their own accounts, to make sure of their accredited accuracy. Dire indeed was their distress when they knew to the full the havoc which had been wrought, terrible their anguish of the present, bitter their thoughts of the future. Their hearts bowed down with weight of woe, failed them quite, reeled the strong brains that had erst overcome foes of deadlier spirit than grief, and felt their stalwart forms prone on the floor of their respective sancta sanctorum. Late in the day, when their services were required, they were sought for in bower and hail, and at length discovered where they lay. But alas for justice, they were accused of being drunk, and for having, whilst in their degraded condition, deliberately injured all the property on which they could lay hands. Were not the evidences of their guilt patent to all in the hecatombs of the destroyed? Then they were charged with all the evils wrought in the houses, and on their indignant denial, Harry and Tommy, each in his own home, according to their concealed scheme of action, stepped forward and relieved their minds of the deadly weight that had for long in secret borne them down. The story of each ran that, time after time, he had seen the butler, when he thought that nobody was looking, knocking knives together in the pantry, chairs and books and pictures in the drawing-room and study, dolls in the nursery and plates in the kitchen. Then indeed was the master of each household stern and uncompromising in his demands for justice. Each butler was committed to the charge of myrmidians of the law, under the double charge of drunkenness and willful destruction of property. Softly and sweetly slept Harry and Tommy in their little beds that night. Angels seemed to whisper to them, for they smiled as though lost in pleasant dreams. The rewards given by proud and grateful parents lay in their pockets, and in their hearts the happy consciousness of having done their duty. Truly sweet should be the slumbers of the just. Let the dead past bury its dead. It might be supposed that now the operations of Harry and Tommy would be obliged to be abandoned. Not so, however. The minds of these youths were of no common order, nor were their souls, of such weak nature, as to yield at the first summons of necessity. Like Nelson, they knew not fear. Like Napoleon, they held impossible to be the adjective of fools. And they reveled in the glorious truth that in the lexicon of youth is no such word as fail. Therefore, on the day following the éclaircissement of the butler's misdeeds, they met in the arbor to plan a new campaign. In the hour when all seemed blackest to them, and when the narrowing walls of possibility hedged in on every side, Thus ran the deliberations of these dauntless youths. We have played out the meaner things that are inanimate and inert. Why not then trench in the domains of life? The dead have lapsed into the regions of the forgotten past. Let the living look to themselves. That night they met when all the households had retired to balmy sleep, and not but the amorous wailings of nocturnal cats told of the existence of life and sentience. Each bore into the arbor in his arms a pet rabbit and a piece of sticking plaster. Then, in the peaceful, quiet moonlight, commenced a work of mystery, blood, and gloom. 
The proceedings began by the fixing of a piece of sticking plaster over the mouth of each rabbit to prevent it making a noise, if so inclined. Then Tommy held up his rabbit by its scuffy tail, and it hung wriggling, a white mass in the moonlight. Slowly Harry raised his rabbit, holding it in the same manner, and when level with his head, brought it down on Tommy's client. But the chances had been miscalculated. The boys held firmly to the tails, but the chief portions of the rabbits fell to earth. Ere the doomed beasts could escape, however, the operators had pounced on them, and this time holding them by the hind legs, renewed the trial. Deep into the night the game was kept up, and the eastern sky began to show signs of approaching day, as each boy bore triumphantly the dead course of his favourite bunny and placed it within its sometime hutch. Next night, the same game was renewed with a new rabbit on each side, and for more than a week, so long as the hutches supplied the wherewithal, the battle was sustained. True, that there were sad hearts and red eyes in the juveniles of Santon and Murford as one by one the beloved pets were found dead. But Harry and Tommy were the hearts of heroes steeled to suffering and death to the pitiful cries of childhood, still fought the good fight on to the bitter end. When the supply of rabbits was exhausted, other munition was not wanting, and for some days the war was continued with white mice, dormice, hedgehogs, guinea pigs, pigeons, lambs, canaries, parakeets, linnets, squirrels, parrots, marmots, poodles, ravens, tortoises, terriers, and cats. Of these, as might be expected, the most difficult to manipulate were the terriers and the cats and of these two classes the proportion of the difficulties in the way of terrier hacking was, when compared with those of cat hacking, about that with the simple lack of the British pharmacopoeia bears to water in the compound, which dairymen palm off upon a too confiding public is milk. More than once when engaged in the rapturous delights of cat hacking, had Harry and Tommy wished that the silent tomb could open its ponderous and massy jaws and engulf them, for the feline victims were not patient in their death agonies, and often broke the bonds in which the security of the artists rested, and turned fiercely on their executioners. At last, however, all the animals available were sacrificed, but the passion for hacking still remained. How was it all to end? A cloud with golden lining. Tommy and Harry sat in the arbour dejected and disconsolate. They wept like two Alexanders, because there were no more worlds to conquer. At last the conviction had been forced upon them, that the resources available for hacking were exhausted. Very morning they had had a desperate battle, and their attire showed the ravages of direful war. Their hats were battered into shapeless masses, their shoes were soleless and heelless, and had the uppers broken, the ends of their braces, their sleeves and their trousers were frayed, and had they indulged in the manly luxury of coat-tails, these two would have gone. Truly, hacking had become an absorbing passion with them. Long and fiercely had they been swept onwards on the wings of the demon of strife, and powerless at the best of times had been the promptings of good, but now heated with combat, maddened by the equal success of arms, and with the lust for victory still unsated, they longed more fiercely than ever for some new pleasure. Like tigers that have tasted blood, they thirsted for a larger and more potent libation. As they sat with their souls in a tumult of desire and despair, some evil genius guided into the garden the twin blossoms of the tree of Bub. Hand in hand, Zechariah and Zerubbabel advanced from the back door. They had escaped from their nurses, and with the exploring instinct of humanity advanced boldly into the great world, the terra incognita, the ultima tool of the paternal domain. In the course of time they approached the hedge of poplars, from behind which the anxious eyes of Harry and Tommy looked for their approach, for the boys knew that where the twins were, the nurses were accustomed to be gathered together, and they feared discovery if their retreat should be cut off. It was a touching sight. These lovely babies, alike in form, feature, size, expression, and dress. In fact, 
so like each other that one might not have told either from which. When the startling similarity was recognized by Harry and Tommy, each suddenly turned and grasping the other by the shoulder spoke in a keen whisper. Heck, they are exactly equal. This is the very apotheosis of our art. With excited faces and trembling hands, they laid their plans to lure the unsuspecting babies within the precincts of their charnel house, and they were so successful in their efforts that in a little time the twins had toddled behind the hedge and were lost to the sight of the parental mansion. Harry and Tommy were not famed for gentleness within the immediate precincts of their respective homes, but it would have delighted the heart of any philanthropist to see the kindly manner in which they arranged for the pleasures of the helpless babies. With smiling faces and playful words and gentle wiles, they led them within the arbor, and then, under pretense of giving them some of the sudden jumps in which infants rejoice, they raised them from the ground. Tommy held Zachariah across his arm, with his baby moon face smiling up at the cobwebs on the arbor roof, and Harry, with a mighty effort, raised the cherubic Zerubbabel aloft. Each nerved himself for a great endeavor. Harry to give Tommy to endure a shock, and then the form of Zerubbabel was seen whirling through the air round Harry's glowing and determined face. There was a sickening crash, and the arm of Tommy yielded visibly. The pasty face of Zerubbabel had fallen fair on that of Zachariah, for Tommy and Harry were by this time artists of too great experience to miss so simple a mark. The puffy-like noses collapsed, the puffy-like cheeks became for a moment flattened, and when in an instant more they parted, the faces of both were dabbled in gore. Immediately the firmament was rent with a series of such yells as might have awakened the dead. Forthwith from the house of Bub came the echoes in parental cries and footsteps. As the sounds of scurrying feet rang through the mansion, Harry cried to Tommy, They will be on us soon. Let us cut to the roof of the stable and drop the ladder. Tommy answered by a nod, and the two boys, regardless of consequences and bearing each a twin, ascended to the roof of the stable by means of a ladder which usually stood against the wall and which they pulled up after them. As Ephraim Bub issued from his house in pursuit of his lost darlings, the sight which met his gaze froze his very soul. There on the coping of the stable roof stood Harry and Tommy renewing their game. They seemed like two young demons forcing some diabolical implement. For each in turn the, the twins were lifted high in the air and let fall with stunning force on the supine form of its fellow. How Ephraim felt! none but a tender and imaginative father can conceive. It would be enough to wring the heart of even a callous parent to see his children, the darlings of his old age, his own beloved twins being sacrificed to the brutal pleasure of unregenerate youths, without being made unconsciously and helplessly guilty of the crime of fratricide. Loudly did Ephraim and also Sophonisba, who with dishevelled locks had now appeared upon the scene, bewail their unhappy lot and shriek in vain for aid. But by rare ill chance no eyes save their own saw the work of butchery or heard the shrieks of anguish and despair. Wildly did Ephraim, mounting on the shoulders of his spouse, strive, but in vain to scale the stable wall. Baffled in every effort, he rushed into the house and appeared in a moment, bearing in his hands a double-barreled gun, into which he poured the contents of a shot pouch as he ran. He came and I, the stable, and hailed the murderous youths. Drop them, twins, and come down here, or I'll shoot you like a brace of dogs. Never! exclaimed the heroic two with one impulse, and continued their awful pastime with a zest tenfold as they knew that the agonized eyes of parents wept at the cause of their joy. Then die! shrieked Ephraim, as he fired both barrels, left, right, at the hackers. But, alas, love for his darlings shook the hand that never shook before. As the smoke cleared off and Ephraim recovered from the kick of his gun, he heard a loud twofold laugh of triumph and saw Harry and Tommy all unhurt, waving in the air the trunks of the twins. The fond father had blown the heads completely off his own offspring. Tommy and Harry shrieked aloud in glee. 
and after playing catch with the bodies for some time, seen only by the agonized eyes of the infanticide, and his wife flung them high in the air. Ephraim leaped forward to catch what had once been Zachariah, and Sophonisba grabbed wildly for the loved remains of her Zerubbabel. But the weight of the bodies and the height from which they fell were not reckoned by either parent, and from being ignorant of a simple dynamical formula, each tried to effect an object with calm common sense, united with scientific knowledge, would have told them was impossible. The masses fell, and Ephraim and Sophonisba were stricken dead by the falling twins who were thus posthumously guilty of the crime of parasite. An intelligent coroner's jury found the parents guilty of the crimes of infanticide and suicide, on the evidence of Harry and Tommy, who swore reluctantly that the inhuman monsters maddened by drink had killed their offspring by shooting them in the air out of a cannon, since stolen, whence like curses they had fallen on their own heads, and that they had slain themselves sui manibus with their own hands. Accordingly, Ephraim and Sophonisba were denied the solace of Christian burial, and were committed to the earth with maimed rites, and had stakes driven to their middles to pin them down in their unhallowed graves till the crack of doom. Harry and Tommy were rewarded with national honours, and were knighted, even at their tender years. Fortune seemed to smile upon them all the long after years, and they lived to a ripe old age, hale of body, and respected and beloved of all. Often in the golden summer eves, when all nature seemed at rest, when the oldest cast was open and the largest lamp was lit, when the chestnuts glowed in the embers and the kid turned on the spit, when their great-grandchildren pretended to mend a fictional armour and to trim an imaginary helmet's plume, when the shuttles of the good wives of their grandchildren went flashing each through its proper loom, with shouting and with laughter, they were accustomed to tell the tale of the duelists, or the death doom of the double born. End of The Duelists by Bram Stoker Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama. The Romance of Certain Old Clothes by Henry James. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. The Romance of Certain Old Clothes by Henry James. 1. Towards the middle of the eighteenth century, there lived in the province of Massachusetts a widowed gentlewoman, the mother of three children, by name Mrs. Veronica Wingrave. She had lost her husband early in life, and had devoted herself to the care of her progeny. These young persons grew up in a manner to reward her tenderness and to gratify her highest hopes. The firstborn was a son, whom she had called Bernard, in remembrance of his father. The others were daughters, born at an interval of three years apart. Good looks were traditional in the family, and this youthful trio were not likely to allow the tradition to perish. The boy was of that fair and ruddy complexion, and that athletic structure, which in those days, as in these, were the sign of good English descent. A frank, affectionate young fellow, a deferential son, a patronizing brother, a steadfast friend. Clever, however, he was not. The wit of the family had been apportioned chiefly to his sisters. The late Mr. William Wingrave had been a great reader of Shakespeare, at a time when this pursuit implied more freedom of thought than at the present day, and in a community where it required much courage to patronize the drama even in the closet, and he had wished to call attention to his admiration of the great poet by calling his daughters out of his favourite place. Upon the elder he had bestowed the romantic name of Rosalind, and the younger he had called Perdita, in memory of a little girl born between them, who had lived but a few weeks. When Bernard Wingrave came to his sixteenth year, his mother put a brave face upon it and prepared to execute her husband's last injunction. This had been a formal command that, at the proper age, his son should be sent out to England to complete his education at the University of Oxford, where he himself had acquired his taste for elegant literature. 
It was Mrs. Wingrave's belief that the lad's equal was not to be found in the two hemispheres. But she had the old traditions of literal obedience. She swallowed her sobs, and made up her boy's trunk and his simple provincial outfit, and sent him on his way across the seas. Bernard presented himself at the father's college, and spent five years in England without great honour, indeed, but with a vast deal of pleasure and no discredit. On leaving the university, he made the journey to France. In his twenty-fourth year, he took ship for home, prepared to find poor little New England. New England was very small in those days, a very dull, unfashionable residence. But there had been changes at home, as well as in Mr. Bernard's opinions. He found his mother's house quite habitable, and his sisters grown into two very charming young ladies, with all the accomplishments and graces of the young women of Britain, and a certain native-grown originality and wildness which, if it was not an accomplishment, was certainly a grace the more. Bernard privately assured his mother that his sisters were fully a match for the most genteel young women in the old country, whereupon poor Mrs. Wingrave, you may be sure, bade them hold up their heads. Such was Bernard's opinion, and such, in a tenfold higher degree, was the opinion of Mr. Arthur Lloyd. This gentleman was a college mate of Mr. Bernard, a young man of reputable family, of a good person and a handsome inheritance, which latter appurtenance he proposed to invest in trade in the flourishing colony. He and Bernard were sworn friends. They had crossed the ocean together, and the young American had lost no time in presenting him at his mother's house, where he had made quite as good an impression as that which he had received, and of which I have just given a hint. The two sisters were at this time in all the freshness of their youthful bloom, each wearing, of course, this natural brilliancy in the manner that became her best. They were equally dissimilar in appearance and character. Rosalind the Elder, now in her twenty-second year, was tall and white, with calm grey eyes and auburn tresses, a very faint likeness to the Rosalind of Shakespeare's comedy whom I imagine a brunette, if you will, but a slender, airy creature full of the softest, quickest impulses. Miss Wingrave, with a slightly lymphatic fairness, her fine arms, her majestic height, her slow utterance, was not cut out for adventures. She would never have put on a man's jacket and hose, and indeed, being a very plump beauty, she may have had reasons apart from her natural dignity. Perdita, too, might very well have exchanged the sweet melancholy of her name against something more in consonance with her aspect and disposition. She had the cheek of a gypsy, and the eye of an eager child, as well as the smallest waist and lightest foot in all the country of the Puritans. When you spoke to her, she never made you wait, as her handsome sister was wont to do, while she looked at you with a cold, fine eye, but gave you your choice of a dozen answers before you had uttered half your thought. The young girls were very glad to see their brother once more, but they found themselves quite able to spare part of their attention for their brother's friend. Among the young men, their friends and neighbours, the belle jeunesse of the colony, there were many excellent fellows, several devoted swains, and some two or three who enjoyed the reputation of universal charmers and conquerors. But the homebred arts and somewhat boisterous gallantry of these honest colonists were completely eclipsed by the good look, the fine clothes, the punctilious courtesy, the perfect elegance, the immense information of Mr. Arthur Lloyd. He was in reality no paragon. He was a capable, honourable, civil youth, rich in pounds sterling, in his health and complacency, and his little capital of uninvested affections. But he was a gentleman. He had a handsome person. He had studied and travelled. He spoke French, he played on the flute, and he read verses aloud with very great taste. There were a dozen reasons why Miss Wingrave and her sister should have thought their other male acquaintance made but a poor figure before such a perfect man of the world. Mr. Lloyd's anecdotes told our little New England maidens a great deal more of the ways and means of people of fashion in European capitals than he had any idea of doing. It was delightful to sit by and hear him, and Bernard talked about the fine people and fine things they had seen. They would all gather round the fire after tea in the little wainscoted parlour, and the two young men would remind each other across the rug of this, that, and the other adventure. Rosalind and Perdita would often have given their years to know exactly what adventure it was, and where it happened, and who was there, and what the ladies had on. But in those days a well-bred young woman was not expected to break into the conversation of her elders 
or to ask too many questions, and the poor girls used therefore to sit fluttering behind the more languid or more discreet curiosity of their mother. 2. That they were both very fine girls Arthur Lloyd was not slow to discover, but it took him some time to make up his mind whether he liked the big sister or the little sister best. He had a strong presentiment, an emotion of a nature entirely too cheerful to be called a foreboding, that he was destined to stand up before the parson with one of them. Yet he was unable to arrive at a preference, and for such a consummation a preference was certainly necessary, for Lloyd had too much young blood in his veins to make a choice by lot and be cheated of the satisfaction of falling in love. He resolved to take things as they came, to let his heart speak. Meanwhile, he was on a very pleasant footing. Mrs. Wingrave showed a dignified indifference to his intentions, equally remote from a carelessness of a daughter's honour, and from that sharp alacrity to make him come to the point, which, in his quality of a young man of property, he had too often encountered in the worldly matrons of his native islands. As for Bernard, all that he asked was that his friend should treat his sisters as his own. And as for the poor girls themselves, however each may have secretly longed that their visitor should do or say something marked, they kept a very modest and contented demeanour. Towards each other, however, they were somewhat more on the offensive. They were good friends enough and accommodating bedfellows. They shared the same four poster, betwixt whom it would take more than a day for the seeds of jealousy to sprout and bear fruit. But they felt that the seeds had been sown on the day that Mr. Lloyd came into the house. Each made up her mind that, if she should be slighted, she would bear her grief in silence, and that no one should be any the wiser. For if they had a great deal of ambition, they had also a large share of pride. But each prayed in secret, nevertheless, that upon her the selection, the distinction, might fall. They had need of a vast deal of patience, of self-control, of dissimulation. In those days a young girl of decent breeding could make no advances whatever, and barely respond indeed to those that were made. She was expected to sit still in a chair, with her eyes on the carpet, watching the spot where the mystic handkerchief should fall. Poor Arthur Lloyd was obliged to carry on his wooing in the little wainscoted parlour, before the eyes of Mrs. Wingrave, her son, and his prospective sister-in-law. But youth and love are so cunning that a hundred signs and tokens might travel to and fro, and not one of these three pairs of eyes detect them in their passage. The two maidens were almost always together, and had plenty of chances to betray themselves. That each knew she was being watched, however, made not a grain of difference in the little offices they mutually rendered, or in the various household tasks they performed in common neither flinched nor fluttered beneath the silent battery of his sister's eye. The only apparent change in their habits was that they had less to say to each other. It was impossible to talk about Mr. Lloyd, and it was ridiculous to talk about anything else. By tacit agreement they began to wear all their choice finery, and to devise such little implements of conquest, in ways of ribbons and top-knots and kerchiefs, as were sanctioned by indubitable modesty. They executed in the same inarticulate fashion a contract of fair play in this exciting game. Is it better so? Rosalind would ask, tying a bunch of ribbons on her bosom and turning about from her glass to her sister. Perdita would look up gravely from her work and examine the decoration. I think you had better give it another loop, she would say, with great solemnity, looking hard at her sister, with eyes that added, Upon my honour. So they were for ever stitching and trimming their petticoats and pressing out their muslins and contriving washes and ointments and cosmetics like the ladies in the household of the Vicar of Wakefield. Some three or four months went by. It grew to be midwinter, and as yet Rosalind knew that if Perdita had nothing more to boast of than she, there was not much to be feared from her rivalry. But Perdita by this time, the charming Perdita, felt that her secret had grown to be tenfold more precious than her sister's. One afternoon, Miss Wingrave sat alone. There was a rare accident, before her toilet glass combing out her long hair. It was getting too dark to see. She lit two candles in their sockets on the frame of a mirror, and then went to the window to draw her curtains. It was a grey December evening. The landscape was bare and bleak, and the sky heavy with snow clouds. At the end of the large garden into which her window looked was a wall with a little postern door opening into a lane. The door stood ajar, as she could vaguely see in the gathering darkness, and moved slowly to and fro. 
as if some one was swaying it from the lane without. It was doubtless a servant-maid who had been having a tryst with her sweetheart. But as she was about to drop her curtain, Rosalind saw her sister step into the garden and hurry along the path which led to the house. She dropped the curtain, all save a little crevice for her eyes. As Perdita came up the path, she seemed to be examining something in her hand, holding it close to her eyes. When she reached the house, she stopped a moment, looked intently at the object, and pressed it to her lips. Poor Rosalind slowly came back to her chair and sat down before her glass, where, if she had looked at it less abstractedly, she would have seen her handsome features sadly disfigured by jealousy. A moment afterwards the door opened behind her, and her sister came into the room, out of breath and her cheeks aglow with a chilly air. Padida started. Ah, said she, I thought you were with our mother. The ladies were to go to a tea-party, and on such occasions it was the habit of one of the young girls to help their mother to dress. Instead of coming in, Padita lingered at the door. Come in, come in, said Rosalind. We have more than an hour yet. I should like you very much to give a few strokes to my hair. She knew that her sister wished to retreat, and that she could see in the glass all her movements in the room. Nay, just help me with my hair, she said, and I will go to Mamma. Perdita came reluctantly and took the brush. She saw her sister's eye in the glass, fastened hard upon her hands. She had not made three passes when Rosalind clapped her own right upon her sister's left and started out of her chair. Whose ring is that? she cried, passionately, drawing her toward the light. On the young girl's third finger glistened a little gold ring, adorned with a very small sapphire. Nadita felt that she needed no longer keep her secret, yet that she must put a bold face on her avowal. It's mine, she said proudly. Who gave it to you? cried the other. Nadita hesitated a moment. Mr. Lloyd. Mr. Lloyd is generous all of a sudden. Ah, no, cried Perdita with spirit. Not all of a sudden. He offered it to me a month ago. And you needed a month's begging to take it, said Rosalind, looking at the little trinket, which indeed was not especially elegant, though it was the best that the jeweller of the province could furnish. I wouldn't have taken it in less than two. It isn't the ring, Perdita answered. It's what it means. It means you are not a modest girl, cried Rosalind. Pray, does your mother know of your intrigue? Does Bernard? My mother has approved my intrigue, as you call it. Mr. Lloyd has asked for my hand, and Mamma has given it. Would you have had him apply to you, dearest sister? Rosalind gave her companion a long look, full of passionate envy and sorrow. Then she dropped her lashes on her pale cheeks and turned away. Perdita felt that it had not been a pretty scene, but it was her sister's fault. However, the elder girl rapidly called back her pride and turned herself about again. "'You have my very best wishes,' she said, with a low curtsy. "'I wish you every happiness and a very long life.' Perdita gave a bitter laugh. "'Don't speak in that tone,' she cried. "'I would rather you should curse me outright. Come, Rosie,' she said. "'He couldn't marry both of us.' "'I wish you very great joy,' Rosalind repeated mechanically, sitting down to her glass again, and a very long life and plenty of children. There was something in the sound of these words, not at all to Perdita's taste. "'Will you give me a year to live at least?' she said. "'In a year I can have one little boy, or one little girl at least. If you give me your brush again, I will do your hair.' "'Thank you,' said Rosalind. "'You had better go to Mamma. It isn't becoming that a young lady with a promised husband should wait on a girl with none. Nay, said Perdita good-humouredly, I have Arthur to wait upon me. You need my service more than I need yours. But a sister motioned her away. And she left the room. When she had gone, poor Rosalind fell on her knees before her dressing-table, buried her head in her arms, and poured out a flood of tears and sobs. She felt very much the better for this effusion of sorrow. When her sister came back, she insisted upon helping her to dress, on her wearing her prettiest things. She forced upon her acceptance a bit of lace of her own, and declared that now that she was to be married, she should do her best to appear worthy of her lover's choice. She discharged these offices in stern silence, 
but, such as they were, they had to do duty as an apology and an atonement. She never made any other. Now that Lloyd was received by the family as an accepted suitor, nothing remained but to fix the wedding day. It was appointed for the following April, and in the interval preparations were diligently made for the marriage. Lloyd, on his side, was busy with his commercial arrangements and with establishing a correspondence with the great mercantile house to which he had attached himself in England. He was therefore not so frequent a visitor at Mrs. Wingrave's as during the month of his diffidence and irresolution, and poor Rosalind had less to suffer than she had feared from the sight of the mutual endearments of the young lovers. Touching his future sister-in-law, Lloyd had made a perfectly clear conscience. There had not been a particle of love-making between them, and he had not the slightest suspicion that he had dealt her a terrible blow. He was quite at his ease. Life promised so well, both domestically and financially. The great revolt of the colonies was not yet in the air, and that his connubial felicity should take a tragic turn, it was absurd, it was blasphemous, to apprehend. Meanwhile, at Mrs. Wingrave's there was a greater rustling of silks, a more rapid clicking of scissors and flying of needles than ever. The good lady had determined that her daughter should carry from home the genteelest outfit that her money could buy, or that the country could furnish. All the sage women in the province were convened, and their united taste was brought to bear on Perdita's wardrobe. Rosalind's situation at this moment was assuredly not to be envied. The poor girl had an inordinate love of dress, and the very best taste in the world, as her sister perfectly well knew. Rosalind was tall, she was stately and sweeping, she was made to carry stiff brocade and masses of heavy lace, such as belonged to the toilet of a rich man's wife. But Rosalind sat aloof, with her beautiful arms folded and her head averted, while her mother and sister, and the venerable women aforesaid, worried and wondered over their materials, oppressed by the multitude of their resources. One day they came in a beautiful piece of white silk, brocaded with heavenly blue and silver, sent by the bridegroom himself. It not being thought amiss in those days that the husband-elect should contribute to the bride's trousseau. Perdida could think of no form or fashion which would do sufficient honour to the splendour of the material. Blue's your colour, sister, more than mine, she said, with appealing eyes. It's a pity it's not for you. You would know what to do with it. Rosalind got up from her place and looked at the great shining fabric as it lay spread over the back of a chair. Then she took it up in her hands and felt it, lovingly, as Perdita could see, and turned about toward the mirror with it. She let it roll down to her feet and flung the other end over her shoulder, gathering it in about her waist with her white arm, which was bare to the elbow. She threw back her head and looked at her image, and a hanging tress of her auburn hair fell upon the gorgeous surface of the silk. It made a dazzling picture. The women standing about uttered a little look, look, of admiration. Yes, indeed, said Rosalind quietly. Blue is my colour. But Perdida could see that her fancy had been stirred, and that she would now fall to work and solve all their silken riddles. And indeed she behaved very well, as Perdita, knowing her insatiable love of millinery, and was quite ready to declare. Innumerable yards of lustrous silk and satin, of muslin, velvet, and lace, passed through her cunning hands, without a jealous word coming from her lips. Thanks to her industry, when the wedding day came, Perdita was prepared to espouse more of the vanities of life than any fluttering young bride who had yet received the sacramental blessing of a New England divine. It had been arranged that the young couple should go out and spend the first days of their wedded life at the country house of an English gentleman, a man of rank and a very kind friend to Arthur Lloyd. He was a bachelor, he declared he should be delighted to give up the place to the influence of Hymen, and the ceremony at church it had been performed by an English clergyman. Young Mrs. Lloyd hastened back to her mother's house to change her nuptial robes for a riding dress. Rosalind helped her to effect the change in the little homely room in which they had spent their undivided younger years. Perdita then hurried off to bid farewell to her mother, leaving Rosalind to follow. The parting was short, the horses were at the door, and Arthur was impatient to start. But Rosalind had not followed, and Perdita hastened back to her room, opening the door abruptly. Rosalind, as usual, was before the glass, but in a position which caused the other to stand still amazed. 
she had dressed herself in Perdita's cast of wedding veil and wreath, and on her neck she had hung the full string of pearl which the young girl had received from her husband as a wedding gift. These things had been hastily laid aside to await their possessor's disposal on her return from the country. Be dizzened in this unnatural garb, Rosalind stood before the mirror, plunging a long look into its depths, and reading heaven knows what audacious visions. Perdita was horrified. It was a hideous image of their old rivalry come to life again. She made a step toward her sister, as if to pull off the veil and the flowers. But catching her eyes in the glass, she stopped. Farewell, sweetheart, she said. You might at least have waited till I had got out of the house. And she hurried away from the room. Mr. Lloyd had purchased in Boston a house to which the taste of those days appeared as elegant as it was commodious. And here he very soon established himself with his young wife. He was thus separated by a distance of twenty miles from the residence of his mother-in-law. Twenty miles, in that primitive era of roads and conveyances, were as serious a matter as a hundred at the present day. And Mrs. Wingrave saw but little of her daughter during the first twelve months of her marriage. She suffered in no small degree from Perdita's absence. And her affliction was not diminished by the fact that Rosalind had fallen into terribly low spirits, and was not to be roused or cheered but by change of air and company. The real cause of the young lady's dejection the reader will not be slow to suspect. Mrs. Wingrave and her gossips, however, deemed her complaint a mere bodily ill, and doubted not that she would obtain relief from the remedy just mentioned. Her mother accordingly proposed on her behalf a visit to certain relatives on the paternal side, established in New York, who had long complained that they were able to see so little of their New England cousins. Rosalind was dispatched to these good people under a suitable escort, and remained with them for several months. In the interval, her brother Bernard, who had begun the practice of the law, made up his mind to take a wife. Rosalind came home to the wedding, apparently cured of her heartache, with bright roses and lilies in her face and a proud smile on her lips. Arthur Lloyd came over from Boston to see his brother-in-law married, but without his wife, who was expecting very soon to present him with an heir. It was nearly a year since Rosalind had seen him. She was glad. She hardly knew why that Perdita had stayed at home. Arthur looked happy, but he was more grave and important than before his marriage. She thought he looked interesting, for although the word in its modern sense was not then invented, we may be sure that the idea was. The truth is, he was simply anxious about his wife and her coming ordeal. Nevertheless, he by no means failed to observe Rosalind's beauty and splendor, and to note how she effaced the poor little bride. The allowance that Perdita had enjoyed for her dress had now been transferred to her sister, and who turned it to wonderful account. On the morning after the wedding, he had a lady's saddle put on the horse of the servant who had come with him from town, and went out with the young girl for a ride. It was a keen, clear morning in January. The ground was bare and hard, and the horses in good condition. To say nothing of Rosalind, who was charming in her hat and plume, and her dark blue riding coat trimmed with fur. They rode all the morning. They lost their way and were obliged to stop for dinner at a farmhouse. The early winter dusk had fallen when they got home. Mrs. Wingrave met them with a long face. A messenger had arrived at noon from Mrs. Lloyd. She was beginning to be ill. She desired her husband's immediate return. The young man, at the thought that he had lost several hours, and that by hard riding he might already have been with his wife, uttered a passionate oath. He barely consented to stop for a mouthful of supper, but mounted the messenger's horse and started off at a gallop. He reached home at midnight. His wife had been delivered of a little girl. "'Ah, why weren't you with me?' she said, as he came to her bedside. "'I was out of the house when the man came. I was with Rosalind,' said Lloyd innocently. Mrs. Lloyd made a little moan and turned away. But she continued to do very well, and for a week her improvement was uninterrupted. Finally, however, through some indiscretion in way of diet or exposure, it was checked, and the poor lady grew rapidly worse. Lloyd was in despair. It very soon became evident that she was breathing her last. Mrs. Lloyd came to a sense of her approaching end, and declared that she was reconciled with death. On the third evening, after the change took place, she told her husband that she felt she should not get through the night. She dismissed her servants, and also requested her mother to withdraw. Mrs. Wingrave having arrived on the preceding day. 
She had had her infant placed on the bed beside her, and she lay on her side, with the child against her breast, holding her husband's hands. The night lamp was hidden behind the heavy curtains of the bed, but the room was illumined with a red glow from the immense fire of logs on the hearth. "'It seems strange not to be warmed into life by such a fire as that,' the young woman said, feebly trying to smile. "'If I had but a little of it in my veins! But I have given all my fire to this little spark of mortality.' And she dropped her eyes on her child. Then raising them she looked at her husband with a long, penetrating gaze. The last feeling which lingered in her heart was one of suspicion. She had not recovered from the shock which Arthur had given her by telling her that in the hour of her agony he had been with Rosalind. She trusted her husband very nearly as well as she loved him. But now that she was called away for ever, she felt a cold horror of her sister. She felt in her soul that Rosalind had never ceased to be jealous of her good fortune, and a year of happy security had not effaced the young girl's image, dressed in her wedding garments and smiling with simulated triumph. Now that Arthur was to be alone, what might not Rosalind attempt? She was beautiful. She was engaging. What arts might she not use? What impression might she not make upon the young man's saddened heart? Mrs. Lloyd looked at her husband in silence. It seemed hard, after all, to doubt of his constancy. His fine eyes were filled with tears. His face was convulsed with weeping. The clasp of his hands was warm and passionate. How noble he looked, how tender, how faithful and devoted. Nay, thought Perdita, he's not for such a one as Rosalind. He'll never forget me. Not as Rosalind truly cared for him. She cares only for vanities and finery and jewels. And she lowered her eyes on her white hands, which her husband's liberality had covered with rings, and on the lace ruffles which trimmed the edge of her nightdress. She covets my rings and my laces more than she covets my husband. At this moment, the thought of her sister's rapacity seemed to cast a dark shadow between her and the helpless figure of her little girl. Arthur, she said, you must take off my rings. I shall not be buried in them. One of these days my daughter shall wear them, my rings and my laces and silks. I had them all brought out and shown me today. It's a great wardrobe. There's not such another in the province. I can say it without vanity now that I have done with it. It will be a great inheritance for my daughter when she grows into a young woman. There are things there that a man never buys twice, and if they are lost, you will never again see the like. So you will watch them well. Some dozen things I have left to Rosalind. I have named them to my mother. I have given her that blue and silver. It was meant for her. I wore it only once. I looked ill in it. But the rest are to be sacredly kept for this little innocent. It's such a providence that she should be my colour. She can wear my gowns. She has a mother's eyes. You know, the same fashions come back every twenty years. She can wear my gowns as they are. They will lie there quietly waiting till she grows into them, wrapped in camphor and rose leaves, and keeping their colours in the sweet-scented darkness. She shall have black hair. She shall wear my carnation satin. Do you promise me, Arthur? Promise you what, dearest? Promise me to keep your little wife's old gowns. Are you afraid I shall sell them? No, but that they may get scattered. My mother will have them properly wrapped up, and you shall lay them away under a double lock. Do you know the great chest in the attic with the iron bands? There is no end to what it will hold. You can put them all there. My mother and the housekeeper will do it and give you the key and you will keep the key in your secretary and never give it to any one but your child. Do you promise me? Ah, yes, I promise you, said Lloyd, puzzled at the intensity with which his wife appeared to cling to this idea. Will you swear? repeated Perdita. Yes, I swear. Well, I trust you. I trust you, said the poor lady, looking into his eyes with eyes in which if he had suspected her vague apprehensions, he might have read an appeal quite as much as an assurance. Lloyd bore his bereavement rationally and manfully. 
a month after his wife's death in the course of business circumstances arose which offered him an opportunity of going to england he took advantage of it to change the current of his thoughts he was absent nearly a year during which his little girl was tenderly nursed and guarded by her grandmother on his return he had his house again thrown open and announced his intention of keeping the same state as during his wife's lifetime it very soon came to be predicted that he would marry again and there were at least a dozen young women of whom one may say that it was by no fault of theirs that for six months after his return the prediction did not come true during this interval he still left his little daughter in mrs wingrave's hands the latter assuring him that a change of residence at so tender an age would be full of danger for her health finally however he declared that his heart longed for his daughter's presence and that she must be brought up to town he sent his coach and his housekeeper to fetch her home mrs wingrave was in terror lest something should befall her on the road and in accordance with this feeling rosalind offered to accompany her she could return the next day so she went up to town with a little niece and mr lloyd met her on the threshold of his house overcome with her kindness and with paternal joy instead of returning the next day rosalind stayed out the week and when at last she reappeared she had only come for her clothes arthur would not hear of her coming home nor would the baby that little person cried and choked if rosalind left her and at the sight of her grief arthur lost his wits and swore that she was going to die in fine nothing would suit them but that the aunt should remain until the little niece had grown used to strange faces it took two months to bring this consummation about for it was not until this period had elapsed that rosalind took leave of her brother-in-law mrs wingrave had shaken her head over her daughter's absence she had declared that it was not becoming that it was the talk of the whole country she had reconciled herself to it only because during the girl's visit the household enjoyed an unwonted term of peace bernard wingrave had brought his wife home to live between whom and her sister-in-law there was as little love as you please rosalind was perhaps no angel but in the daily practice of life she was a sufficiently good-natured girl and if she quarrelled with mrs bernard it was not without provocation quarrel however she did to the great annoyance not only of her antagonist but of the two spectators of these constant altercations her stay in the household of her brother-in-law therefore would have been delightful if only because it removed her from contact with the object of her antipathy at home it was doubly it was ten times delightful in that it kept her near the object of her early passion mrs lloyd's sharp suspicions had fallen very far short of the truth rosalind's sentiment had been a passion at first and a passion it remained a passion whose radiant heat tempered to the delicate state of his feelings mr lloyd very soon felt the influence lloyd as i have hinted was not a modern petrarch it was not in his nature to practise an ideal constancy he had not been many days in the house with his sister-in-law before he began to assure himself that she was in the language of that day a devilish fine woman whether rosalind really practised those insidious arts that her sister had been tempted to impute to her it is needless to inquire it is enough to say that she found means to appear to the very best advantage she used to seat herself every morning before the big fireplace in the dining-room at work upon a piece of tapestry with her little niece disporting herself on the carpet at her feet or on the train of her dress and playing with her woollen balls lloyd would have been a very stupid fellow if he had remained insensible to the rich suggestions of this charming picture he was exceedingly fond of his little girl and was never weary of taking her in his arms and tossing her up and down and making her crow with delight very often however he would venture upon great liberties that the young lady was yet prepared to allow and then she would suddenly vociferate her displeasure rosalind at this would drop a tapestry and put out her handsome hands with the serious smile of the young girl whose virgin fancy had revealed to her all of her mother's healing arts lloyd would give up the child their eyes would meet the hands would touch and rosalind would extinguish the little girl's sobs upon the snowy folds of the kerchief that crossed her bosom her dignity was perfect and nothing could be more discreet than the manner in which she accepted her brother-in-law's hospitality it may almost be said perhaps that there was something harsh in her reserve 
Lloyd had a provoking feeling that she was in the house and yet was unapproachable. Half an hour after supper, at the very outset of the long winter evenings, she would light her candle, make the young man a most respectful curtsy, and march off to bed. If these were arts, Rosalind was a great artist. But their effect was so gentle, so gradual. They were calculated to work upon the young widower's fancy with a crescendo so finely shaded that, as the reader has seen, several weeks elapsed before Rosalind began to feel sure that her returns would cover her outlay. When this became morally certain, she packed up a trunk and returned to her mother's house. For three days she waited. On the fourth, Mr. Lloyd made his appearance, a respectful but pressing suitor. Rosalind heard him to the end with great humility and accepted him with infinite modesty. It is hard to imagine that Mrs. Lloyd would have forgiven her husband. But if anything might have disarmed her resentment, it would have been the ceremonious countenance of this interview. Rosalind imposed upon her lover but a short probation. They were married, as was becoming, with great privacy, almost with secrecy, in the hope, perhaps, as was waggishly remarked at the time, that the late Mrs. Lloyd wouldn't hear of it. The marriage was to all appearance a happy one, and each party obtained what each had desired. Lloyd, a devilish fine woman, and Rosalind, but Rosalind's desires, as the reader will have observed, had remained a good deal of a mystery. There were indeed two blots upon their felicity, but time would perhaps efface them. During the first three years of her marriage, Mrs. Lloyd failed to become a mother, and her husband on his side suffered heavy losses of money. This latter circumstance compelled a material retrenchment in his expenditure, and Rosalind was perforce less of a fine lady than her sister had been. She contrived, however, to carry it like a woman of considerable fashion. She had long since ascertained that her sister's copious wardrobe had been sequestrated for the benefit of her daughter, and that it lay languishing in thankless gloom in the dusty attic. It was a revolting thought that these exquisite fabrics should await the good pleasure of a little girl who sat in a high chair and ate bread and milk with a wooden spoon. Rosalind had the good taste, however, to say nothing about the matter until several months had expired. Then, at last, she timidly broached it to her husband. Was it not a pity that so much finery should be lost? For lost it would be, what with colours fading and moths eating it up and the change of fashions. But Lloyd gave her so abrupt and peremptory a refusal that she saw for the present her attempt was vain. Six months went by, however, and brought with them new needs and new visions. Rosalind's thoughts hovered lovingly about her sister's relics. She went up and looked at the chest in which they lay imprisoned. There was a sullen defiance in its three great padlocks and its iron bands which only quickened her cupidity. There was something exasperate in its incorruptible immobility. It was like a grim and grizzled old household servant who locks his jaws over a family secret. And then there was a look of capacity in its vast extent, and a sound as of dense fullness when Rosalind knocked its side with the toes of a little shoe, which caused her to flush with baffled longing. It's absurd, she cried. It's improper. It's wicked. And she forthwith resolved upon another attack upon her husband. On the following day, after dinner, when he had had his wine, she boldly began it. But he cut a shot with great sternness. Once for all, Rosalind, said he, it's out of the question. I shall be gravely displeased if you return to the matter. Very good, said Rosalind. I am glad to learn the esteem in which I am held. Gracious heaven, she, she cried, I am a very happy woman. It's an agreeable thing to feel one's self-sacrifice to a caprice and her eyes filled with tears of anger and disappointment. Lloyd had a good-natured man's horror of a woman's sobs, and he attempted, I may say he condescended to explain. It's not a caprice, dear. It's a promise, he said. An oath. An oath? It's a pretty matter for oaths. And to whom, pray? To Perdita, said the young man, raising his eyes for an instant, but immediately dropping them. Perdita! Ah, Perdita! And Rosalind's tears broke forth. Her bosom heaved with stormy sobs, sobs which were the long-deferred sequel of the violent fit of weeping in which she had indulged herself on the night when she discovered her sister's betrothal. She had hoped in her better moments that she had done with her jealousy, but her temper on that occasion had taken an ineffaceable fold. And pray, 
What right had Perdita to dispose of my future? she cried. What right had she to bind you to meanness and cruelty? Ah, I occupy a dignified place and I make a very fine figure. I am welcome to what Perdita has left. And what has she left? I never knew till now how little. Nothing, nothing, nothing. This was very poor logic, but it was very good as a scene. Lloyd put his arm around his wife's waist and tried to kiss her. But she shook him off with magnificent scorn. Poor fellow! He had coveted a devilish fine woman, and he had got one. Her scorn was intolerable. He walked away with his ears tingling, irresolute, distracted. Before him was a secretary, and in it the sacred key with which his own hand he had turned in the triple lock. He marched up and opened it, and took the key from a secret drawer, wrapped in a little packet which he had sealed with his own honest bit of blazonry. Je garde, said the motto, I keep. But he was ashamed to put it back. He flung it upon the table beside his wife. Put it back, she cried. I want it not. I hate it. I wash my hands of it, cried her husband. God forgive me. Mrs. Lloyd gave an indignant shrug of her shoulders and swept out of the room, while the young man retreated by another door. Ten minutes later, Mrs. Lloyd returned, and found the room occupied by her little stepdaughter and the nursery maid. The key was not on the table. She glanced at the child. Her little niece was perched on a chair with the packet in her hands. She had broken the seal with her own small fingers. Mrs. Lloyd hastily took possession of the key. At the habitual supper hour, Arthur Lloyd came back from his counting room. It was the month of June, and supper was served by daylight. The meal was placed on the table but Mrs. Lloyd failed to make her appearance. The servant whom his master sent to call her back came with the assurance that her room was empty, and that the women informed him that she had not been seen since dinner. They had in truth observed her to have been in tears, and supposing her to be shut up in her chamber had not disturbed her. Her husband called her name in various parts of the house, but without response. At last it occurred to him that he might find her by taking the way to the attic. The thought gave him a strange feeling of discomfort, and he bade his servants remain behind, wishing no witness in his quest. He reached the foot of the staircase leading to the topmost flat, and stood with his hand on the banisters pronouncing his wife's name. His voice trembled. He called again, louder and more firmly. The only sound which disturbed the absolute silence was a faint echo of his own tones, repeating his question under the great eaves. He nevertheless felt irresistibly moved to ascend the staircase. It opened upon a wide hall, lined with wooden closets, and terminating in a window which looked westward, and admitted the last rays of the sun. Before the window stood the great chest. Before the chest on her knees, the young man saw with amazement and horror the figure of his wife. In an instant he crossed the interval between them bereft of utterance. The lid of the chest stood open, exposing amid their perfumed napkins its treasures of stuffs and jewels. Rosalind had fallen backward from a kneeling posture, with one hand supporting her on the floor and the other pressed to her heart. On her limbs was the stiffness of death, and on her face, in the fading light of the sun, the terror of something more than death. Her lips were parted in entreaty, in dismay, in agony, and on her blanched brow and cheeks there glowed the mark of ten hideous wounds from two vengeful ghostly hands. End of The Romance of Certain Old Clothes by Henry James Read for you by Chiquito Crasto, Birmingham, Alabama It is needless to inquire. The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Swart. The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. 
Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how heartily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so, by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. You should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a lantern, all closed, closed, so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. <laughs> what a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously. Cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye was always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's men in hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he not even a dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, <laughs> and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with a thick darkness, for the shutters were close fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in his bed crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime, I didn't hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed and listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief. Oh, no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it is welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor. Or, it is merely a cricket, which has made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain, all in vain, because death, in approaching him, had stalked him with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little 
a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a single dim ray, like the thread of the spider, shot from out the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else in the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of the senses? Now I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meanwhile, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker, and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous. So I am. And now at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet... For some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, only once. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatsoever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught it all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart. For what had I now to fear? There entered three men, who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office. And they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness until, at length, 
I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently, and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased. And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such as a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles, in a high key and with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed. I raved. I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose all over and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no, they heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think, but anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, hark, louder, 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 louder. Villains, I shrieked. Dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here. It is the beating of his hideous heart. End of the Telltale Heart. Recorded by Sarah Swart. Each Man Kills by Victoria Glad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pam Castile. Each Man Kills by Victoria Glad. Now that it's all over, it seems like a bad dream. But when I look at Maria's picture on my desk, I realize it couldn't have been a dream. Actually, it was only six months ago that I sat at this same desk, looking at her picture, wondering what could have happened to her. It had been six weeks since there had been any word from her, and she had promised to write as soon as she arrived in Europe. Considering that my future rested in her small hands, I had every right to be apprehensive. We had grown up together, had lost our folks within a few years of each other, and had been fond of each other the way kids are apt to be. Then the change came. It seemed I loved her, and she was still just fond of me. During our early college days, I sort of let things ride, but once we went on to graduate school, I began to crowd her. The next thing I knew, she had signed up with a student tour destined for Central Europe, and told me she would give me an answer when she returned. I had to be content with that, but couldn't help worrying. Maria was a strange girl, withdrawn, dreamy, and soft-hearted. Knowing the section she was going to, I was inclined to be uneasy, since it is the realm of gypsies, fortune-tellers, and the like. It is also the birthplace of many strange legends, and Maria claimed to be strongly psychic. As a matter of fact, she had foretold one or two things which were probably coincidental, like the death of our parents, and which even made an impression on me, and you'd hardly call me a believer. This so-called talent of hers led her into trouble on more than one occasion. I remember in her senior year at college, she fell under the spell of a short, fat, greasy spook reader with a strictly phony accent and all but gave her eye teeth away. Until I realized something was amiss, got to the bottom of it, and dispatched friend Spook Reader pronto. If she should meet some unscrupulous person now, with no one around to get her out of the scrape, but I didn't want to think of that, I was sure this time everything would be all right. When she didn't write at first, I let it go that she was busy. Finally, six weeks' silent treatment aroused my curiosity. It also aroused my nasty temper. 
and the next thing I knew I was on a plane bound for the continent. Within two hours after landing, I found her at a little inn in Transylvania, a quaint little place that looked as if it were made of gingerbread, and was surrounded by the huge, craggy Transylvania mountain range. I also found Todd Hunter. "'What's wrong, Maria? Why didn't you write?' I asked. Her usually gay, shining brown eyes flashed angrily. "'Why couldn't you leave me alone? I told you not to come after me. I came here so I could think this out. For God's sake, Bill, can't you see I wanted to think, to be by myself?' "'But you promised to write,' I persisted, wondering at this change in her, this impatience. Wonder, too, at her wraith-like slimness. She'd always been curved in the right places. "'Maria has been studying much too diligently,' Todd said slowly. "'She's always tired lately. She hasn't been too well, either. Her throat bothers her.' I wanted to punch his head in. For some reason, I didn't like him. Not because I sensed his rivalry. I was above that. God knows I wanted her to be happy above everything. It was just something about him that irritated me. An attitude. Not supercilious. I could have coped with that. Rather, it was a calm imperturbability that seemed to speak his faith in his eventual success, regardless of any effort on my part. I don't know how to fight that sort of strategy. I look like I am, blunt and obvious. Suddenly, I didn't care if he was there. Maria, Rhea, darling, this guy's no good for you. Can't you see that? What do you know about him? She looked at me, her eyes surprised and a little hurt. Then she looked at him, seeming to be looking through him and into herself, if you know what I mean. A slow flush spread from the base of her throat, that thin, almost transparent throat. All I have to know, she said softly. I love him. She looked out the window. I'm going up into Cognstein Mountain to a small sanitarium for my health shortly. The doctor has told me I must go away, and Todd has suggested this place. There Todd and I shall be married. I knew then how it felt to be on the receiving end of a monkey punch. That she had come to this decision because of my objections, I had not the slightest doubt. She was going to marry someone about whom she knew absolutely nothing. She was much more ill than she knew. Hunter was undoubtedly after her money. She was considerably well off. Obviously, she was once more being influenced in the wrong direction. I won't let you, I warned. Give it some more time, if for nothing else, then for old time's sake. How about me, Morris? Todd interrupted. You haven't even asked me my feelings on the subject. I happen to love Maria dearly. Have I no say just because you're a childhood friend of hers? Childhood friend? I was her whole family for years before she ever heard of you. I'll see you in hell before I let her marry you, I shouted. Looking back, I'm sure that had he said anything else, I would have killed him, if Rhea hadn't come between us. That's enough, Bill Morris. I've heard all I want to from you. I'm twenty-three, and if I choose to marry Todd, I'll do so, and there's nothing you can do about it. Now please go. Okay, Rhea, I said, if that's the way you want it, but I'm not through. If you won't protect yourself, I'll do it for you. I'd like to know more about the mysterious Mr. Todd Hunter, American, and I do wish, for your own sake, you'd do the same. I wouldn't care if you married King Tut, so long as you knew all about him. People don't just marry strangers, not if they're smart. For God's sake, ask him about himself. All right, Bill, she replied, smiling patiently. I'll ask him. Now do stop being childish. Okay, darling, I said sheepishly. But do me one more favor. Don't marry him until I get back. Only a little while. Give me a week. Just wait a little longer. As I closed the door, I could still feel his smile mocking, yet a little sad. But Maria didn't wait. I was gone a week. 
I had walked my legs off trying to track down the elusive Mr. Hunter, and discovered exactly nothing. All his landlady could tell me was that he was an American who had come to this climate for his health, and that he slept late mornings. I was licked, and I knew it. If I had been a pup, I would have fitted my tail neatly between my legs and made for home. But I wasn't a pup, so I headed straight for Rhea's flat to face the music. They were waiting for me, she and Todd. When I saw her, I wished I were dead. She lay in Todd's arms, her body a mere whisper of a body. White and cold she was, like frozen milk on a cold winter's day. They were both dead. You know how it is when at a wake someone views the deceased and says kindly, she's beautiful and she isn't beautiful at all, just a made-up, lifeless handful of clay, dead as dead and frightening. Well, it wasn't that way this time. Their fair skins were faintly pink-tinted and their blonde heads, hers ashen and his a reddish cast, gleamed brightly and they sat so close in the sofa before the fire, his head resting in the hollow of her throat. They looked peaceful. No line marred their faces. I almost fancied I saw them breathe. And on her third finger, left hand, was the ring. A thin, platinum band he had won, and in winning, somehow, he had lost. How they had died, and why they found each other and death at the same time, I would probably never know. I only knew one thing. I had to get away from there quickly. I almost ran the distance to my flat, stumbled into the place and poured a triple scotch, which I could scarcely hold. The scotch seared my throat and tasted bitter. Someone must have poured salt in it. Then I realized that it was tears, my tears. I, Bill Morris who hadn't cried since my fifth birthday. I was sobbing like a baby. I didn't call the police. That would mean I would have to go back and watch them cover that lovely body, carry it away and submit it to untold indignities in order to ascertain the cause of death. The cleaning girl would find them in the morning and would notify the police. But it wasn't so simple as that. In the morning, I found I couldn't shake off the guilt which possessed me. Even two bottles of scotch hadn't helped me to forget. I was dead drunk and cold sober at the same time. I phoned Rhea's landlady and told her I had failed to reach the hunters by phone, that I was sure something was amiss. Would she please go to their flat and see if anything was wrong? She was amused. Really, Mr. Morris, you must be mistaken. Miss Maria went out just an hour ago with her new husband. Surely you are jesting. Why... She has never looked better, so happy. They have left for Cognitstein. They have also left you a note. I told her I would be right over and hopped a cab. I began to think I was losing my mind. I had seen them both, dead. The landlady had seen them this morning, alive. When I arrived, the landlady looked at me for a long moment, taking in my rough, dark blue complexion, unpressed clothes, red-rimmed eyes, then wagged a finger playfully. You are playing a joke, no, a wedding joke, maybe. Here, too, we haze newlyweds. But, of course, I understood. Who could help loving Miss Maria? Be of good heart, young man. For you there will be another, some day. But I talk too much. Here is your letter. I went where I would be undisturbed, to the reading room of the library on the same street as my flat, to the musty, oblong, dimly lit room, whose threshold sunshine and fresh air dared not cross without the saving warmth of sunlight or the fresh clean relief of sweet-smelling air i read read inhaling the pungent sour smell of the scotch i had consumed during the long sleepless night read and then doubted that i had read it all but the blue ink on the white paper forced me to acknowledge its actuality it had been written by hunter in a neat scholar's script Dear Morris, it began. Why should I not have wanted Maria? You did. Others doubtless did. Why, then, should she not be mine? There are many things worse than being married to me. She might have married a man who beat her. With her I have known the two happiest days of my life. I want no more than that. 
I have no right to ask for more. Have we, any of us, a right to endless bliss on this earth? Hardly. You thought of her welfare above all. For that I owe you some explanation. You must be patient. You must believe. And in the end, you must do as I ask. You must. You wanted to know about me, of my life before Maria. Before Maria? It seems strange to think about it. There is no life without Maria. Still, there was a time when, for me, she didn't exist. I have been constantly going forward to the day when I would meet her. Yet there was a time when I didn't know where I would find her or even what her name would be. It was chance that brought us together. For me, good chance. For you, possibly ill chance. For Maria, only she can say. Some three years ago, I was studying in England under a Rhodes scholarship. The future held great things for me. I was a Yank, like yourself, and damn proud of it. Life in England seemed strange and slow and sometimes utterly dismal under austerity. Then, little by little, I slipped into their slower ways, growing to love the people for their spunk, and finally coming to feel I was one of them, so to speak. I have said everything slowed down. I was wrong. Studying intensified for me. The folklore of the British Isles intrigued me. I delved into the black Welsh tales, the mischievous fancies of the Irish, the English legends of the prowling werewolf. For me it was a relief from political science, which suddenly palled and which smacked of treason in the light of current events. My extracurricular research consumed the better part of my evenings. My books were and always have been a part of me, and, as was to be expected, I overdid it. I studied too hard with too little let up, Sometimes it seemed to me there was more truth to what I read than myth. It became somewhat of an obsession. Suddenly, one night, everything blacked out. I came to in a sanatorium. I didn't know how I got there, and when they explained it to me, I laughed. I thought they were joking. When I tried to get up to walk, I collapsed. Then I knew how bad it had been. I knew, too, I would have to go slowly. It was there I met Eve. She was beautiful, not like Maria, who was like a fragile, fair, sugar-spun angel. Eve was more earthy, with skin like ivory, creamy and rich and pale. Her blue-black hair she wore long and gathered in the back. She looked about twenty-five, but a streak of pure white ran back from each of her temples. She was the most striking woman I have ever met. I had never known anyone like her, nor have I since I saw her last. You know how it is. The air of mystery about a woman makes a man like a kid again. She reminded me of a sleek black cat with her large hazel eyes. I bumped into her one day on the veranda and spent every day with her after that. The doctors wanted me to take exercise, short walks and the like, and Eve went with me, struggling to keep up with me. The slightest effort tired her. She suffered from a rather nasty case of anemia. She seldom smiled. The effort was probably too much for her. I saw her really smile only once. We had been on one of our short hikes in the woods, close by the grounds. She stumbled over a twig or a branch, I'm not sure which. Suddenly she was in my arms. Have you ever held a cloud in your arms, Morris? So light she was, although she was almost as tall as I. Warm and pulsating, her eyes held mine. It was almost uncanny. I have never been affected like that by a woman. Then I was kissing her. Then a sharp sting, and I winced. There was the warm, salt taste of blood on my lips. I never knew how it happened, but she was smiling. Her full mouth parted in the strangest smile I have ever seen. And those small white teeth gleamed, and in her eyes, which were all black pupils now, with the iris quite hidden, was desire, or something beyond desire. I couldn't define it then. Now I think I can. Her small, pink tongue darted over her lips, tasting, seeming to savor. I was frightened, for some indefinable reason. I wanted to get away from her, from the woods, from myself. I grasped her arm roughly, and we started back for the grounds. We never mentioned the episode again, but we neither of us ever forgot. She intrigued me now more than ever. The doctors were able to satisfy my curiosity somewhat. They told me she had been a patient for some four years. Some days she was better, some days worse. She needed rest, much rest. Most days she slept past noon with their approval. Some days there was a faint flush beneath that ivory skin. 
Other days it was pale and cool. Just when we became lovers, I scarcely remember, things were happening so fast I could barely keep pace with them. There was a magnetism about Eve which compelled. I couldn't have resisted if I'd wanted to, and I didn't. I began to have long periods of lassitude, times when I would black out and remember nothing afterwards, and the dreams began. I would dream I was stroking a large, velvety black cat, a cat with shining yellow eyes that looked at me as if they knew my every thought. I would stroke it continuously, and it would nip me playfully. Then one night the dream intensified. I was playing with the creature, caressing it gently, when of a sudden its lips drew back in a snarl, and without warning it sprang at my throat and buried its fangs deep. I thought I could feel life being drawn from me. I screamed. The doctors told me afterwards that I was semi-conscious for days, that I had to be restrained. When I was well again, Eve came to see me. She was gentle, soothing. She held me close to her, and, oh, it was good to be alive and to belong to someone. I remember to this day what she wore. Black velvet lounging slacks, a low-necked amber satin blouse caught at the V by a curiously wrought antique silver pin. It was round, about four inches in diameter. In its center was the carved figure of a serpent coiled to strike. Its eyes were deep amber topazes, and its darting tongue was raised and set with a blood-red ruby. "'What an unusual pin, Eve,' I said. "'I've never seen it before, have I?' "'No,' she replied. "'It belongs to the deep, dark, seldom-discussed skeleton in the Orcasi closet, Todd. "'You see, my great-great-grandmother was quite a wicked lady, to hear tell. "'Went in for witches' masses and the like.' They say she poisoned her husband, a rather elderly and very childish man, for her lover, whom she subsequently married. Together they did away with relatives who stood in the way of their accumulating more money. This pin was the instrument of death. Her slim fingers pressed the ruby tongue and the pin opened, revealing a space large enough to secrete powder. It's like those employed by the infamous Borgias, as you can see, she continued shrugging. Perhaps it was fate, then, that her devoted new husband tired of her once her fortune was assured him, took a young mistress for himself, and disposed of the unfortunate wife, using her own pen to perpetrate her murder. She was excommunicated by her church, too, which must have made it most unpleasant for her, poor old dear. The slim shoulders straightened. But let's not discuss such unpleasant things, my dear. The important thing now is for you to get well quickly. I've missed you terribly, you know. It was then I asked her to marry me. I knew I didn't really love her, but there seemed nothing to prevent our marriage, and she had gotten under my skin. It was as elemental as that. She said she thought she should wait until I fully recovered. Don't say any more, darling, she said. Rest your poor sore throat. She bent over me solicitously, and I reached up to stroke that smooth black hair. It had a familiar feel to it that I couldn't quite place. Of course, I had stroked it hundreds of times before, but it wasn't that. Then she looked straight at me, those large, glowing, hazel eyes boring into mine, and I knew, knew and disbelieved at the same time. I froze where I lay, paralyzed by my fear, unable to make a sound. So you know, she whispered. It is well. I have marked you for my own these many months. Now that you know, you will not fight. You know what I am, or at least you can guess. This pen you admired so, it was mine three hundred years ago, and it will always be mine. Her lips were on mine. She had never kissed me like this. It was like the touch of hot ice, freezing, then searing, unendurable. I lay inert. I couldn't have moved if I wanted to. I could scarcely breathe. Then I felt the blood within me pounding, pulsing, beginning to answer in spite of myself, I tasted once more the warm, salty fluid on my lips. Eve's body was liquid in my arms, warm, heady, narcotizing. Once again I felt the agonizing, dagger-sharp pain in my throat and darkness. Have you ever wakened to a bright, sunny afternoon and heard yourself pronounced dead? They spoke in low, hushed tones. 
How unfortunate, young fellow, only thirty, dying so far away from his homeland, no family. Good thing he was well set in life. This sudden anemia was most extraordinary. Fellow showed no signs of it previously. All he had really needed was rest. If he had recovered, that lovely Eve or Cassie might have made their lives happier, richer. Sad ending to what might have been an idol. Good to her to claim the body. She said she was going to enter it in the family vault in Cognenstein Mountain in Transylvania. I heard them distinctly. I wanted to shout that I wasn't dead. I wanted to wake up from this horrible nightmare. I was alive as they. I knew I had to get out of there some way to get away from Eve, whom I now feared. They left to make arrangements. The lassitude crept through me without warning. I dozed in spite of myself, and I dreamed again. I was a cat running, leaping through windows, lopping over the countryside, stopping for no one. I panted with my exertions. Towns and cities flew by. I had to get some place and quickly. Then the dream ended. Todd, she said, get up, my dear. I heard her, and I hated her. Hated her while I was drawn to her. There was a white mist before my eyes. I reached up to brush it away. It was not a mist. It was a cloth. I shivered. I must wake up, I whispered hoarsely. I must. I'm going mad. There was a creaking sound, and daylight descended upon me. When I saw where I was, I covered my face with my hands and sobbed. I tried to pray, but the words froze on my lips. I was sitting in a coffin in a mausoleum. I had been buried alive. What am I? I shrieked. Where am I, and what have you done? I'm out of my mind, stark staring mad. Eve's lips parted, showing the even white teeth, those slightly pointed teeth. You're quite sane, my dear, she said calmly. You are now one of us, a revenant, even as I, and to live you must feed on the living. It's not true, I shouted. This is all a crazy nightmare, part of my illness. You're not real. Nothing is real. I'm quite real, Todd. To be trite, I am what I am, and have accepted it calmly, as you shall in time. I have told you of my life. You have been a student of legends. Legends are often, more often than you think, reality. When one has been murdered, if one has lived a so-called wicked life, he is doomed to walk the earth, battening on the living. My fate was sealed as I lay in my coffin, but that wasn't enough. As I lay there, my pet cat, Suma, slunk into the room and leapt over me. That was a double insurance of my life after death. Those whom I mark for my own must, too, live on. Accept it, my dear. You have no other choice. No, I cried. I'm an American. Things like this don't happen to us. It's only in stories and then to foreigners. She chuckled dryly. I'm afraid these things do happen, and in this case, you're it, my dear. Make the best of it. But I wouldn't. I refused to for a while. I would not feast on the blood of the living. Something within me fought for time. Then the awful hunger began, the tearing pangs of hunger that ordinary food wouldn't arrest. I fought it as long as I could. I lost. First it was small animals, animals that I loved. It was my life or theirs. Then there was a little girl, a dear little creature who might have been my child under different circumstances. After the episode of the little girl Eve left me, she had no further use for me. She had wanted the child, too, and I had got it. I was now competition to be shunned. I was alone, once again alone, and thoroughly miserable. I couldn't understand myself, my motives, so how could I expect someone else to understand? I only knew what I was, nor could I rationalize on why I had become this way. I could only presume it had happened to others equally as innocent as myself of wrongdoing. In the daytime, when I was like others, I reproached myself. Goodness knows, I loathed myself and what I had to do in order to live. I wished I might really die, for I was tired, so frightfully tired and sick of it all. But I knew of no way to accomplish this, so I had to bear it all, 
fasting until my voracious, disgusting appetites got the better of me. I decided there must be some information on my kind, particularly in this area where vampire legends are rife, so I took to haunting reading rooms. It was there I met Maria. She told me, after we knew each other better, that she was doing graduate work in regional superstitions and had decided that her thesis would treat of the history of vampirism. She found it terribly amusing, but at the same time frightening, didn't I? I fear I saw nothing laughable about it, but I held my peace. Why, I could have done a thesis for her that would have driven some mild manner professor completely out of his mind. I kept my knowledge to myself, though. I didn't want to scare Maria. She was like a flash of sunshine in a darkened room. She made each day worth living. For the first time, the hunger pangs ceased. Ceased for one week, then two. I was certain I was cured. Perhaps, I thought, the whole thing was just a dream, and I am finally awake. I felt then I had the right to tell her of my love. She looked infinitely sad. She wasn't certain, she said. She knew she was awfully fond of me, but she was confused. She had just come away from the States, trying to make up her mind about someone dear, whom she didn't want to hurt, and she wanted a breather. I said I would wait up to and through eternity if she wished. Things went along peacefully then. We would walk for hours together, walk in complete silence and understanding. My strength seemed to be returning more, day by day. We went far afield in search of material for her thesis. She would track down the most minute speck of hearsay to get authenticity. One day in our wanderings I thoughtlessly let myself be led too near my resting place. One of the locals mentioned a place of horror nearby, and Maria wanted to investigate. I had no choice. We poked amid the still fustiness of the deserted mausoleum I knew so well. She thought it odd that the door was unlocked. I said yes, wasn't it? Then she saw the box, that gleaming copper box which Eve had so thoughtfully provided. She stroked it gently, commenting on its beauty, and before I could prevent it or divert her attention, she had lifted the heavy lid exposing the disarranged shroud, the remains of one or two hapless small creatures, the horrible, blood-stained satin lining. She screamed and dropped the lid, somehow pinching her finger. She hopped on one foot, as one usually does to fight down sudden pain. Then she was clinging to me, thoroughly frightened. "'What does it mean, Todd?' I quieted her with the usual platitudes. Then I was kissing that poor red little finger. Without warning to myself or her, I nipped it affectionately. A warm glow spread through me. There was a taste more delightful than fine old brandy or vintage wine, and I knew irrevocably that I was not cured. No, nor ever should be, and I knew, too, that I wanted Maria. Not just as a man longs for the woman he loves, but to drink of the fountain of her life, that warm, intoxicating fountain, greedily, joyously. She never knew what went through my mind at that moment. If I could have killed myself, then I would have, and with no compunction. But there is more to killing a revenant than that. The church knows the procedure. I hurried Maria home as fast as I could and told her I had to go away for a week on business. She believed me and said she would miss me. But I didn't go away. That night I fought a losing battle with myself, and then and every night thereafter I returned to her, partook of her, and slunk away, loathing myself. I knew that I must soon kill the one being I loved above all others, kill, too, her immortal soul, and there was nothing I could do to prevent it. She began to fade visibly. When I returned in a week, she was so ill that a few steps tired her. Her appetite all but vanished. She seemed genuinely glad to see me. She was beset by nightmares, she said. Could I help her get some rest? I took her to a physician who safely prescribed a change in climate, rest and a diet rich in blood and iron, gave her a prescription for sedatives, and called it a day. You know how she looked when you saw her. The day was approaching when she would have no more blood, when life as you know it would stop, and she became like me. Somehow I couldn't take her with me without some warning, but I didn't know how to do it. You see, since I was an innocent victim myself, I could speak, could warn my intended victim, because although my soul had all but died, there was still a spark that evil hadn't touched. I knew she would think it a joke if I told her about myself without warning. Then, happily for me, you came along. I knew you would sense something amiss, and I didn't care. 
I was almost certain of her love, and I decided to seize the few minutes left to me and the devil take the hindmost. When you told her to confront me, you gave me the happiest days of my life. For this, I thank you sincerely. For what I have done and will ask you to do, forgive me. Maria asked me directly as you had known she would. I replied frankly, sparing her nothing. I told her the fact that this life had been wished on me, as it were, gave me some rights, and that I could tell her how to rid herself of me if she wished. Then she turned to me, her large, lovely eyes thoughtful. Todd, dearest, she said softly, I must die some day, really die, so what difference does it make when? I only know that I love you. Why wait until I am decrepit and alone with only a few memories to look back on? Why not now with you, where life doesn't really stop? With all I've read about this, don't you think I could free myself if I wished? I still wonder if she really believed me. We were married three days later. I never told her what her life with me would be like, that one day I would desert her, fearing and hating her rivalry for the very source of my life, and the ghastly chain would continue. I couldn't. I loved her so, Morris. Can you understand that? I couldn't betray her then, and I can't now. On the second night of our marriage, she died, as you know it, in my arms. I don't think she knows it yet, but it won't be long until she does discover it. We were quite alive when you found us. She was in an hypnotic state, induced by her condition. She heard and saw nothing, but I knew. And I must keep my faith. I must, and you are the only one who can help me. If you will show this to a priest, he will gladly accompany you to the place in Kognstein, where we rest during the morning in a new bed I had specially constructed for us. I couldn't bring Maria to that other bed of corruption. A map of how to get there is enclosed. There you will perform the ancient, effective rites, and you will lay us to rest together, as we wish. That is all I ask. When I had finished reading, I stared at nothing, trying to force myself to think. This was all he asked? In substance, he wished me to murder the girl I loved. I could refuse. I could ignore his request. I could even doubt the verity of his statements. He might be a madman, but I didn't doubt. I believed every word, and I knew I would do as he asked. That she had gone willingly, I didn't doubt. I no longer hated him so much. Rather, I pitied him, the hapless victim of a horrible chain of circumstance. I found the priest, a venerable, gentle soul, after much searching, the younger men had looked at me searchingly, laughed, and told me to read the good book for consolation and to lay off the bottle. Father Kalman was understanding with the wisdom of the very old. Yes, my son, he said, I will go. Many might doubt, but I believe. Lucifer roams the earth in many guises and must be recognized and exercised. It was five o'clock in the morning when we approached the mausoleum. The good father explained that the creatures of darkness had to be back in their resting places before the cock crew. At night they drew sustenance, during the morning they slept. There was a gleaming copper casket. Todd had not lied. We approached it warily. In it was nothing but grisly remains, bloodstains, and dust. We drew back fearful. Then we saw the other, newer casket in richest mahogany, almost twice the width of the copper box, their bridal bed. They lay together, his arm about her. She wore a gown of palest blue, but oh, that mockery of a gown! Stained it was with fresh blood which had seeped on to it from him. Obviously she had not taken to prowling yet. His mouth was dark, rich with blood, slightly open in a half-smile. His hand pressed her fair head close to his chest. She lay trustingly within the circle of his arm, like a small child. The priest crossed himself. The body twitched slightly. You know what you must do, Father Kalman whispered. I nodded, the pit of my stomach churning madly. I couldn't do it, not Maria the lovely, but I knew I would. I had to. She must not wake again to see that blood-stained gown or to wonder at her husband's gory lips. She should know rest, eternal rest. Father Kalman circled the box several times, ringing his small bell, and at one point laid a crucifix upon each of their chests. Their face writhed, and I felt my skin creep. Then, 
chanting in a low firm voice the priest gave me the signal together we drove two long stakes dipped first in holy water home piercing their hearts simultaneously the bodies leapt forward in the box straining against the stake and a horrible drawn-out wail shattered the stillness of the tomb the priest dropped to his knees and i clapped my hands over my ears but the dreadful shriek penetrated my stomach turned over and i wretched the good father followed suit we were no supermen and our bodies and our very souls revolted against this monstrous thing let us finish my son the priest said slowly after a time his face the color of ashes we must bury these dead that they may sleep in consecrated ground i couldn't i had to see her again before it was done she lay small and fragile as ever her face calm only there was no trace of life now she was still and white as only the dead the truly dead are todd's arm was flung across her chest as if to protect her i made myself move the arm resting her head upon his shoulder where it belonged then as i looked there was just maria todd was gone and only a handful of dust lay piled up around the stake it was enough i slammed the lid shut looking back now i can see it was all for the best Rhea was different apart from other women a dreamer a mystic too easily influenced by the bizarre and unnormal i on the other hand am practical almost to a fault had she married me i might have crushed in her the very thing that drew me to her in time she might have grown to hate me hunter on the other hand was a student introspective given to romanticizing susceptible to suggestion had i been confronted with an eve i should have run like hell to him though she was cloaked in mystery hence more desirable what better choice for him ultimately than rhea that rhea had to die to achieve her happiness is of no real importance life is a transitory thing anyway sometimes though when i look at rhea's picture it's hard to be practical she was everything i shall ever want i had never been to europe before the summer of nineteen forty seven i went to find maria to marry her instead i found and murdered her and i will never go back again End of Each Man Kills by Victoria Glad Recording by Pam Castile The Yellow Globe by Alexander W. Drake This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Yellow Globe by Alexander W. Drake Returning from the club at an hour long past midnight, I noticed a peculiar-looking person of medium height, somewhat angular with sallow, dark complexion, dressed like any other well-to-do person, gazing intently at the large yellow globe of colored fluid in a druggist's window. The streets were deserted, and his whole attention seemed riveted on that particular yellow spot. A few nights later, about one o'clock, I saw the man again at the same window. So, taking refuge in the shadow of a house opposite, I watched him unobserved. He stood looking earnestly at the bright yellow center of the large globe. Now he held his finger out, as though he were trying some effect, or placed his hand in silhouette against the bright background. Then he moved forward and backward, with his head bent first on one side and then on the other, as though he were looking for something beyond and through the fluid. At last he walked away casting glances backward at the fascinating yellow light, and disappeared in the darkness. A week passed, and I saw him for the third time, again scrutinizing the yellow globe. When he left, I followed him, and as we passed the street lamp, I accosted him. At first I thought he resented it, but after a moment I ventured to say, I have observed you gazing into the druggist's window. And I must say, 
my curiosity has been excited to know what you find of such interest in a druggist's yellow light. Then we walked on for some blocks in silence, and I thought I had offended him. But after a while he said slowly, The hope of my life is to a certain extent bound up in that yellow spot, the center of that globe. But pardon me, you are a total stranger, and no one but... Just then I interrupted him by remarking, What a beautiful effect of light through the street, and how soft and velvety the shadows look. There was another long pause, and then he said, You seem to take pleasure in the effects of light and shade. Oh yes, I answered. I really enjoy nature very much. What would you think of pursuing an effect year after year, as I have done? He asked. Now we were fairly launched, and I noticed as we passed the various gas lights, what a peculiar, wistful, faraway look the man had, and what a thoroughly artistic makeup. I also noticed that at every turn of the street he seemed to be looking for something. He would pause now and then and stand in utter silence, watching some unusual effect in the same intent manner with which he had looked at the druggist's light. In the meantime, we were getting into narrower streets, and as the shadows of the tall buildings partly hid us, he would give me bits of conversation, always on nature or kindred subjects. Yes, he said. The mistake that most painters make, especially the realists, is that they paint nature as they think they see it. But what of it? If art is not more than nature, it is not art. Why, he said, look at the romantic school, both old and modern. Was it not always the embodiment of an idea? Did they not always make nature do their bidding with as much or as little of herself as they chose? There is Monticelli. What a wealth of beautiful color. He takes what he wants and adds his own conception of beauty, of color, so that you get his groups of figures rich and glowing and harmonious. So with Delacroix. So with Turner. Look at his slave ship. All these men borrowed from nature so far as they chose to embody their own idea of what they wished to express? By this time we had reached the lower part of the city, and the streets became even narrower, and the odors more disagreeable. There was a sense of great coolness like the wind from the water. On we walked. I became more and more interested and occasionally made a remark to keep the conversation going, while my companion stopped from time to time to watch some new effect, as though he were afraid something would escape him. Yes, he said, I have spent years in an experiment which I hope soon to complete. I have walked the streets by day and night, I have sailed on rivers, I have looked through old doorways, have studied all kinds of vegetation, and tree forms suited to my idea and to my notion of sky effects. Old ironwork, old houses, old fences and windows. In fact, all nature has been to me a great storehouse from which to select my material. By this time we had reached the riverfront, and although long past midnight, I was so much interested in finding out what manner of man I had chanced upon that I would gladly have walked until daylight. I feared every moment that he would bid me good night, but if anything he grew more confidential. My chance remark about effects had evidently won him for some reason. As we walked on, the spars and vessels at the wharves were almost black against the sky, while the lights twinkled across the river and the stars shone overhead. Suddenly we turned a sharp corner and came to a great pile of old buildings with steep slate roofs, evidently in their better days sail lofts. And now in the gloom of one of the tallest of these buildings, he stopped, and I thought was about to say good night, 
For a time he stood as though he were thinking what he had better do. Finally he asked, Will you come up to my room? It is up many flights of stairs, but I think you may perhaps be interested in what I have to show you. As we entered the door, which he unlocked with an old-fashioned iron key, he said, Give me your hand. This building is unoccupied at night, with the exception of myself and a watchman who has a small room on the ground floor. So saying, he led me up the creaking stairs in absolute darkness. A strong smell of oakum and tar pervaded the place. On reaching the top floor, both of us out of breath, he fumbled for another key with which he unlocked the door of his room. Then he excused himself and left me standing in darkness while he proceeded to strike a light. What a curious room it was. An enormous loft with a peaked roof and horizontal beams joining the sides of the building, and several windows of medium size, evidently an old sail loft, but now filled with a most extraordinary collection of queer objects. At one end of the room were large panes of glass set in upright movable frames, some of them smeared over with a peculiar mixture. At the other end of the room was a long, plain wooden table, and at its extreme end stood one of the panes of glass. Back of this I noticed a globe of yellow fluid, something like those used in the druggist's window, but not so large. Back of the globe again was a small lamp. In another corner of the room was a gigantic thistle, now dead, planted in a large flower pot. Near it I saw a stuffed blue heron. But most interesting of all, at the extreme end of another deal table, was a model in clay of what seemed to be an old English manor house, noble in proportion, exquisite in line, and with little glass windows. Back of this model was one of the large upright frames, holding a pane of yellow glass. Here and there were small models of fences, miniature bits of ironwork, gateways, etc. On the walls were nailed the most eccentric sketches. There were gigantic studies of weeds, foreground plants done with strong effects in charcoal, and at one end of the room, a watercolor drawing on brown paper of a great rose tree, like an enlarged rose bush. From the ceiling hung globes filled with different colored fluids, and old ship lanterns, evidently for some use, not objects of bric-a-brac. In other words, I had been admitted into an immense workshop where everything had its purpose for the work in hand only. I noticed that a small portion of the room was screened off, probably as a bedroom. Near the stove on one side was a cheap round table, on which were a book or two and some newspapers as well as several new clay pipes. I have given only an idea of my first hasty survey of the room. I was constantly discovering new objects of interest. Several large, flat, white porcelain dishes, with lips at the end, seemed to have held colored liquids of various kinds, which had dried, leaving a sediment in the bottom. Many sheets of drying paper on stretchers were standing about the room. This was not the den of an elegant dilettante, but the workshop of a man in earnest about something. And now as we settled down in the large leather-covered armchairs and the long clay pipes were lighted, my strange companion became more confidential, although it was plain to be seen that by nature he was a recluse, and perhaps a brooding, melancholy man. After looking me over intently, as though he were studying my first impression of the place, he began, you are evidently much surprised and bewildered by the mass of objects with which I am surrounded. But they all mean a great deal to me. They all have their place in a new creation I am evolving. They have been collected at great expense of time and trouble to help me carry out the idea I am striving to express. Let me explain. First, I wish to render a haunted house which should be not only uncanny and weird, but beautiful as well. In fact, so beautiful that at first you would miss the horrible and mysterious and notice the beautiful only. 
How many effects I have studied for this alone? The silver-gray cold effect was the one I had first thought of, as conveying an impression of weirdness. But I finally settled on a scheme in which the whole picture should be flooded in a golden light, but a light that never was, on sea or land. Something of the effect that you might possibly see on an Indian summer day, when you feel an awful stillness in nature, when the little birds forget to sing, and sit in the sunshine as though they were paralyzed, when even the trees and flowers and all growing things seem to be under some magic spell, when as you start to walk you suddenly stand still, as if fascinated by the sunlight, when the motion of everything in nature seems suspended. You can hardly understand, he added, what this haunted house means to me. Windows have grown to have human looks, at times almost terrible. Old fences and ironworks have as keen expressions as individuals. In fact, this whole house wears its personality until I am often deeply depressed by it. I have had my life sorrow and trouble and horrible. He stopped suddenly. Did I observe a faint gleam of something like a pained, agonized look in the sudden expression of his eyes and face? If so, it was gone in a moment, and the soft, beautiful look returned, although he seemed a trifle embarrassed. Yes, he continued, I have worked many years at this haunted house. All there is in me shows itself here to one who can read it, in its various moods and parts. Sorrow? Love, hope, forgiveness, all are expressed here. And if I can leave behind me this one great picture, I shall be satisfied, even if I never do another. How long I have worked, and how earnestly I have studied for this result! Do you see those globes filled with fluid, and those upright panes of glass set in frames? They are all parts of my experiment all yellow sunsets and peculiar effects of yellow light, yellow lights shining through mists and fogs. Why, look here! And he handed me a large sketchbook filled with hundreds of studies. In one, the trees appeared in silhouette against the sunset sky. In another, there would be only a gigantic thistle, or a great rankweed, with the sky for a background. The house, he said, was not so difficult a matter for I had in memory a beautiful old manor house with its quaint gables and angles and picturesque windows. Was it a look of horror on the man's face as he spoke of the windows? After an awkward silence, he resumed, Yes, I have thought and planned and worked over this picture for years. Then as we smoked in silence, I had a good opportunity to observe him more minutely. It was evident that gentle blood ran in his veins. His head was massive and strong. There was an indescribable softness about his dark eyes, although they showed latent fire. He had a great mass of luxuriant black hair. His beard and mustache were rather long and very becoming. But now he seemed to feel my glances, and his manner became nervous and agitated. When he again raised his eyes to mine, they had grown cold and hard. To return to my favorite subject, he said, I am going to have my vegetation on a grand scale. I will have thistles as large as trees if they suit my purpose. Rose bushes shall be rose trees. But the air of mystery and weirdness, how are you going to manage that? I asked. He did not answer me at once, but after a while he said slowly, the mysterious will be there, whatever else is lacking. And I intend to get such an effect that if innocent children come near the picture, they will walk tiptoe with their fingers on their lips. Strange to say, I have decided to do it in watercolor and not in oil. Although one unquestionably does not get such solidity in watercolor, it is better suited to my purpose. Look at those square porcelain dishes with lips, and those great sheets of paper near them, all parts of the experiments I have tried. I can flow washes so transparent that they are like air itself, 
and is for a variety of texture, differences of gradation. Look at that. So saying, he handed me a sheet of paper that glowed like sunset, while the gray house in the middle distance looked as though it were seen through golden mists, or as though its gray were powdered with gold dust. That, he said, is the only one of hundreds of experiments I made before I reached with certainty what I wish to express in yellow light. I see you are looking at the sketch of the rose tree. Yes, I replied. I am very much interested. Oh, well, he said, they are all part and lot of my final picture, which is now almost completed. Perhaps you would like to see how I proceed from time to time with my experiments? He then turned the lights almost out. How uncanny it all seemed to me as I stood long past midnight in the dim shadowy loft. But I was so thoroughly interested that I did not indulge long in reflections. In a few moments, he lighted a small lamp behind the great pane of yellow glass, which I now saw was smeared over with a weird kind of sky, while the model of the house was almost in silhouette against it. In another moment, he had lighted a little lamp under the table, which shone through a small pool or pond, also made of yellow glass, which in turn threw a soft light over the front of the house. Then he illuminated the interior of his house, and through the little windows gleamed a melancholy light, subdued here and there by bits of paint carefully and most artistically added to the windows. Now he placed a small bronze heron on the shore of the miniature pond, then some bits of weeds and grasses. On one side he adjusted a group of thistles, and finally the great rose tree in miniature at one end of the house. To these he kept adding other objects, among them a small sundial. Then he led me to the other end of the room, and by some hidden mechanism threw a soft, delicious, but uncanny yellow glow over the hole. The great loft was now in midnight darkness and gloom, and only this beautiful but almost specter-like haunted little spot glowing with such strange and fascinating light. How real it appeared. I was riveted to the spot, the singular beauty of this miniature house and its surroundings grew on me. We both stood in absolute silence. What strange, hidden something was there about it that affected me so curiously? I felt cold chills begin to creep over me. The stillness became awful. I looked at my companion. He seemed lost in reverie. But it was not merely seeming. It was with real horror that he stood gazing at those little glass windows. I do not know how long we stood thus, but at last he turned up the light, and I noticed how pale he had become, and how absorbed was his manner. Now, he said, I will show you the picture. He went to the further end of the room and pulled a large curtain aside, exposing the painting to my view. You see... All the appliances of my model are but mere hints to me. I use them as I use nature, and as a figure artist uses a lay figure, taking only so much as I care for. If I had been impressed before with all I had seen, how much more was I impressed with the picture? How beautiful! Was the sky painted, or was it real? Now I could well understand all that he had worked so hard to accomplish. Again I began to feel a mysterious awe, cold shivers creeping over me, and again the painter's manner changed. He looked pale and haggard, and an expression of pain and anguish seemed to show itself in his whole being. Another awkward pause, while the beautiful yellow sky glowed like light through amber. A queer, far away, hold your breath sort of feeling came over me. I looked at the front of the house, the paths were choked with great weeds, the sundial was moss covered, and on it was a lizard so quiet that it seemed petrified. On the shore of the pond the heron stood motionless. The little birds were sitting hushed in the branches of the rose tree. 
great thistles, almost black, were in the left foreground, and the gigantic rose tree was blooming with beauty. But the something which made me shudder was the queer, fascinating light shining through the windows which affected me like a wail from the dead. I expected the next moment to hear a piercing cry from within the house. You seem impressed, he said very gently, and his voice sounded sweet and low. He replaced the curtain over the picture, and as he did so, said slowly and sadly, Only a man with a haunted heart can paint a haunted house. End of the Yellow Globe Hypnos by H.P. Lovecraft This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by A.C. Bogus. Apropos of sleep, that sinister adventure of all our nights, we may say that men go to bed daily with an audacity that would be incomprehensible if we did not know that it is the result of ignorance of the danger. Baudelaire. May the merciful gods, if indeed there be such, guard those hours when no power of will or drug that the cunning of man devises can keep me from the chasm of sleep. Death is merciful, for there is no return therefrom. But with him who has come back out of the nethermost chambers of night, haggard and knowing, peace rests nevermore. Fool that I was to plunge in with such unsanctioned frenzy into mysteries no man was meant to penetrate. Fooler God that he was, my only friend, who led me and went before me, and who in the end passed into terrors which may yet be mine. We met, I recall, in a railway station, where he was the center of a crowd of the vulgarly curious. He was unconscious, having fallen in a kind of convulsion which imparted to his slight black-clad body a strange rigidity. I think he was then approaching forty years of age, for there were deep lines in the face, wan and hollow-cheeked, but oval and actually beautiful, and touches of gray in the thick, waving hair and small, full beard, which had once been of the deepest raven black. His brow was white as the marble of Pentelicus, and of a height and breadth almost godlike. I said to myself, with all the ardor of a sculptor, that this man was a fawn statue out of antique Hellas, dug from a temple's ruins, and brought somehow to life in our stifling age, only to feel the chill and pressure of devastating years. And when he opened his immense sunken and wildly luminous black eyes, I knew he would thenceforth be my only friend, the only friend of one who had never possessed a friend before. For I saw that such eyes must have looked fully upon the grandeur and the terror of realms beyond normal consciousness and reality, realms which I had cherished in fancy but vainly sought. So as I drove the crowd away, I told him he must come with me and be my teacher and leader in unfathomed mysteries, and he assented without speaking a word. Afterward, I found that his voice was music, the music of deep vials and crystalline spheres. We talked often in the night and in the day, when I chiseled busts of him and carved miniature heads in ivory to immortalize his different expressions. Of our studies, it is impossible to speak, since they held so slight a connection with anything of the world as living men conceive it. They were of that vaster and more appalling universe of dim entity and consciousness which lies deeper than matter, time, and space, and whose existence we suspect only in certain forms of sleep, those rare dreams beyond dreams which come never to common men, but once or twice in a lifetime of imaginative men. The cosmos of our waking knowledge, born from such a universe as a bubble is born from the pipe of a jester, touches it only as such a bubble may touch its sardonic source when sucked back by the jester's whim. Men of learning suspect it little and ignore it mostly. Wise men have interpreted dreams and the gods have laughed. One man with oriental eyes has said that all time and space are relative and men have laughed. But even that man with oriental eyes has done no more than suspect. I had wished and tried to do more than suspect, and my friend had tried and partly succeeded. Then we both tried together, and with exotic drugs courted terrible and forbidden dreams in the tower studio chamber of the old manor house in Hoary Kent. Among the agonies of these after days is that chief of torments and articulateness, 
What I learned and saw in those hours of impious exploration can never be told for want of symbols or suggestions in any language. I say this because from first to last our discoveries partook only of the nature of sensations, sensations correlated with no impression which the nervous system of normal humanity is capable of receiving. There were sensations, yet within them lay unbelievable elements of time and space, things which at bottom possess no distinct and definite existence. Human utterance can best convey the general character of our experiences by calling them plungings or soarings, for in every period of revelation some part of our minds broke boldly away from all that is real and present, rushing aerially along, shocking, unenlightened, and fear-haunted abyss, and occasionally tearing through certain well-marked and typical obstacles describable only as viscous, uncouth clouds of vapors. In these black and bodiless flights, we were sometimes alone and sometimes together. When we were together, my friend was always far ahead. I could comprehend his presence, despite the absence of form, by a species of pictorial memory whereby his face appeared to me, golden from a strange light and frightful in its weird beauty, its anomalously youthful cheeks, its burning eyes, its Olympian brow, and its shadowing hair and growth of beard. Of the progress of time we kept no record, for time had become to us the merest illusion. I know only that there must have been something very singular involved, since we came at length to marvel why we did not grow old. Our discourse was unholy and always hideously ambitious. No god or demon could have aspired to discoveries and conquest like those which we planned in whispers. I shiver as I speak of them, and dare not be explicit, though I will say that my friend once wrote on paper a wish he dared not utter with his tongue, and which made me burn the paper and look affrightedly out of the window at the spangled night sky. I will hint, only hint, that he had designs which involved the rulership of the visible universe and more, designs whereby the earth and the stars would move at his command, and the destinies of all living things be his. I affirm, I swear, that I had no share in these extreme aspirations. Anything my friend may have said or written to the contrary must be erroneous, for I am no man of strength to risk the unmentionable spheres by which alone one might achieve success. There was a night when winds from unknown spaces whirled us irresistibly into limitless vacua beyond all thought and entity. Perceptions of the most maddeningly untransmittable sort thronged upon us perceptions of infinity which at the time convulsed us with joy yet which are now partly lost to my memory and partly incapable of presentation to others viscous obstacles were clawed through in rapid succession and at length i felt that we had been born to realms of greater remoteness than any we had previously known my friend was vastly in advance as we plunged into this awesome ocean of virgin ether and I could see the sinister exultation on his floating, luminous, too youthful memory face. Suddenly that face became dim and quickly disappeared, and in a brief space I found myself projected against an obstacle which I could not penetrate. It was like the others, yet incalculably denser, a sticky, clammy mass, if such terms can be applied to analogous qualities, in a non-material sphere. I had, I felt, been halted by a barrier which my friend and leader had successfully passed. Struggling anew, I came to the end of the drug dream and opened my physical eyes to the tower studio in whose opposite corner reclined the pallid and still unconscious form of my fellow dreamer, weirdly haggard and wildly beautiful as the moon shed golden green light on his marble features. Then, after a short interval, the form in the corner stirred, and may pitying heaven keep from my sight and sound another thing like that which took place before me. I can yet tell you how he shrieked or what vistas of unvisitable hells gleamed for a second in those black eyes crazed with fright. I can only say that I fainted, and did not stir till he himself recovered and shook me in his frenzy for someone to keep away the horror and the desolation. That was the end of our voluntary searchings in the caverns of dream. Awed, shaken, and pretentious, my friend who had been beyond the barrier warned me that we must never venture within those realms again. What he had seen he dared not tell me, but he said from his wisdom that we must sleep as little as possible, even if drugs were necessary to keep us awake. That he was right I soon learned from the unutterable fear which engulfed me whenever consciousness lapsed. After each short and inevitable sleep I seemed older, whilst my friend aged with a rapidity almost shocking. It is hideous to see wrinkles form and hair whiten almost before one's eyes. Our mode of life was now totally altered. 
heretofore a recluse so far as i know his true name and origin never having passed his lips my friend now became frantic in his fear of solitude at night he would not be alone nor would the company of a few persons calm him his sole relief was obtained in revelry of the most general and boisterous sort so that few assemblies of the young and gay were unknown to us our appearance and age seemed to excite in most cases a ridicule which i keenly resented but which my friend considered a lesser evil than solitude especially was he afraid to be out of doors alone when the stars were shining and if forced to this condition he would often glance furtively at the sky as if hunted by some monstrous thing therein he did not always glance at the same place in the sky it seemed to be a different place at different times on spring evenings it would be low in the northeast in summer it would be nearly overhead in the autumn it would be in the northwest in winter it would be in the east but mostly if in the small hours of the morning midwinter evenings seemed less dreadful to him only after two years did i connect this fear with anything in particular but then i began to see that he must be looking at a special spot on the celestial vault whose position at different times corresponded to the direction of his glance a spot roughly marked by the constellation corona borealis we now had a studio in london never separating but never discussing the days when we had sought to plumb the mysteries of the unreal world we were aged and weak from our drugs dissipations and nervous overstrain and the thinning hair and beard of my friend had become snow white our freedom from long sleep was surprising for seldom did we succumb more than an hour or two at a time to the shadow which had now grown so frightful a menace then came one january of fog and rain when money ran low and drugs were hard to buy my statues and ivory heads were all sold and i had no means to purchase new materials or energy to fashion them even had i possessed them we suffered terribly and on a certain night my friend sank into a deep breathing sleep from which i could not awaken him i can recall the scene now the desolate pitch black garret studio under the eaves with the rain beating down the ticking of our lone clock the fancied ticking of our watches as they rested on the dressing table, the creaking of some swaying shutter in a remote part of the house, certain distant city noises muffled by fog and space, and worst of all, the deep, steady, sinister breathing of my friend on the couch, a rhythmical breathing which seemed to measure moments of supernal fear and agony for his spirit as it wandered in spheres forbidden, unimagined, and hideously remote. The tensions of my vigil became oppressive, and a wild train of trivial impressions and associations thronged through my almost unhinged mind. I heard a clock strike somewhere, not ours, for that was not a striking clock, and my morbid fancy found in this a new starting point for idle wanderings. Clocks, time, space, infinity, and then my fancy reverted to the locale as I reflected that even now, beyond the roof and the fog and the rain and the atmosphere, Corona Borealis was rising in the northeast corona borealis which my friend had appeared to dread and whose scintillant semicircle of stars must even now be glowing unseen through the measureless abyss of ether all at once my feverishly sensitive ear seemed to detect a new and wholly distinct component in the soft medley of drug magnifying sounds a low and damnably insistent whine from very far away droning clamoring mocking calling from the northeast but it was not that distant whine which robbed me of my faculties and set upon my soul such a seal of fright as may never in life be removed not that which drew the shrieks and excited the convulsions which caused lodgers and police to break down the door it was not what i heard but what i saw from that dark locked shuttered and curtained room there appeared from the black northeast corner a shaft of horrible red gold light a shaft which bore with it no glow to disperse the darkness but which streamed only upon the recumbent head of the troubled sleeper bringing out in hideous duplication the luminous and strangely youthful memory face as i had known it in dreams of abysmal space and unshackled time when my friend had pushed beyond the barrier to those secret innermost and forbidden caverns of nightmare and as i looked I beheld the head rise, the black, liquid, and deep-sunken eyes open in terror, and the thin, shadowed lips part as if for a scream too frightful to be uttered. There dwelt in that ghastly and flexible face, as it shone bodiless, luminous, and rejuvenated in the blackness, more of stark, teeming, brain-shattering fear than all the rest of heaven and earth has ever revealed to me. 
No word was spoken amidst the distant sound that grew nearer and nearer, but as I followed the memory face's mad stare along that cursed shaft of light to its source, the source whence all the whining came, I too saw for an instant what it saw, and fell with ringing ears in that fit of shrieking epilepsy which brought the lodgers and the police. Never could I tell, try as I might, what it actually was that I saw, nor could the still face tell, for although it must have seen more than I did, it will never speak again." but always i shall guard against the mocking and insatiate hypnos lord of sleep against the night sky and against the mad ambitions of knowledge and philosophy just what happened is unknown for not only was my own mind unseated by the strange and hideous thing but others were tainted with a forgetfulness which can mean nothing if not madness they have said i know not for what reason that i never had a friend but that art philosophy and insanity had filled all my tragic life the lodgers and police on that night soothed me, and the doctor administered something to quiet me, nor did anyone see what a nightmare event had taken place. My stricken friend moved them to no pity, but what they found on the couch in the studio made them give me a praise which sickened me, and now a fame which I spurn in despair as I sit for hours, bald, graybeard, shriveled, palsied, drug-crazed, and broken, adoring and praying to the object they found." For they deny that I sold the last of my statuary, and point with ecstasy at the thing which the shining shaft of light left cold, petrified, and unvocal. It is all that remains of my friend, the friend who led me on to madness and wreckage, a godlike head of such marble as only old Hellas could yield, young with a youth that is outside time, and with beauteous bearded face, curved smiling lips, Olympian brow, and dense locks waving and poppy-crowned. They say that the haunting memory face is modeled from my own, as it was at twenty-five. But upon the marble base is carved a single name in the letters of Attica Hypnos. This is the end of Hypnos by H. P. Lovecraft. Martin's Close by M. R. James This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Sames. Martin's Close by M. R. James. Some few years back I was staying with the rector of a parish in the West, where the society to which I belong owns property. I was to go over some of this land and on the first morning of my visit soon after breakfast the estate carpenter and general handyman john hill was announced as in readiness to accompany us the rector asked which part of the parish we were to visit that morning the estate map was produced and when we had showed him our round he put his finger on a particular spot don't forget he said to ask john hill about martin's close when you get there i should like to hear what he tells you what ought he to tell us i said i haven't the slightest idea said the rector or if that is not exactly true it will do till lunch-time and here he was called away we set out john hill is not a man to withhold such information as he possesses on any point and you may gather from him much that is of interest about the people of the place and their talk an unfamiliar word or one that he thinks ought to be unfamiliar to you he will usually spell as C-O-B, Cobb, and the like. It is not, however, relevant to my purpose to record his conversation before the moment when we reached Martin's Close. The bit of land is noticeable, for it is one of the smallest enclosures you are likely to see. A very few square yards, hedged in with quickset on all sides, and without any gate or gap leading into it. You might take it for a small cottage garden long deserted, but that it lies away from the village and bears no trace of cultivation. It is at no great distance from the road, and is part of what is there called a moor, in other words a rough upland pasture, cut up into largish fields. Why is this little bit hedged off so? I asked, and John Hill, whose answer I cannot represent as perfectly as I should like, was not at fault that's what we call martin's close sir tis a curious thing about that bit of land sir goes by the name of martin's close sir m a r t i n martin beg pardon sir did rector tell you to make inquiry of me about that sir 
Yes, he did. Ah, I thought so much, sir. I was telling Richter about that last week, and he was very much interested. It appears there's a murderer buried there, sir, by the name of Martin. Old Samuel Saunders, that formerly lived here, at what we call South Town, sir. He had a long tale about that, sir. Terrible murder done upon a young woman, sir. Cut her throat and cast her in the water down her. Was he hung for it? Yes, sir. He was hung just up here on the roadway, by what I've heard on the Holy Innocence Day, many hundred years ago, by the man that went by the name of the Bloody Judge. Terrible red and bloody, I've heard. Was his name Jeffreys, do you think? Might be possible twas Jeffreys. J-E-F Jeffreys, I reckon twas. And the tale I've heard many times from Mr. Saunders, how this young man, Martin, George Martin, was troubled before his cruel action come to light by the young woman's spirit. How was that, do you know? No, sir. I don't exactly know how twas with it. But by what I've heard, he was fairly tormented, and rightly too. Old Mr. Saunders, he told the history regarding a cupboard down her in the new inn. According to what he related, this young woman's spirit come out of this cupboard, but I don't recollect the matter. This was the sum of John Hill's information. We passed on, and in due time I reported what I had heard to the rector. He was able to show me from the parish account books that a gibbet had been paid for in 1684, and a grave dug in the following year, both for the benefit of George Martin, but he was unable to suggest anyone in the parish, Saunders being now gone, who was likely to throw any further light on the story. Naturally, upon my return to the neighbourhood of libraries, I made search in the more obvious places. The trial seemed to be nowhere reported. A newspaper of the time, and one or more newsletters, however, had some short notices, from which I learned that, on the ground of local prejudice against the prisoner, he was described as a young gentleman of a good estate, the venue had been moved from Exeter to London, that Jeffreys had been the judge, and death the sentence, and that there had been some singular passages in the evidence. Nothing further transpired till September of this year. A friend, who knew me to be interested in Jeffreys, then sent me a leaf torn out of a second-hand bookseller's catalogue with the entry, Jeffreys, Judge, Interesting Old M.S. Trial for Murder, and so forth from which I gathered to my delight that I could become possessed for a very few shillings of what seemed to be a verbatim report in shorthand of the Martin trial. I telegraphed for the manuscript and got it. It was a thin bound volume, provided with a title written in longhand by someone in the eighteenth century, who had also added this note. My father, who took these notes in court, told me that the prisoner's friends had made interest with Judge Jeffreys, that no report should be put out. He had intended doing this himself when times were better, and had showed it to the Reverend Mr. Glanville, who encouraged his design very warmly, but death surprised them both before it could be brought to an accomplishment. The initials W.G. were appended. I am advised that the original reporter may have been T. Gurney, who appears in that capacity in more than one state trial. This was all that I could read for myself. After no long delay, I heard of someone who was capable of deciphering the shorthand of the seventeenth century, and a little time ago the typewritten copy of the whole manuscript was laid before me. The portions which I shall communicate here help to fill in the very imperfect outline which subsists in the memories of John Hill, and, I suppose, one or two others who live on the scene of the events. The report begins with a species of preface, the general effect of which is that the copy is not that actually taken in court, though it is a true copy in regard to the notes of what was said, but that the writer has added to it some remarkable passages that took place during the trial and has made this present fair copy of the whole, intending at some favourable time to publish it, but has not put it into longhand, lest it should fall into the possession of unauthorised persons, and he or his family be deprived of the profit. The report then begins. 
This case came on to be tried on Wednesday the 19th of November between our Sovereign Lord the King and George Martin Esquire of, I take leave to omit some of the place names, at a sessions of Oyer and Termina and Jail Delivery at the Old Bailey and the prisoner being in Newgate was brought to the bar. Clerk of the Crown. George Martin, hold up thy hand which he did. Then the indictment was read, which set forth that the prisoner, not having the fear of God before his eyes, but being moved and seduced by the instigation of the devil, upon the fifteenth day of May, in the thirty-sixth year of our sovereign Lord King Charles the Second, with force and arms in the parish aforesaid, in and upon Anne Clark, spinster of the same place, in the peace of God, and of our said sovereign lord the king then and there being feloniously wilfully and of your malice aforethought did make an assault and with a certain knife value a penny the throat of the said and clerk then and there did cut of the which wound the said and clerk then and there did die and the body of the said Anne Clark did cast into a certain pond of water situate in the same parish, with more that is not material to our purpose, against the peace of our sovereign lord the king, his crown and dignity. Then the prisoner prayed a copy of the indictment. L. C. J. Sir George Jeffreys. What is this? Sure you know that is never allowed. Besides, here is as plain indictment as ever I heard. You have nothing to do but to plead it. Prisoner. My lord, I apprehend there may be matter of law arising out of the indictment, and I would humbly beg the court to assign me counsel to consider of it. Besides, my lord, I believe it was done in another case. Copy of the indictment was allowed. L. C. J. What case was that? Prisoner. Truly, my lord, I have been kept close prisoner ever since I came up from Exeter Castle. No one allowed to come at me, and no one to advise with. L. C. J. But I say, what was that case you allege? Prisoner. My lord, I cannot tell your lordship precisely the name of the case, but it is in my mind that there was such an one, and I would humbly desire... L. C. J all this is nothing name your case and we will tell you whether there be any matter for you in it god forbid but you should have anything that may be allowed you by law but this is against law and we must keep the course of the court attorney general sir robert sawyer my lord we pray for the king that he may be asked to plead clerk of the court are you guilty of the murder whereof you stand indicted or not guilty prisoner my lord i would humbly offer this to the court if i plead now shall i have an opportunity after to accept against the indictment l c j yes yes that comes after the verdict that will be saved to you and counsel assigned if there be matter of law but that which you have now to do is to plead then after some little parleying with the court which seemed strange upon such a plain indictment the prisoner pleaded not guilty clerk of the court culprit how wilt thou be tried prisoner by god and my country clerk of the court god send thee a good deliverance l c j why how is this here has been a great to do that you should not be tried at exeter by your county but be brought here to london and now you ask to be tried by your country must we send you to exeter again prisoner my lord i understood it was the form l c j so it is man we spoke only in the way of pleasantness well go on and swear the jury so they were sworn i omit the names there was no challenging on the prisoner's part for as he said he did not know any of the persons called thereupon the prisoner asked for use of a pen ink and paper 
To which the L.C.J. replied, Ay, ay, in God's name let him have it. Then the usual charge was delivered to the jury, and the case opened by the junior counsel for the king, Mr. Dolben. The Attorney General followed. May it please your lordship, and you gentlemen of the jury, I am of counsel for the king against the prisoner at the bar. You have heard that he stands indicted for a murder done upon the person of a young girl. Such crimes as this you may perhaps reckon to be not uncommon. And indeed in these times, I am sorry to say it, there is scarce any fact so barbarous and unnatural but what we may hear almost daily instances of it. But I must confess that in this murder that is charged upon the prisoner there are some particular features that mark it out to be such as I hope has but seldom, if ever, been perpetrated upon English ground. For, as we shall make it appear, the person murdered was a poor country girl, whereas the prisoner is a gentleman of a proper estate, and besides that was one to whom Providence had not given the full use of her intellects, but was what it termed among us commonly an innocent or natural. Such an one, therefore, as one would have supposed a gentleman of the prisoner's quality more likely to overlook, or, if he did notice her, to be moved to compassion for her unhappy condition, than to lift up his hand against her in the very horrid and barbarous manner which we shall show you he used. Now to begin at the beginning and open the matter to you orderly. About Christmas of last year, that is the year 1683, this gentleman, Mr. Martin, having newly come back into his own country from the University of Cambridge, some of his neighbours, to show him what civility they could, for his family is one that stands in very good repute all over that country, entertained him here and there at their Christmas merrymakings, so that he was constantly riding to and fro from one house to another, and sometimes, when the place of his destination was distant, or for other reason, as the unsafeness of the roads, he would be constrained to lie the night at an inn. In this way it happened that he came, a day or two after the Christmas, to the place where this young girl lived with her parents, and put up at the inn there, called the New Inn, which is, as I am informed, a house of good repute. Here was some dancing going on among the people of the place, and Anne Clark had been brought in, it seems by her elder sister, to look on. But, being, as I have said, of weak understanding, and besides that very uncomely in her appearance, it was not likely she should take much part in the merriment, and accordingly was but standing by in a corner of the room. The prisoner at the bar, seeing her, one must suppose by way of a jest, asked her would she dance with him, and in spite of what her sister and others could say to prevent it and to dissuade her, L.C.J. Come, Mr. Attorney, we are not set here to listen to tales of Christmas parties in taverns. I would not interrupt you, but sure you have more weighty matters than this. You would be telling us next what tune they dance to. Attorney. My lord, I would not take up the time of the court with what is not material, but we reckon it to be material to show how this unlikely acquaintance begun, and as for the tune, I believe, indeed, our evidence will show that even that hath a bearing on the matter in hand. L.C.J. Go on, go on, in God's name, but give us nothing that is impertinent. Attorney. Indeed, my lord, I will keep to my matter. But, gentlemen, having now shown you, as I think, enough of this first time meeting between the murdered person and the prisoner, I will shorten my tale so far as to say that from then on there were frequent meetings of the two, for the young woman was greatly tickled with having got hold, as she conceived it, of so likely a sweetheart and he being once a week at least in the habit of passing through the street where she lived, she would be always on the watch for him, and it seems they had a signal arranged. He should whistle the tune that was played at the tavern, 
It is a tune, as I am informed, well known in that country, and has a burden. Madam, will you walk? Will you talk with me? L.C.J. I, I remember it in my own country, in Shropshire. It runs somehow thus, doth it not? Here his lordship whistled a part of a tune which was very observable, and seemed below the dignity of the court, and it appears he felt it so himself, for he said, But this is by the mark, and I doubt it is the first time we have had dance tunes in this court. The most part of the dancing we give occasion for is done at Tyburn. Looking at the prisoner, who appeared very much disordered, you said the tune was material to your case, Mr. Attorney, and upon my life I think Mr. Martin agrees with you. What ails you, man, staring like a player that sees a ghost? Prisoner. My lord, I was amazed at hearing such trivial foolish things as they bring against me. L.C.J. Well, well, it lies upon Mr. Attorney to show whether they be trivial or not, but I must say... If he has nothing worse than this, he has said, you have no great cause to be in amaze. Doth it not lie something deeper? But go on, Mr. Attorney. Attorney, my lord and gentlemen, all that I have said so far, you may indeed very reasonably reckon as having an appearance of triviality. And to be sure, had the matter gone no further than the humouring of a poor, silly girl by a young gentleman of quality, it had been very well. But to proceed, we shall make it appear that after three or four weeks the prisoner became contracted to a young gentlewoman of that country, one suitable every way to his own condition, and such an arrangement was on foot that seemed to promise him a happy, and a reputable living. But within no very long time it seems that this young gentlewoman, hearing of the jest that was going about that countryside with regard to the prisoner and Anne Clark, conceived that it was not only an unworthy carriage on the part of her lover, but a degradation to herself, that he should suffer his name to be sport for tavern company. And so, without more ado, she, with the consent of her parents, signified to the prisoner that the match between them was at an end. We shall show you that, upon receipt of this intelligence, the prisoner was greatly enraged against Anne Clark, as being the cause of his misfortune, though indeed there was nobody answerable for it but himself and that he made use of many outrageous expressions and threatenings against her, and subsequently upon meeting with her both abused her and struck at her with his whip. But she, being but a poor innocent, could not be persuaded to desist from her attachment to him, but would often run after him, testifying with gestures and broken words the affection she had to him until she was become, as he said, the very plague of his life. Yet being that affairs in which he was now engaged necessarily took him by the house in which she lived, he could not, as I am willing to believe he would otherwise have done, avoid meeting with her from time to time. We shall further show you that this was the posture of things up to the fifteenth day of May in this present year. Upon that day the prisoner comes riding through the village, as of custom, and met with the young woman, but in place of passing her by, as he had lately done, he stopped and said some words to her, with which she appeared wonderfully pleased, and so left her, and after that day she was nowhere to be found notwithstanding a strict search was made for her. The next time of the prisoner's passing through the place, her relations inquired of him whether he should know anything of her whereabouts, which he totally denied. They expressed to him their fears lest her weak intellect should have been upset by the attention he had showed her, 
and so she might have committed some rash act against her own life calling him to witness the same time how often they had beseeched him to desist from taking notice of her as fearing trouble might come of it but this too he easily laughed away but in spite of this light behaviour it was noticeable in him that about this time his carriage and demeanour changed and it was said of him that he seemed a troubled man and here i come to a passage to which i should not dare to ask your attention but that it appears to me to be founded in truth and is supported by testimony deserving of credit and gentlemen to my judgment it doth afford a great instance of god's revenge against murder and that he will require the blood of the innocent here mr attorney made a pause and shifted with his papers and it was thought remarkable by me and others because he was a man not easily dashed l c j well mr attorney what is your instance attorney my lord it is a strange one and the truth is that of all the cases i have been concerned in i cannot call to mind the like of it but to be short gentlemen we shall bring you testimony that anne clark was seen after this fifteenth of may and that at such time as she was so seen it was impossible she could have been a living person here the people made a hum and a good deal of laughter and the court called for silence and when it was made l c j why mr attorney you might save up this tale for a week it will be christmas by that time and you can frighten your cookmaids with it at which the people laughed again and the prisoner also as it seemed god man what are you prating of ghosts and christmas jigs and tavern company and here is a man's life at stake to the prisoner and you sir i would have you know there is not so much occasion for you to make merry neither you are not bored here for that and if i know mr attorney he has more in his brief than he has shown yet go on mr attorney i need not mayhap have spoken so sharply but you must confess your course is something unusual attorney nobody knows it better than i my lord but i shall bring it to an end with a round turn i shall show you gentlemen that anne clark's body was found in the month of june in a pond of water with the throat cut that a knife belonging to the prisoner was found in the same water that he made efforts to recover the said knife from the water that the coroner's quest brought in a verdict against the prisoner at the bar and that therefore he should by course have been tried at exeter but that suit being made on his behalf on account that an impartial jury could not be found to try him in his own country he hath had that singular favour shown him that he should be tried here in london and so we will proceed to call our evidence then the facts of the acquaintance between the prisoner and anne clark were proved and also the coroner's inquest i pass over this portion of the trial for it offers nothing of special interest sarah ascot was next called and sworn attorney what is your occupation sarah i keep the new inn at attorney do you know the prisoner at the bar sarah yes he was often at our house since he had come first at christmas of last year attorney did you know anne clark sarah yes very well attorney pray what manner of person was she in her appearance sarah she was a very short thick-made woman i do not know what else she would have me say attorney was she comely sarah no not by no manner of means she was very uncomely poor child she had a great face and hanging chops and a very bad colour like a puddock l c j what is that mistress what say you she was like sarah my lord i ask pardon i heard a squire martin say that she looked like a puddock in the face and so she did l c j did you that k 
Can you interpret her, Mr. Attorney? Attorney. My lord, I apprehend it is the country word for a toad. L.C.J. Oh, a hop toad. Aye, go on. Attorney. Will you give an account to the jury of what passed between you and the prisoner at the bar in May last? Sarah. Sir, it was this. It was about nine o'clock, the evening after that Anne did not come home, and I was about my work in the house. There was no company there, only Thomas Snell, and it was foul weather. Esquire Martin came in and called for some drink, and I, by way of pleasantry, I said to him, Squire, have you been looking after your sweetheart? And he flew out at me in a passion, and desired I would not use such expressions. I was amazed at that, because we were accustomed to joke with him about her. L.C.J. Who her? Sarah. And Clark, my lord, and we had not heard the news of his being contracted to a young gentlewoman elsewhere, or I am sure I should have used better manners. So I said nothing, but being I was a little put out, I began singing, to myself as it were, a song they danced to the first time they met, for I thought it would prick him. It was the same that he was used to sing when he came down the street. I have heard it very often. Madam, will you walk? Will you talk with me? And it fell out that I needed something that was in the kitchen. So I went out to get it, and all the time I went on singing, something louder and more bold-like. And as I was there, all of a sudden, I thought I heard someone answering outside the house. But I could not be sure because of the wind blowing so high. So then I stopped singing, and now I heard it plain, saying, Yes, sir, I will walk, I will talk with you. And I knew that voice, but Anne Clark's voice. Attorney, how did you know it to be her voice? Sarah. It was impossible I could be mistaken. She had a dreadful voice, a kind of a squalling voice, in particular if she tried to sing. And there was nobody in the police that could counterfeit it, for they often tried. So hearing that, I was glad, because we were all in an anxiety to know what was gone with her. For though she was a natural, she had a good disposition and was very tractable. And says I to myself, What child, are you returned then? And I ran into the front room and said to Squire Martin as I passed by, Squire, here's your sweetheart back again. Shall I call her in? And with that, I went to open the door. But Squire Martin, he caught hold of me, and it seemed to me that he was out of his wits, or near upon. Hold, woman, says he, in God's name, and I know not what else, but he was all of a shake. Then I was angry, and said I, What, are you not glad that poor child is found? And I called to Thomas Snell, and said, If the squire will not let me, do you open the door and call her in. So Thomas Snell went and opened the door, and the wind, setting that way, blew in and overset the two candles that was all we had lighted, and Esquire Martin fell away from holding me. I think he fell down on the floor, but we were wholly in the dark, and it was a minute or two before I got a light again. And while I was feeling for the firebox, I am not certain, but I heard someone step across the floor, and I am sure I heard the door of the great cupboard that stands in the room open and shut too. Then, when I had a light again, I see Esquire Martin on the settle, all white and sweaty, as if he had swooned it away, and his arms hanging down, and I was going to help him, but just then it caught my eye that there was something like a bit of a dress shut into the cupboard door, and it came to my mind I had heard that door shut, so I thought it might be some person had run in when the light was quenched and was hiding in the cupboard, so I went up closer and looked, and there was a bit of a brown stuffed cloak, and just below it an edge of a brown stuffed dress both sticking out of the shut of the door, and both of them was low down, as if the person that had them on might be crouched down inside. Attorney, what did you take it to be? Sarah. I took it to be a woman's dress. Attorney, could you make any guess whom it belonged to? Did you know anyone who wore such a dress? Sarah. It was a common stuff, by what I could see. I have seen many women wearing such a stuff in our parish. Attorney. Was it like Anne Clark's dress? Sarah. She used to wear just such a dress, but I could not say on my oath it was hers. Attorney. Did you observe anything else about it? Sarah. I did notice that it looked very wet, but it was foul weather outside. L.C.J. Did you feel of it, mistress? Sarah. No, my lord, I did not like to touch it. Not like? Why that? Are you so nice that you scruple to feel of a wet dress? Sarah. Indeed, my lord, I cannot very well tell why, only it had a nasty, ugly look about it. L.C.J. Well, go on. Sarah. 
Then I called again to Thomas Snell, and bid him come to me, and catch any one that come out, when I should open the cupboard door. For, says I, there is someone hiding within, and I would know what she wants. And with that, Squire Martin gave a sort of a cry, or a shout, and ran out of the house into the dark, and I felt the cupboard door pushed out against me while I held it, and Thomas Snell helped me, but for all we pressed to keep it shut as hard as we could, it was forced out against us, and we had to fall back. L.C.J. And pray what came out? A mouse? Sarah. No, my lord, it was greater than a mouse, but I could not see what it was. It fleeted very swift over the floor and out at the door. L.C.J. But come, what did it look like? Was it a person? Sarah. My lord, I cannot tell what it was, but it ran very low, and it was of a dark colour. We were both daunted by it, Thomas Snell and I, but we made all the haste we could after it to the door that stood open, and we looked out, but it was dark and we could see nothing. L.C.J. Was there no tracks on the floor? What floor have you there? Sarah. It is a flagged floor, and sanded, my lord, and there was an appearance of a wet track on the floor, but we could make nothing of it, neither Thomas Snell nor me, and besides, as I said, it was a foul night. L.C.J. Well, for my part, I see not, though to be sure it is an odd tale she tells, what you would do with this evidence. Attorney. My lord, we bring it to show the suspicious carriage of the prisoner immediately after the disappearance of the murdered person, and we ask the jury's consideration of that, and also to the matter of the voice heard without the house. Then the prisoner asked some questions not very material and Thomas Snell was next called, who gave evidence to the same effect as Mrs. Arscott, and added the following. Attorney. Did anything pass between you and the prisoner during the time Mrs. Arscott was out of the room? Thomas. I had a piece of twist in my pocket. Attorney. Twist of what? Thomas. Twist of tobacco, sir, and I felt a disposition to take a pipe of tobacco so I found a pipe on the chimney-piece, and being it was twist, and in regard of me having by an oversight left my knife at my house, and me not having over many teeth to pluck at it, as your lordship or any one else may have a view by their own eyesight. L.C.J. What is the man talking about? Come to the matter, fellow. Do you think we sit here to look at your teeth? Thomas. No, my lord, nor I would not you should do. God forbid. I know your honours have better employment and better teeth, I would not wonder. L.C.J. Good God, what a man is this! Yes, I have better teeth, and that you shall find if you keep not to the purpose. Thomas. I humbly ask pardon, my lord, but so it was. And I took upon me, thinking no harm, to ask Squire Martin to lend me his knife to cut my tobacco. And he felt first in one pocket, and then of another, and it was not there at all. And says I, What, have you lost your knife, Squire? And up he gets and feels again. And he sat down, and such a groan as he gave. Good God, he says, I must have left it there. But, says I, Squire, by all appearance it is not there. Did you set a value on it, says I? You might have it cried. But he sat there and put his head between his hands, and seemed to take no notice to what I said. And then it was Mistress Arscott come tracking back out of the kitchen place, asked if he heard the voice singing outside the house. He said no, but the door into the kitchen was shut, and there was a high wind, but says that no one could mistake Anne Clark's voice. Then a boy... William Redaway, about thirteen years of age, was called, and by the usual questions put by the Lord Chief Justice, it was ascertained that he knew the nature of an oath, and so he was sworn. His evidence referred to a time about a week later. Attorney. Now, child, don't be frightened. There is no one here will hurt you if you speak the truth. L.C.J. Aye, if he speak the truth. But remember, child, thou art in the presence of the great God of heaven and earth, that hath the keys of hell, and of us that are the king's officers, 
and have the keys of Newgate. And remember, too, there is a man's life in question. And if thou tellest a lie, and by that means he comes to an ill end, thou art no better than his murderer. And so speak the truth. Attorney, tell the jury what you know, and speak out. Where were you on the evening of the 23rd of May last? L.C.J. Why, what does such a boy as this know of days? Can you mark the day, boy? William. Yes, my lord. It was the day before our feast, and I was to spend sixpence there, and that falls a month before Midsummer Day. One of the jury. My lord, we cannot hear what he says. L.C.J. He says he remembers the day because it was the day before the feast they had there, and he had sixpence to lay out. Set him up on the table there. Well, child, and where wast thou then? William. Keeping cows on the moor, my lord. But the boy using the country speech, my lord could not well apprehend him, and so asked if there was any one that could interpret him and it was answered the parson of the parish was there, and he was accordingly sworn, and so the evidence given. The boy said, I was on the moor about six o'clock, and sitting behind a bush of firs near a pond of water, and the prisoner came very cautiously, and looking about him, having something like a long pole in his hand, and stopped a good while as if he would be listening, and then began to feel in the water with the pole. And I, being very near the water, not above five yards, heard as if the pole struck up against something that made a wallowing sound, and the prisoner dropped the pole and threw himself on the ground, and rolled himself about very strangely, with his hands to his ears, and so, after a while, got up and went creeping away. Asked if he had had any communication with the prisoner. Yes. A day or two before the prisoner, hearing I was used to be on the moor, he asked me if I had seen a knife laying about, and said he would give sixpence to find it, and I said I had not seen any such thing, but I would ask about. Then he said he would give me sixpence to say nothing, and so he did. L.C.J. And was that the sixpence you were to lay out at the feast? William. Yes, if you please, my lord. Asked if he had observed anything particular as to the pond of water, he said, No, except that it begun to have a very ill smell, and the cows would not drink of it for some days before. Asked if he had ever seen the prisoner and Anne Clark in company together, he began to cry very much, and it was a long time before they could get him to speak intelligibly. At last the parson of the parish, Mr. Matthews, got him to be quiet, and the question being put to him again, he said he had seen Anne Clark waiting on the moor for the prisoner at some way off several times since last Christmas. Attorney, did you see her close, so as to be sure it was she? William. Yes, quite sure. L.C.J. How quite sure, child? William. Because she would stand up and jump up and down and clap her arms like a goose. Which he called by some country name, but the parson explained it to be a goose. And then she was of such a shape that it could not be no one else. Attorney, what was the last time that you so saw her? Then the witness began to cry again, and clung very much to Mr. Matthews, who bid him not be frightened. And so at last he told his story that on the day before their feast, being the same evening that he had before spoken of, after the prisoner had gone away, it being then twilight, and he very desirous to get home, but afraid for the present to stir from where he was, lest the prisoner should see him, remained some few minutes behind the bush, looking on the pond, and saw something dark come up out of the water at the edge of the pond farthest away from him, and so up the bank, and when it got to the top where he could see it plain against the sky, it stood up and flapped the arms up and down, and then ran off very swiftly in the same direction the prisoner had taken, and being asked very strictly who he took it to be, he said upon his oath, 
that it could be nobody but Anne Clark. Thereafter his master was called and gave evidence that the boy had come home very late that evening, and been chided for it, and that he seemed very much amazed, but could give no account of the reason. Attorney. My lord, we have done with our evidence for the king. Then the Lord Chief Justice called upon the prisoner to make his defence, which he did, though at no great length, and in a very halting way, saying that he hoped the jury would not go about to take his life on the evidence of a parcel of country people and children that would believe any idle tale, and that he had been very much prejudiced in his trial, at which the L.C.J. interrupted him, saying that he had had singular favour shown to him in having his trial removed from Exeter, which the prisoner, acknowledging, said that he meant rather that since he was brought to London there had not been care taken to keep him secured from interruption and disturbance, upon which the L.C.J. ordered the marshal to be called, and questioned him about the safe keeping of the prisoner, but could find nothing except the marshal said that he had been informed by the underkeeper that they had seen a person outside his door or going up the stairs to it but there was no possibility the person should have got in and it being inquired further what sort of person this might be the marshal could not speak to it save by hearsay which was not allowed and the prisoner, being asked if this was what he meant, said no. He knew nothing of that, but it was very hard that a man should not be suffered to be at quiet when his life stood on it, but it was observed he was very hasty in his denial, and so he said no more and called no witnesses, whereupon the Attorney-General spoke to the jury. A full report of what he said is given, and, if time allowed, I would extract that portion in which he dwells on the alleged appearance of the murdered person. He quotes some authorities of ancient date, such as St. Augustine, De Cura Pro Mortius Gerenda, a favourite book of reference with the old writers on the supernatural and also cites some cases which may be seen in Glanville's, but more conveniently in Mr. Lang's books. He does not, however, tell us more of those cases than is to be found in print. The Lord Chief Justice then summed up the evidence for the jury. His speech again contains nothing that I find worth copying out, but he was naturally impressed with the singular character of the evidence saying that he had never heard such given in his experience, but that there was nothing in law to set it aside, and that the jury must consider whether they believed these witnesses or not. And the jury, after a very short consultation, brought the prisoner in guilty. So he was asked whether he had anything to say in arrest of judgment, and pleaded that his name was spelt wrong in the indictment, being Martin with an I, whereas it should be with a Y. But this was overruled as not material, Mr. Attorney saying, moreover, that he could bring evidence to show that the prisoner by times wrote it as it was laid in the indictment, and the prisoner having nothing further to offer, sentence of death was passed upon him, and that he should be hanged in chains upon a gibbet near the place where the fact was committed, and that execution should take place upon the 28th of December next ensuing, being Innocence Day. Thereafter the prisoner being to all appearance in a state of desperation, made shift to ask the L.C.J. that his relations might be allowed to come to him during the short time he had to live. L.C.J. Aye, with all my heart, so it be in the presence of the keeper, and Anne Clark may come to you as well, for what I care. At which the prisoner broke out and cried to his lordship not to use such words to him 
and his lordship, very angrily, told him he deserved no tenderness at any man's hands for a cowardly butcherly murderer that had not the stomach to take the reward of his deeds. "'And I hope to God,' said he, "'that she will be with you, by day and by night, till an end is made of you.' Then the prisoner was removed, and so far as I saw he was in a swoon, and the court broke up. I cannot refrain from observing that the prisoner during all the time of the trial seemed to be more uneasy than is commonly the case even in capital causes, that, for example, he was looking narrowly among the people, and often turning round very sharply, as if some person might be at his ear. It was also very noticeable at this trial what a silence the people kept, and further, though this might not be otherwise than natural in that season of the year, what a darkness and obscurity there was in the courtroom, lights being brought in not long after two o'clock in the day, and yet no fog in the town. It was not without interest that I heard lately from some young men who had been giving a concert in the village I speak of, that a very cold reception was accorded to the song which has been mentioned in this narrative, Madam, Will You Walk? It came out in some talk they had next morning with some of the local people, that the song was regarded with an invincible repugnance. It was not so, they believed, at North Torton but here it was reckoned to be unlucky. However, why that view was taken, no one had the shadow of an idea. The End of Martin's Close by M. R. James Recording by Andy Sames Death and the Woman by Gertrude Atherton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by A. C. Bogus. Death and the Woman by Gertrude Atherton. Her husband was dying, and she was alone with him. Nothing could exceed the desolation of her surroundings. She and the man who was going from her were in the third floor back of a New York boarding house. It was summer, and the other boarders were in the country. All the servants except the cook had been dismissed, and she, when not working, slept profoundly on the fifth floor. The landlady also was out of town on a brief holiday. The window was open to admit the thick, unstirring air. No sound rose from the row of long, narrow yards, nor from the tall, deep houses annexed. The latter deadened the rattle of the streets. At intervals, the distant elevated lumbered protestingly along, its grunts and screams muffled by the hot, suspended ocean. She sat there plunged in the profoundest grief that can come to the human soul. For in all other agony, hope flickers, however forlornly. She gazed dully at the unconscious breathing form of the man who had been friend and companion and lover during five years of youth too vigorous and hopeful to be warped by uneven fortune. It was wasted by disease. The face was shrunken, the night garment hung loosely about a body which had never been disfigured by flesh, but had been muscular with exercise and full-bodied with health. She was glad that the body was changed, glad that its beauty, too, had gone some other where than into the coffin. She had loved his hands as apart from himself, loved their strong, warm magnetism. They lay limp and yellow on the quilt. She knew that they were already cold and that moisture was gathering on them. For a moment, something convulsed within her. They had gone, too. She repeated the words twice, and after them, forever. And the while, the sweetness of their pressure came back to her. She leaned suddenly over him. He was in there still, somewhere. Where? If he had not ceased to breathe, the ego, the soul, the personality was still in the sodden clay which had shaped to give it speech. Why could it not manifest itself to her? Was it still conscious in there, unable to project itself through the disintegrating matter, which was the only medium its creator had vouchsafed it? 
reflected its struggle there, seeing her agony, sharing it, longing for the complete disintegration which should put an end to its torment? She called his name. She even shook him slightly, mad to tear the body apart and find her mate, yet even in that tortured moment realizing that violence would hasten his going. The dying man took no notice of her, and she opened his gown and put her cheek to his heart, calling him again. There had never been more perfect union, how could the bond be so strong if he were not at the other end of it? He was there, her other part. Until dead, he must be living. There was no immediate state. Why should he be as entombed and unresponding as if the screws were in the lid? But the faintly beating heart did not quicken beneath her lips. She extended her arms suddenly, describing eccentric lines above, about him, rapidly open and closing her hands as if to clutch some escaping object, then sprang to her feet and went to the window. She feared insanity. She had asked to be left alone with her dying husband, and she did not wish to lose her reason and shriek a crowd of people about her. The green plots in the yard were not apparent, she noticed. Something heavy like a pall rested upon them. She understood that the day was over and the night was coming. She returned swiftly to the bedside, wondering if she had remained away hours or seconds, and if he were dead. His face was still discernible, and death had not relaxed it. She laid her own against it then withdrew it with a shuddering flesh, her teeth smiting each other as if an icy wind had passed. She let herself fall back in the chair, clasping her hands against her heart, watching with expanding eyes the white sculptured face which, in the glittering dark, was becoming less defined of outline. Did she light the gas, it would draw mosquitoes, and she could not shut from him the little air he was mechanically grateful for, and she did not want to see the opening eye, the falling jaw. Her vision became so fixed that at length she saw nothing and closed her eyes and waited for the moisture to rise and relieve the strain. When she opened them, his face had disappeared. The humid waves above the housetops put out even the light of the stars, and night was come. Fearfully, she approached her ear to his lips. He still breathed. She made a motion to kiss him, then threw herself back in a quiver of agony. They were not the lips she had known, and she would have nothing less. His breathing was so faint that in her half-reclining position she could not hear it, could not be aware of the moment of his death. She extended her arm resolutely and laid her hand on his heart. Not only must she feel his going, but so strong had been the comradeship between them, it was a matter of loving honor to stand by him to the last. She sat there in the hot, heavy night, pressing her hand hard against the ebbing heart of the unseen and awaited death. Suddenly an odd fancy possessed her. Where was death? Why was he tarrying? Who was detaining him? From what quarter would he come? He was taking his leisure, drawing near with footsteps as measured as those of men keeping time to a funeral march. By a wayward deflection, she thought of the slow music that was always turned on in the theater when the heroine was about to appear or something uneventful to happen. She had always thought this sort of thing ridiculous and inartistic. So had he. She drew her brows together angrily, wondering at her levity, and pressed her relaxed palm against the heart it kept guard over. For a moment the sweat stood on her face, then the pent-up breath burst from her lungs. He still lived. Once more the fancy wantoned above the stunned heart. Death, where was he? What a curious experience, to be sitting alone in a big house. She knew that the cook had stolen out, waiting for death to come and snatch her husband from her. No! He would not snatch, he would steal upon his prey, as noiselessly as the approach of sin to innocence, an invisible, unfair, sneaking enemy with whom no man's strength could grapple. If he would only come like a man and take his chances like a man, women had been known to reach the hearts of giants with the dagger's point, but he would creep upon her. She gave an exclamation of horror. Something was creeping over the windowsill. Her limbs palsied, but she struggled to her feet and looked back, her eyes dragged about against her own volition. Two small green stars glared menacingly at her just above the sill. Then the cat possessing them leaped downward and the stars disappeared. She realized she was horribly frightened. Is this possible? She thought. Am I afraid of death and of death that has not yet come? I have always been a rather brave woman. He used to call me heroic. But then with him it was impossible to fear anything. And I begged them to leave me alone with him as the last of earthly booms. Oh, shame! But she was still quaking as she resumed her seat and laid her hand again on his heart. She wished that she had asked Mary to sit outside the door. There was no bell in the room. To call would be worse than desecrating the house of God, and she would not leave him for one moment to return and find him dead, gone, alone. Her knees smote each other. 
It was idle to deny it. She was in a state of unreasoning terror. Her eyes rolled apprehensively about. She wondered if she should see it when it came, wondered how far off it was now, not very far. The heart was barely pulsing. She had heard of the power of the corpse to drive brave men to frenzy, and had wondered, having no morbid horror of the dead. But this, to wait and wait and wait, perhaps for hours past the midnight, on to the small hours, while that awful, determined, leisurely something stole nearer and nearer. She bent to him who had been her protector with a spasm of anger. Where was the indomitable spirit that had held her all these years with such strong and loving clasp? How could he leave her? How could he desert her? Her head fell back and moved restlessly against the cushion. Moaning with the agony of loss, she recalled him as he had been. Then fear once more took possession of her. She sat erect, rigid, breathless, awaiting the approach of death. Suddenly, far down in the house on the first floor, her strained hearing took note of a sound, a wary, muffled sound, as if someone were creeping up the stair, fearful of being heard. Slowly, it seemed to count a hundred between laying down each foot. She gave a hysterical gasp. Where was the slow music? Her face, her body were wet, as if a wave of death sweat had broken over them. There was a stiff feeling at the roots of her hair. She wondered if it was really standing erect but she could not raise her hand to ascertain. Possibly it was only the coloring matter freezing and bleaching. Her muscles were flabby, her nerves twitched helplessly. She knew that it was death who was coming for her through the silent, deserted house, knew that it was the sensitive ear of her intelligence that heard him, not the dull, coarse-grained ear of the body. He toiled up the stair painfully, as if he were old and tired with much work. But how could he afford to loiter with all the work he had to do? Every minute, every second, he must be in demand to hook his cold, hard finger about a soul struggling to escape from its putrefying tenement. But probably he had his emissaries, his minions, for only those worthy of the honor did he come in person. He reached the first landing and crept like a cat down the hall to the next stair, then crawled slowly up as before. Light as the footfalls were, they were squarely planted, unfaltering, slow. They never halted. Mechanically, she pressed her jerking hand closer against the heart. Its beats were almost done. They would finish, she calculated, just as those footfalls paused beside the bed. She was no longer a human being. She was an intelligence and an ear. Not a sound came from without. Even the elevated appeared to be temporarily off-duty. But inside the big, quiet house, that footfall was waxing louder, louder, until iron feet crashed on iron stairs and echo thundered. She had counted the steps, one, two, three, irritated beyond endurance at the long, deliberate pauses between. As they climbed and clanged with slow precision, she continued to count, audibly and with equal precision, noting their hollow reverberation. How many steps had the stair? She wished she knew. No need. The colossal trampling announced the lessening distance in an increasing volume of sound not to be misunderstood. It turned the curve, it reached the landing, it advanced slowly down the hall, it paused before her door. Then knuckles of iron shook the frail panels, her nerveless tongue gave no invitation. The knocking became more imperious, the very walls vibrated, the handle turned swiftly and firmly, with wild instinctive movement, she flung herself into the arms of her husband. When Mary opened the door and entered the room, she found a dead woman lying across a dead man. The End of Death and the Woman Waxworks, a mystery by W. L. George. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Waxworks, a mystery by W. L. George. Henry Badger rapidly paced the city churchyard. His air of anxiety seemed to overweigh his small, though not unpleasing, features. He was an insignificant little man, dressed in pepper and salt tweeds. His hair was cut very close, except where a lovelock, plastered down with jasmine oil, trailed over his forehead from under his hard black hat. Whenever he completed the circuit of the churchyard, he peered towards the gate through which must come disturbance and romance. Henry Badger was in love, and he could not escape the consequences of his share in our common delight and affliction. Suddenly, brightness overspread his sharp features. 
it was she she in a pink crepe de chine blouse disconnected rather than connected with her white serge skirt by a patent leather belt above the pink blouse was an equally pink neck and a rather pretty face all soft curves she was bright blue of eye and tumbled in pleasant fairness about the hair under a large straw hat from which drooped on one side a fragment of ivy that might with advantage have been placed elsewhere but her name was ivy and she liked to live in harmony i'm late she said with pretty briskness as they shook hands so sorry henry only the boss got dictating and he likes to hear himself talk even if it is only to little me still better late than never she added with a smile indicating wit henry badger replied yes and wondered if it would be good policy to attack her for being late since he felt at fault no doubt it would only an argument with ivy one never knew what that would lead to well you dummy she said is that all you've got to say got the tickets er uh, said henry badger no what do you mean said ivy crossly what i say replied henry badger with feeble determination fact is ivy i'm sorry but i forgot the blue eyes stared at him incredulous forgot what you been and done that for henry badger explained profusely the night before he'd had an awful headache and it had slipped his memory to go round to the imperial music hall and this morning the manager ivy trampled upon these confused excuses all i can see she said is here we are landed on a saturday afternoon with nowhere to go except the pictures and it's so hot in those places last time i was fair melted i do think it's too bad of you it was then that henry badger expressed himself fact is ivy i been thinking hope you didn't break anything said ivy but since you've done it what's the idea i been thinking that we don't know the town we live in i was reading a book the other day strange sights of london it was called and would you believe it ivy there's lots of things i got to learn ah i do believe it said ivy for instance said henry did you know that the church of st ethelburga wasn't burnt down in the fire of london no said ivy and now i do know it i don't seem to be much better off ah said henry that's where you're wrong ivy it improves your mind to know that sort of thing and that's how i got my idea i've been thinking we might go round to the docks what for oh i don't know just to mooch round ever been to the docks no well why not try em you know ivy people spend a lot of money going to the riviera and they never see the place round the corner see your own country first he added with originality well said ivy after a moment seeing you've mucked up this afternoon and mother's gone out and there won't be any tea i suppose we may as well the two little people for neither of them was quite five foot six made their way along the east india dock road where an omnibus had deposited them for an hour they wandered the tragic land where none live for pleasure and where slowly the soot falls to obliterate sooty footmarks they were too tired to be pleased when behind a long brick wall they found the docks they perceived the smell of the east oil of macassar piled logs of sandalwood barrels of copra at a point against the sky where now the dark clouds were racing they saw outlined tall spars while a funnel striped in yellow and blue threw out a shower of sparks against the sky like a dun veil touched with tinsel the heat seemed to grow they lost their direction not liking to ask their way of the rough inhabitants not knowing where they wanted to go they were astray unprotected lambs in a land of slender law ivy began to drag her feet as loudly as she could to show that she was displeased 
both were secretly oppressed because that day they had not kissed at that moment came rain very slowly at first in separate warm drops that made upon the pavement spots as large as a coin my said henry it's going to come down like bilio i don't care said ivy come on said henry let's see if we can get under shelter somewhere but they were still progressing along another brick wall opposite the warehouses were closed they ran for now the rain was beginning to fall with greater determination here gasped henry as he ran we must get in somewhere you'll be sopped through let's go into a shop they stopped irresolutely at the corner of a side street as it was almost entirely occupied by warehouses no living creature could be seen but just as they prepared to run on through the rain henry observed a tottering post bearing a battered sign the sign was in the shape of a hand pointing up the lane and upon it were painted the words to the waxworks here he cried dragging ivy along that'll do i didn't know they had waxworks in this part of the world but it'll save us getting wet they ran up the street expecting a veranda and a commissionaire at the end of the lane they had found nothing and paused irresolute when upon the door of a three-floored house ivy saw the word waxworks with the addition mrs grooby proprietress henry seized the door handle which resisted for a moment the door jammed but with a great effort he forced it open it made a great clatter as he flung it against the wall breathless and wiping their wet faces the two stood giggling in the hall then feeling alone suddenly they kissed the excitement of the run and of the caress sheltered them against an impression which the place imposed upon them only by degrees they were in the hall of a house of a house like any other house there was no noise except for a slight sound it felt deserted the door handle on the right was covered with dust nobody had gone into that room for a long time an unaccountable emotion developed in them the house was still except that at last they identified the slight sound far away a tap was leaking they found themselves listening to the drip which came regularly from the basement well said henry with forced cheerfulness here we are and as if to reassure himself anyhow we shan't get wet they stood for a moment looking out at the rain which now came faster the effect of this falling water soft and hot the dusty silence of the place except for that regular drip far away combined to cast upon them a sort of uneasiness an almost physical oppression ivy began to look about her with unexplainable anxiety the darkness of the stairs the banisters broken in several places the dusty door handle stirred in her a vague fear she looked about her like a cat in a strange place and preparing to flee as the feeling communicated itself to henry his manliness revolted it would be too silly to have the jumps so he said i've since we're here why not go upstairs and see the show after a moment's hesitation ivy dominated her disturbance and said all right they went up the stairs firmly but with instinctive slowness troubled by the sound of their feet upon the boards followed by the fainter drip of the distant tap the first floor was like the ground floor here too the door handles were dusty and here too there came no sound from beyond the doors they had to make an effort to go up further the sense that here was emptiness made emptiness frightful but henry was leading and still went up he didn't know why but knew he must go up perhaps because he was a man and couldn't run away from anything not even from nothing the second floor comforted them for here was a pay box empty it is true but marked pay here henry released a great sigh it really was a show it had a human air come on ivy he said in a loud voice which rang unpleasantly down the uncarpeted stairs since there's nobody down here we can pay when we get to the top 
ivy silently followed him up and so they reached what seemed to be a large attic once again a reluctant door yielded to their hands and henry stepped into the doorway with a sort of jauntiness but ivy paused for a moment at his back waxworks yes but she didn't know why at once she was terrified one couldn't see very well in the attic for the dust of years lay upon the skylight and the avaricious light of the sullen sky hardly penetrated the walls had been whitewashed but now were stained black with damp soiled by the touch of hands the smoke of lamps about the door hung rags of dirty red damask and in the immense silence of the place hearing not even the drip of the distant tap they found themselves alone with the wax figures some stood upon little thrones of red painted wood here a man in day clothes staring emptily from a yellow countenance here a woman spreading crimson nostrils to an absent scent the two were still in the doorway not knowing why they did not go in they were conscious of a secret vileness in these faces the things stood so still but sure of themselves as if they had always stood in the dust and twilight but at last henry seized ivy's arm more firmly and they went in altogether there were fourteen figures three of the men were labelled charles pierce dr crippin and gouffe the woman with the intense gaze was mrs maybrick and there were two other women one with bright red hair over which a spider had built its web but henry and ivy as they stood before them did not at once read the legends telling how crippin had killed his wife and burnt her body in the furnace nor did they gaze at gouffe the bailiff who had been carved into pieces and packed in a trunk a little later ivy read that ticket to the end and shudderingly stepped away from the invitation to draw apart the figure's clothing and see indicated the lines along which the body had been cut up at that moment she was cowering against henry who instinctively had laid an arm about her shoulders for the single figures were less terrifying than two groups represented in action one of the groups comprised a man and a woman in a pink flannelette dressing gown with an expression of pinched determination the murderer was forcing the female figure down into a bath where a sheet of mica tinted green represented water in the grasp of a bony hand the female figure held the edge of the bath wildly raising the other arm while into her distorted mouth floated the green edge of the water that was to drown her it was a work of art of indescribable horror it was as if the snake-like fingers moved as if in another moment the head would disappear under that still green surface with an exclamation henry turned aside to the other group that stood dim within the shadow away from the faint rays that fell through the skylight this represented a very old woman lying on her face her white hair scattered and stained with blood while kneeling over her a sandbag still half raised was a short man in the clothes of the day his face set and coated with a horrible scarlet flush now a new sound made them start it was the growing rain pattering upon the skylight as if goblins raced across it in a sudden desire for union again they kissed quickly falling apart as if espied they turned away for a moment fascinated they did not know how in this gallery of crime the still things about them seemed to have a motion a vibration of their own they found themselves looking sharply into corners as if something were there after all as if these were not creatures of wax but actually poisoners men and women experienced in violence and still capable of evil the great horror which always drew them back to itself was that bath soiled chipped and streaked with black rivulets of dirt into which the murderer was endlessly pressing down the figure that endlessly strove for life so great was the tension that henry tried to rejoin the ordinary world he whispered we ought to have paid someone but while he spoke he looked from side to side as if begging some material custodian to appear with a familiar ticket and a sounding punch ivy did not reply she was holding his arm in a nervous clutch once or twice she moved away from him and then came back 
as if her fingers grasped him independently of the processes of her brain she was opening and closing her mouth striving to speak and finding her tongue dry only at last did she find a whisper i don't like it let's go henry badger also wanted to go but he was so unaccountably afraid that he dared not go his virility spoke it told him that if he went now he would be everlastingly ashamed he was afraid to tell himself that he was afraid so in a voice the loudness of which half startled him he replied oh rot since we've come up we may as well see the lot of them so ivy still grasping his arm they circled the attic stopping in turn before each figure ivy did not want to see but she could not look away it was as if she must meet material human eyes it was always the eyes she looked at there was a challenge in them it was the defiance of the dead which she must meet she must again view the bath look down through the green surface of the water upon the agonized limbs which twisted in the dimness that was to be their grave but now there was a change perhaps because habit made that first seem less awful the second group gained in horror it was not only the sight of the blood coagulated on the white hair it was something else something unnameable the art of the sculptor had gone too far here was mere and abominable reality real hair and crouching above with drooping eyelids the figure of the murderer ill-shaven and flushed with health something twisted in ivy's body as she thought that upon the still mask she could discern beads of sweat they stayed staring half conscious that they had been here a long time though little more than a minute had passed the beating of their hearts deafened them and combined with the hissing sound of the rain as if thin ghosts shod in cloud were racing across the skylight her eyes still fixed upon the creature with the sandbag ivy whispered again let's go then in the far distance they heard the front door slam at that sound a confused terror seized them both the contrast between incoming humanity and the unearthly silence here affected them like a blow heat and weakness rushed up their limbs and in ivy's ears was a sound like the distant unwinding of an endless chain henry was the first to recover a compound emotion formed in him the proprietress of course he wanted to get out they really ought to pay he'd better see this summarized itself in an inarticulate sound turning he ran to the landing and looked down the stairs he did not know what he expected to see but something and after a few seconds as he heard nothing such a weakness overcame him that he let himself go against the balustrade his head hanging down over the well of the stairs where all was silence and darkness but almost at once he recovered for suddenly behind him there came a long cry a cry with a strange torn quality like that of a beast in pain that jerked him to his feet as it dragged from his paws a sheet of cold sweat as he turned ivy came tumbling out of the attic her arms outstretched before her as if she fumbled for her way she could not see for her eyes were so retroverted that only the white showed under the falling lids he caught her just as she was going to throw herself down the stairs as he touched her she flung her arms about his neck with maniacal strength and he could not free himself from that grasp as they stumbled together down the stairs he thought that it was like being held by bones they fell together at the foot of the second landing somehow struggled to their feet there was a moment of incredible effort before they could pull open the outer door which had been closed by the wind they halted for an instant upon the steps close locked under the falling hot rain and henry did not understand what drove him then what strange relief or exultation what insane excitement made him press his mouth to the lips drawn tightly into pallid lines at the kiss ivy's nerves suddenly relaxed she became a bundle in his arms something he dragged along staggering as he fled he knew not from what they shared but one idea to get away the pavement streamed before them as they ran with downcast eyes 
then with a shock they were stopped by two policemen in oilskins with whom they nearly collided at the junction of the lane and the main road the policemen stared at these two instinctively holding them by the arm not understanding that they were at the limit of terror and already suspecting that they had committed some crime indeed henry and ivy were struggling in their grasp still dominated by their one desire to get away at last when they grew quiet and stood breathing hard their mouths relaxed by nervous exhaustion the elder policeman who was a sergeant said now then what's all this i don't know said henry come on said the sergeant you don't put me off like that what you been up to you two henry did not reply mark you it'll be all the worse for you if you don't talk what's happened he shook his prisoner suggesting that he'd make him talk yet but failing to draw a reply he turned to the girl you why were you running ivy seemed to have recovered more quickly than her companion though her eyelids did not cease to twitch she managed to say i saw something saw something said the sergeant saw what oh i couldn't said ivy i expect they're drunk said the constable no said the sergeant meditatively i can't smell it on em oh no cried ivy no of course not only it's the waxworks the waxworks waxworks said the sergeant what waxworks i know sergeant said the constable nodding up the lane mrs grooby's place oh yes said the sergeant i know now sort of chamber of horrors well you been to the waxworks what about it i saw something whispered ivy saw what said the constable saw mrs grooby i suppose funny old dame sergeant she's been living in that house all by herself for the last forty years alone with them things used to make a lot of money out of them and they say she's got a lot saved up between you and me and the lamp-post i'm surprised no one's knocked her on the head yet and walked off with her money ivy gave a low cry yes that's it there's a man in there he's killed her blood all over her head what's all this asked the sergeant professionally incredulous what's all this story and how do you know anything about it there was a noise said ivy the door slammed henry ran out i couldn't move for a moment she was on the floor and the man her voice became shrill as i turned to look after henry i just he raised his arm and rubbed it just with the corner of my eye i she gave a heavy sigh and her head fell back upon the policeman's chest but she had not fainted and in a moment the policemen were striding up the lane followed by henry and ivy who clung to the companionship of these tall loud-speaking men as they went the sergeant theorized i see the dodge he did the old woman in then he heard this pair come up the stairs and rigged himself up as a wax figure got cramp i suppose and took the chance to rub his arm when he thought she wasn't looking cheer up missy he added to ivy who was crying out of weakness we'll soon get him as they reached the door of the museum he winked at her and drew his truncheon better stay downstairs missy he added as he led the way up but after a moment ivy and henry could not bear their loneliness and tiptoed up the stairs behind the blue shapes that walked with such assurance making no attempt to muffle their tread when they reached the attic the policeman looked in a puzzled way into the twilight which one is it said the policeman and instinctively his voice fell to a whisper ivy who was just behind him pointed at the kneeling shape carrying the sandbag that one she said the sergeant did not understand his own feeling but he received some dim impression from the grey place he walked only three feet into the room then in an uneasy voice he addressed the kneeling figure now then my man the game's up you better go quietly there was no reply and the echoes died away repeating a quivering uncertainty in the policeman's voice after a moment's pause the sergeant 
irritated by the silence strode into the room raising his truncheon he went up to the kneeling figure and touched it on the shoulder he drew back his hand touched the body again then suddenly he burst into a roar of laughter as with a derisive gesture he passed his hand up and down over the waxen face wax he cried bert have you ever seen such a pair of gabbies as these two been here and got the horrors the two of them and ran out like a pair of loonies to tell us this dummy is jack the ripper posing for the russian ballet oh my wax whispered ivy oh no oh please don't touch it it's not wax no it's not come on said the sergeant kindly touch it yourself oh i couldn't said ivy quivering but with a laugh the policeman seized her wrist and drawing her towards the figure forced her to lay her hand upon the waxen coldness of the cheek wax said the policeman you silly kid that's only wax and so's this wax he added as he bent down and negligently laid his hand upon the blood-stained white hair but in the same movement almost the policeman jumped up and recoiled his staring eyes glaring at his hand for less than a second did he gaze at it then with a cry as if seized by ungovernable hysteria he brought down his truncheon upon the head of the kneeling man which under the blow scattered into tiny fragments of tinted wax then the other policeman drew back as he saw his comrade's hand stained with fresh blood a waxwork he gasped what how it isn't a waxwork it's mrs grueby he laid a single finger on the woman's head stared at his own blood-stained hand dead still warm his voice rose high killed by what in the silence far below could be heard the thin drip of the leaky tap end of waxworks a mystery by w l george the lost ghost by mary wilkins this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the lost ghost by mary wilkins mrs john emerson sitting with her needlework beside the window looked out and saw mrs rhoda meserve coming down the street and knew at once by the trend of her steps and the cant of her head that she meditated turning in at her gate she also knew by a certain something about her general carriage a thrusting forward of the neck a bustling hitch of the shoulders that she had important news rhoda meserve always had the news as soon as the news was in being and generally mrs john emerson was the first to whom she imparted it the two women had been friends ever since mrs meserve had married simon meserve and come to the village to live mrs meserve was a pretty woman moving with graceful flirts of ruffling skirts her clear-cut nervous face a delicately tinted as a shell looked bright from the plumy brim of a black hat as mrs emerson through the window mrs emerson was glad to see her coming she returned the greeting with enthusiasm then rose hurriedly ran into the cold parlour and brought out one of the best rocking chairs she was just in time after drawing it up beside the opposite window to greet her friend at the door good afternoon said she i declare i'm real glad to see you i've been alone all day john went to the city this morning i thought of coming over to your house this afternoon but i couldn't bring my sewing very well i'm putting the ruffles on my new black dress skirt well i didn't have a thing on hand except my crochet work responded mrs meserve and i thought i'd just run over a few minutes i'm real glad you did repeated miss emerson take your things right off here i'll put them on my bed in the bedroom take the rocking chair mrs meserve settled herself in the parlour rocking chair while mrs emerson carried her shawl and hat into the little adjoining bedroom when she returned, Mrs. Meserve was rocking peacefully and was already at work hooking the blue wool in and out. "'That's real pretty,' said Miss Emerson. "'Yes, I think it's pretty,' replied Mrs. Meserve. "'I suppose it's for the church fair.' "'Yes, I don't suppose it'll bring enough pay for the worsted, let alone the work, but I suppose I've got to make something.' 
How much did that one you made for the fair last year bring? Twenty-five cents. It's wicked, ain't it? I rather guess it is. It takes me a week every minute I can get to make one. I wish those that bought such things for twenty-five cents had to make them. Guess they'd sing another song. Well, I suppose I oughtn't complain as long as it is for the Lord, but sometimes it does seem as if the Lord doesn't get much out of it. Well, it's pretty work, said Mrs. Emerson, sitting down at the opposite window and taking up her dress skirt. Yes, it is real pretty work. I just love crochet. The two women rocked and sewed and crocheted in silence for two or three minutes. They were both waiting. Mrs. Meserve waited for the other's curiosity to develop in order that her news might have, as it were, a befitting stage entrance. Mrs. Emerson waited for the news. Finally, she could wait no longer. Well, what's the news? said she. Well, I don't know as there's anything very particular, hedged the other woman, prolonging the situation. Yes, there is. You can't cheat me, replied Mrs. Emerson. Now, how do you know? By the way you look. Mrs. Meserve laughed consciously and rather vainly. Well, Simon says my face is so expressive I can't hide anything more than five minutes, no matter how hard I try, said she. Well, there is some news. Simon came home with it this noon. He heard it in South Dayton. He had some business over there this morning. The old sergeant places let. Mrs. Emerson dropped her sewing and stared. You don't say so. Yes, it is. Who to? Why, some folks from Boston that moved to South Dayton last year. They haven't been satisfied with the house they had there. It wasn't large enough. The man has got considerable property and can afford to live pretty well. He's got a wife and his unmarried sister in the family. The sister's got money too. He does business in Boston and it's just as easy to get to Boston from here as from South Dayton. And so they're coming here. You know the old sergeant house is a splendid place. Yes, it's the handsomest house in town, but... Oh, Simon said they told him about that and he just laughed. Said he wasn't afraid and neither was his wife and sister. Said he'd risk ghosts rather than little tucked up sleeping rooms without any sun, like they've had in the Dayton house. Said he'd rather risk seeing ghosts than risk being ghosts themselves. Simon said they said he was a great hand to joke. Oh well, said Mrs. Emerson, it is a beautiful house, and maybe there isn't anything in those stories. It never seemed to me they came very straight anyway. I never took much stock in them. All I thought was, if his wife was nervous, nothing in creation would hire me to go into a house that had ever heard a word against of that kind, declared Mrs. Meserve with emphasis. I wouldn't go into that house if they would give me the rent. I've seen enough of haunted houses to last me as long as I live. Mrs. Emerson's face acquired the expression of a hunting hound. Have you? she asked in an intense whisper. Yes, I have. I don't want any more of it. Before you came here? Yes, before I was married, when I was quite a girl. Mrs. Meserve had not married young. Mrs. Emerson had mental calculations when she heard that. Did you really live in a house that was? She whispered fearfully. Mrs. Meserve nodded solemnly. Did you really ever see anything? Mrs. Meserve nodded. You didn't see anything that did you any harm? No, I didn't see anything that did me harm looking at it in one way. But I don't do anybody in this world any good to see things that haven't any business to be seen in it. You never get over it. There was a moment's silence. Mrs. Emerson's features seemed to sharpen. Well, of course, I don't want to urge you, said she, if you don't feel like talking about it. But maybe it might do good to tell it out, if it's on your mind, worrying you. I try to put it out of mind, said Mrs. Meserve. Well, it's just as you feel. I never told anybody but Simon, said Mrs. Meserve. I never felt as if it was wise, perhaps. I didn't know what folks might think. So many don't believe in anything they can't understand, that they might think my mind wasn't right. Simon advised me not to talk about it. He said he didn't believe in anything supernatural, but if he had to own up that he couldn't give any explanation for it to save his life, he had to own up that he didn't believe anybody could. Then he said he wouldn't talk about it. He said lots of folks would sooner tell folks my head wasn't right than to own up they couldn't see through it. I'm sure I wouldn't say so, returned Mrs. Emerson reproachfully. You know better than that, I hope. Yes, I do, replied Mrs. Meserve. I know you wouldn't say so. And I wouldn't tell it to a soul if you didn't want me to. Well, I'd rather you wouldn't. I won't speak of it even to Mr. Emerson. I'd rather you wouldn't even to him. I won't. Mrs. Emerson took up her dress skirt again. 
Mrs. Meserve hooked up another loop of blue wool. Then she began, Of course, said she, I ain't going to say positively that I believe or disbelieve in ghosts, but all I tell you is what I saw. I can't explain it. I don't pretend I can, for I can't. If you can, well and good, I shall be glad, for it will stop tormenting me as it has done and always will otherwise. There hasn't been a day nor a night since it happened that I haven't thought of it, and always I have felt the shivers go down my back when I did. That's an awful feeling, Mrs. Emerson said. Ain't it? Well, it happened before I was married, when I was a girl and lived in East Wilmington. It was the first year I lived there. You know my family all died five years before that. I told you. Mrs. Emerson nodded. Well, I went there to teach school, and I went to board with a Mrs. Amelia Dennison and her sister, Mrs. Bird. Abby, her name was, Abby Bird. She was a widow. She had never had any children. She had a little money. Mrs. Dennison didn't have any. And she had come to East Wilmington and bought the house they lived in. It was a real pretty house, though it was very old and run down. It had cost Mrs. Bird a great deal to put it in order. I guess that was the reason they took me to board. I guess they thought it would help along a little. I guess what I paid for my board about us kept in all and victuals. Mrs. Bird had enough to live on if they were careful, but she had spent so much fixing up the old house that they must have been a little pinch for a while. Anyhow, they took me to board, and I thought I was pretty lucky to get in there. I had a nice room, big and sunny and furnished pretty, the paper and paint all new, and everything as neat as wax. Mrs. Dennison was one of the best cooks I ever saw, and I had a little stove in my room, and there was always a nice fire there when I got home from school. I thought I hadn't been in such a nice place since I lost my own home, until I had been there about three weeks. I had been there about three weeks before I found it out, though I guess it had been going on at there ever since they had been in the house, and that was for most four months. They hadn't said anything about it, and I didn't wonder, for there they had just bought the house and been to so much expense and trouble fixing it up. Well, I went there in September. I began my school the first Monday. I remember it was real cold fall, and there was a frost in the middle of September, and I had to put on my winter coat. I remember when I came home that night. Let me see. I began school on a Monday, and that was two weeks from the next Thursday. I took my coat downstairs and laid it on the table in the front entry. It was a real nice coat, heavy black broadcloth trimmed with fur. I had had it the winter before. Mrs. Bird called me after as I went upstairs that I ought not to leave it in the front entry for fear somebody might come in and take it. But I only laughed and called back to her that I wasn't afraid. I never much was afraid of burglars. Well, though it was hardly the middle of September, it was a real cold night. I remember my room faced west, and the sun was getting low, and the sky was pale yellow and purple, just as you see it sometimes in the winter when there is going to be a cold snap. I rather think that was the night the frost came the first time. I know Mrs. Dennison covered up some flowers she had in the front yard anyhow. I remember looking out and seeing an old green plaid short of hers over the verbena bed. There was a fire in my little wood stove. Mrs. Bird made it, I know. She was a real motherly sort of woman. She always seemed to be the happiest when she was doing something to make other folks happy and comfortable. Mrs. Dennison told me she had always been so. She said she had coddled with her husband within an inch of his life. It's lucky Abby never had any children, she said, for she would have spoiled them. Well, that night I sat down beside my nice little fire and ate an apple. There was a plate of nice apples on my table. Mrs. Bird put them there. I was always very fond of apples. Well, I sat down and ate an apple, and was having a beautiful time, thinking how lucky I was to have got bored in such a place with such nice folks, when I heard a queer little sound at my door. It was such a little hesitating sort of sound, that it sounded more like a fumble than a lock, as if someone very timid, with very little hands, was feeling along the door, not quite daring to knock. For a minute I thought it was a mouse, but I waited, and it came again and then I made my mind that it was a knock, but a very scared little one, so I said, come in. But nobody came in, and then presently I heard the knock again. Then I got up and opened the door, thinking it was very queer, and I had a very frightened feeling without knowing why. Well, I opened the door, and the first thing I noticed was a draught of cold air, as if the front door downstairs was open, but there was a strange closed smell about the cold draught. It smelled more like a cellar that had been shut up for years than out of doors. Then I saw something. I saw my coat first. The thing that held it was so small that I couldn't see much of anything else. Then I saw a little white face with eyes so scared and wishful 
that they seemed as if they might eat a hole in anybody's heart. It was a dreadful little face, with something about it which made it different from any other face on earth, but it was so pitiful that somehow it did away a good deal with the dreadfulness, and there were two little hands spotted purple with the cold, holding up my winter coat, and a strange little faraway voice that said, I can't find my mother. For heaven's sake, I said, who are you? Then the little voice said again, I can't find my mother. All the time I could smell the cold, and I saw that it was about the child. That cold was clinging to her as if she had come out of some deadly cold place. Well, I took my coat. I did not know what else to do, and the cold was clinging to that. It was as cold as if it had come off ice. When I had the coat I could see the child more plainly. She was dressed in one little white garment made very simply. It was a nightgown, only very long, quite covering her feet, and I could see dimly through her little thin body mottled purple with the cold. Her face did not look so cold, that was a clear waxen white. Her hair was dark, but it looked as if it might only be dark because it was so damp, almost wet, and might really be light hair. It clung very close to her forehead, which was round and white. She would have been very beautiful if she had not been so dreadful. Who are you? says I again, looking at her. She looked at me with her terrible pleading eyes and did not say anything. What are you? says I. Then she went away. She did not seem to run or walk like other children. She flitted, like one of those little filmy white butterflies, that don't seem like real ones, they are so light, and move as if they had no weight. But she looked back from the head of the stairs. I can't find my mother, said she, and I never heard such a voice. Who is your mother? says I, but she was gone. Well, I thought for a moment I should faint away. The room got dark and I heard a singing in my ears. Then I flung my coat onto the bed. My hands were as cold as ice from holding it, and I stood in my door and called first Mrs. Bird and then Mrs. Dennison. I didn't dare go down over the stairs where that had gone. It seemed to me I should go mad if I didn't see somebody or something like other folks on the face of the earth. I thought I should never make anybody hear, but I could hear them stepping about downstairs, and I could smell biscuits baking for supper. Somehow the smell of those biscuits seemed the only natural thing left me to keep me in the right mind. I didn't dare go over those stairs. I just stood there and called, and finally I heard the entry door open and Mrs. Bird call back. What is it? Did you call, Mrs. Arms? Come up here. Come up here as quick as you can, both of you. I screamed out, Quick, quick, quick! I heard Mrs. Bird tell Mrs. Dennison, Come quick, Amelia. Something is the matter in Mrs. Arms' room. It struck me even then that she expressed herself rather queerly, and it struck me as very queer indeed, when they both got upstairs, and I saw that they knew what had happened, or that they knew of what nature the happening was. "'What is it, dear?' asked Mrs. Bird, and her pretty, loving voice had a strange sound. I saw her look at Mrs. Dennison, and I saw Mrs. Dennison look back at her. "'For God's sake,' says I, and I never spoke so before. "'For God's sake, what was it brought my coat upstairs?' "'What was it like?' asked Mrs. Dennison, in a sort of failing voice, and she looked at her sister again, and her sister looked back at her. "'It was a child I had never seen before. It looked like a child,' says I. "'But I never saw a child so dreadful, and it had on a nightgown, and said it couldn't find her mother. Who was it? What was it?' I thought for a minute Mrs. Dennison was going to faint, but Mrs. Bird hugged on to her and rubbed her hands, and whispered in her hair. She had the cooingest kind of voice.' and I ran and got her a glass of cold water. I tell you, it took considerable courage to go downstairs alone, but they had set a lamp on the entry table so I could see. I don't believe I could have spunked up enough to go downstairs in the dark, thinking every second that the child might be close to me. The lamp and the smell of biscuits baking seemed to sort of keep my courage up, but I tell you, I didn't waste much time going down those stairs and out into the kitchen for a glass of water. I pumped as if the house was afire, and I grabbed the first thing I came across in the shape of a tumbler. It was a painted one that Mrs. Dennison's Sunday school class gave her, and it was meant for a flower vase. Well, I filled it and then ran upstairs. I felt every minute as if something would catch my feet, and I held the glass to Mrs. Dennison's lips while Mrs. Bird held her head up, and she took a good long swallow, then looked as hard at the tumbler. Yes, says I, I know I got this one, but I took the first thing I came across, and it isn't her to mite. Don't get the painted flowers wet, said Mrs. Dennison very feebly. They'll wash off if you do. I'll be real careful, says I. I knew she set a sight by that painted tumbler. 
The water seemed to do Mrs. Dennison good, for presently she pushed Mrs. Bird away and sat up. She had been laying down on my bed. "'I'm all over it now,' says she, but she was terribly white, and her eyes looked as if they saw something outside things. Mrs. Bird wasn't much better, but she always had a sort of sweet, settled good luck that nothing could disturb to any great extent. I knew I looked dreadful, for I caught a glimpse of myself in the glass, and I would hardly have known who it was. Mrs. Dennison, she slid off the bed, and walked sort of a tottery to the chair. "'I was silly to give way so,' says she. "'No, you wasn't silly, sister,' says Mrs. Bird. "'I don't know what this means any more than you do, but whatever it is, no one ought to be called silly for being overcome by anything so different from other things which we have known all our lives.' Mrs. Dennison looked at her sister, then looked at me, then back at her sister again, and Mrs. Bird spoke as if she had been asked a question. Yes, says she, I do think Mrs. Arms ought to be told. That is, I think she ought to be told all we know ourselves. That isn't much, said Mrs. Dennison, with a dying away sort of sigh. She looked as if she might faint away again any minute. She was a real strong, delicate-looking woman, but it turned out she was a good deal stronger than poor Mrs. Bird. No, there isn't much we do know, says Mrs. Bird, but what little there is she ought to know. I felt as if she ought to know when she first came here. Well, I didn't feel quite right about it, said Mrs. Dennison, but I kept hoping it might stop, and anyway, that it might never trouble her, and you had to put so much in the house, and we needed the money, and I didn't know but she might be nervous and think she couldn't come, and I didn't want to take a man boarder. And aside from the money, we were very anxious to have you come, my dear, said Mrs. Bird. Yes, says Mrs. Dennison. We wanted the young company in the house. We were lonesome, and both of us took a great liking to you the minute we set eyes on you. And I guess they meant what they said, both of them. They were beautiful women. Nobody could be kinder to me than they were, and I never blamed them for not telling me before, and, as they said, there wasn't really much to tell. They hadn't any sooner fairly bought the house and moved into it than they began to see and hear things. Mrs. Bird said they were sitting together in the sitting room one evening when they heard it the first time. She said her sister was knitting lace. Mrs. Dennison made beautiful knitted lace, and she was reading the Missionary Herald. Mrs. Bird was very much interested in mission work, when all of a sudden they heard something. She heard it first, and she laid down her Missionary Herald and listened, and then Mrs. Dennison, she saw her listening, and she drops her lace. "'What is it you are listening to, Abby?' says she. Then it came again, and they both heard, and cold shivers went down their backs to hear it, though they didn't know why. "'It's the cat, isn't it?' says Mrs. Bird. "'It isn't any cat,' said Mrs. Dennison. "'Oh, I guess it must be the cat. Maybe she's got a mouse,' says Mrs. Bird, real cheerful to calm down Mrs. Dennison, for she saw she was most scared to death, and she was always afraid of her fainting away. Then she opens the door and calls, "'Kitty, kitty, kitty!' They had bought the cat with them in a basket when they came to East Wilmington to live. It was a real handsome tiger cat, a Tommy, and he knew a lot. Well, she called Kitty, 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 and sure enough the kitty came, and when he came in the door he gave a big yawl that didn't sound unlike what they heard. There, sister, here he is. You see it was the cat, says Mrs. Bird. Poor Kitty. But Mrs. Dennison, she eyed the cat, and she gave a great screech. What's that? What's that? says she. "'What's what?' says Mrs. Bird, pretending to herself that she didn't see what her sister meant. "'Something's got hold of that cat's tail,' said Mrs. Dennison. "'Something's got hold of its tail. It pulled straight out, and he can't get away. Just hear him yawl.' "'It isn't anything,' says Mrs. Bird. But even as she said that, she could see a little hand holding fast to that cat's tail, and then the child seemed to sort of clear out of the dimness behind the hand, and the child was sort of laughing then, instead of looking sad.' and she said that that was the great deal worse. She said that laugh was the most awful and the saddest thing she ever heard. Well, she was so dumbfounded that she didn't know what to do, and she couldn't sense at first that it was anything supernatural. She thought it must be one of the neighbours' children who had run away, was making free of their house, and was teasing their cat, and that they must be just nervous to feel so upset by it. So she speaks up sort of sharp. Don't you know that you mustn't pull the kitty's tail, says she? Don't you know you hurt the poor kitty, and she'll scratch you if you don't take care? Poor kitty, you mustn't hurt her. And with that she said the child stopped pulling the cat's tail, and went to stroking her just as soft and pitiful, and the cat put its back up and rubbed and purred as if he liked it. The cat never seemed a mite afraid, 
and that seemed queer, for I had always heard that animals were dreadfully afraid of ghosts, but then that was a pretty harmless little sort of ghost. Well, Mrs. Bird said the child stroked the cat, while she and Mrs. Dennison stood watching it, and holding on to each other, for, no matter how hard they tried to think it was all right, it didn't look right. Finally, Mrs. Dennison, she spoke. "'What's your name, little girl?' says she. Then the child looks up, and stops stroking the cat, and says she can't find her mother, just the way she said it to me. Then Mrs. Dennison, she gave such a gasp that Mrs. Bird thought she was going to faint away, but she didn't. "'Well, who is your mother?' says she. But the child just says again, "'I can't find my mother. I can't find my mother.' "'Where do you live, dear?' says Mrs. Bird. "'I can't find my mother,' says the child. "'Well, that was the way it was. Nothing happened. "'Those two women stood there hanging on to each other, "'and the child stood in front of them, and they asked her questions, "'and everything she would say was, "'I can't find my mother.' "'Then Mrs. Bird tried to catch hold of the child, "'for she thought, in spite of what she saw, "'that perhaps she was nervous, and it was a real child, "'only perhaps not quite right in its head.' that had run away in her little nightgown after she had been put to bed. She tried to catch the child. She had an idea of putting a shawl around it and going out. She was such a little thing she could have carried her easy enough, and trying to find out to which of the neighbours she belonged. But the minute she moved toward the child, there wasn't any child there. There was only that little voice seeming to come from nothing, saying, I can't find my mother, and presently that died away. Well, the same thing kept happening, or something very much the same. Once in a while, Mrs. Bird would be washing dishes, and all at once the child would be standing beside her with the dish towel wiping them. Of course, that was terrible. Mrs. Bird would wash the dishes all over. Sometimes she didn't tell Mrs. Dennison, it made her so nervous. Sometimes, when they were making cake, they would find raisins all picked over, and sometimes little sticks of kindling wood would be found laying beside the kitchen stove. They never knew when they would come across that child, and always she kept saying over and over, that she couldn't find her mother. They never tried talking to her, except once in a while Mrs. Bird would get desperate and ask her something, but the child never seemed to hear it. She always kept right on saying that she couldn't find her mother. After they had told me all they had to tell about their experience with the child, they told me about the house and the people that had lived there before they did. It seemed something dreadful had happened in that house, and the land agent had never let on to them. I don't think they would have bought it if he had, no matter how cheap it was. For even if folks aren't really afraid of anything, they don't want to live in houses where such dreadful things have happened that you keep thinking about them. I know after they told me I should never have stayed there another night, if I hadn't thought so much of them, no matter how comfortable I was made, and I never was nervous either. But I stayed. Of course, it didn't happen in my room. If it had, I could not have stayed. What was it? asked Mrs. Emerson in an awed voice. It was an awful thing. That child had lived in the house with her father and mother two years before. They had come, or the father had, from a real good family. He had a good situation. He was a drummer for a big leather house in the city, and they lived real pretty, with plenty to do with. But the mother was a real wicked woman. She was handsome as a picture, and they said she came from good sort of people enough in Boston, but she was bad clean through, though she was real pretty spoken and most everybody liked her. She used to dress out and make a great show, and she never seemed to take much interest in the child. Folks began to say she wasn't treated right. The woman had a hard time keeping a girl. For some reason, one wouldn't stay. They would leave and then talk about her awfully, telling all kinds of things. People didn't believe it at first, then they began to. They said the woman made that little thing, though she wasn't much over five years old, and small and babyish for her age, do most of the work. What there was done, they said the house used to look like a pigsty when she didn't have help. They said the little thing used to stand on a chair and wash the dishes, and they'd seen her carrying sticks of wood most as big as she was many a time, and they'd heard her mother scolding her. The woman was a fine singer, and had a voice like a screech owl when she scolded. The father was away most of the time, and when that happened he had been away out west for some weeks. There had been a married man hanging around the mother for some time, and the folks had talked some, but they weren't sure there was anything wrong, and he was a man very high up, with money, so they kept pretty still for fear he would hear of it and make trouble for them, and of course nobody was sure, though the folks did say afterward that the father of the child had ought to have been told. But that was very easy to say. It wouldn't have been so easy to find anybody who could have been willing to tell him such a thing like that, especially when they weren't any too sure. 
he set his eyes by his wife, too. They said all he seemed to think of was ways to earn money to buy things to deck her out in, and he worshipped the child, too. They said he was a real nice man. The men that are treated so bad mostly are real nice men. I've always noticed that. Well, one morning, that man that there had been whispered about was missing. He had been gone quite a while, though, before they really knew that he was missing, because he had gone away and told his wife that he had to go to New York on business and might be gone a week, not to worry if he didn't get home, not to worry if he didn't write, because he should be thinking from day to day that he might take the next train home and there would be no use in writing. So the wife waited, and she tried not to worry until it was two days over the week, then she ran into the neighbours and fainted dead away on the floor, and then they made inquiries and found out that he had skipped, with some money that didn't belong to him too. Then folks began to ask where was that woman, and they found out by comparing notes that nobody had seen her since the man went away, but three or four women remembered that she had told them that she thought of taking the child and going to Boston to visit her folks, so when they hadn't seen her a while and the house shut, they jumped to the conclusion that that was where she was. They were the neighbours that lived right around her, but they didn't have much to do with her, and she'd gone out of her way to tell them about her Boston plan, and they didn't make much reply when she did. Well, there was this house shut up, and the man and woman missing and the child. Then all of a sudden, one of the women that lived the nearest remembered something. She remembered that she waked up three nights ago running, thinking she heard a child crying somewhere, and once she waked up her husband, she said it must be the Bisbee's girl and she thought it must be. The child wasn't well and was always crying. It used to have colic spells, especially at night, so she didn't think any more about it until this came up. Then all of a sudden she did think of it. She told what she had heard, and finally folks began to think they had to better enter the house and see if there was anything wrong. Well, they did enter it, and they found that child dead, locked in one of the rooms. Mrs. Dennison and Mrs. Bird never used that room. It was in the back bedroom on the second floor. Yes, they found that poor child there, starved to death and frozen, though they weren't sure she had frozen to death, for she was in bed with clothes enough to keep her pretty warm when she was alive. But she had been there a week, and she was nothing but skin and bone. It looked as if the mother had locked her into the house when she went away, told her not to make any noise for fear the neighbours would hear and find out that she herself had gone. Mrs. Dennison said she couldn't really believe that the woman had meant to have her own child starved to death. Probably she thought the little thing would raise somebody, or folks would try and get in the house and find her. Well, whatever she thought, there the child was, dead. But that wasn't all. The father came home, right in the midst of it. The child was just buried, and he was beside himself. And he went on the track of his wife, and he found her, and he shot her dead. It was in all the papers at the time, then he disappeared. Nothing had been seen of him since. Mrs. Dennison said she thought he had either made way with himself or got out of the country. Nobody knew, but they did know there was something wrong with the house. I knew folks acted queer when they asked me how I liked it when we first came here, said Mrs. Dennison, but I never dreamed why till we saw the child that night. I never heard anything like it in my life, said Mrs. Emerson, staring at the other woman with awestruck eyes. I thought you'd say so, said Mrs. Meserve. You don't wonder that I ain't disposed to speak light when I hear there is anything queer about her house, do you? No, I don't after that, Mrs. Emerson said. But that ain't all, said Mrs. Meserve. Did you see it again? Mrs. Emerson asked. Yes, I saw it a number of times before the last time. It was lucky I wasn't nervous, or I never could have stayed there. Much as I liked the place, and much as I thought of those two women, they were beautiful women, and no mistake, I loved those women. I hope Mrs. Dennison will come and see me some time. Well, I stayed, and I never knew when I'd see that child. I got so I was very careful to bring everything of mine upstairs, and not to leave any little thing in my room that needed doing, for fear she would come lugging up my coat or hat or gloves, or I'd find things done when there'd be no live being in the room to do them. I can't tell you how I dreaded seeing her, and worse than seeing her was hearing her say, I can't find my mother. It was enough to make your blood run cold. I never heard a living child cry for its mother there was anything so pitiful as that dead one. It was enough to break your heart. She used to come and say that to Mrs. Bird oftener than anyone else. Once I heard Mrs. Bird say she wondered if it was possible that the poor little thing couldn't really find her mother in the other world. She had been such a wicked woman. But Mrs. Dennison told her she didn't think she ought to speak so, nor even think so, and Mrs. Bird said she shouldn't wonder if she was right. Mrs. Bird was always very easy to put in the wrong. She was a good woman 
and one that couldn't do things enough for her folks. It seemed as if that was what she lived on. I don't think she was ever so scared by that poor little ghost, as much as she pitied it, and she was most heartbroken because she couldn't do anything for it, as she could have done for a live child. It seems to me that sometimes as if I should die if I can't get that awful little white robe of that child, and get her in some clothes and feed her, and stop her looking for her mother, I heard her say once, and she was in earnest. She cried when she said it. That wasn't long before she died. Now I am coming to the strangest part of it all. Mrs. Bird died very sudden. One morning, it was Saturday, and there wasn't any school, I went downstairs to breakfast, and Mrs. Bird wasn't there. There was nobody but Mrs. Dennison. She was pouring out the coffee when I came in. Why, where's Mrs. Bird? says I. Abby ain't feeling very well this morning, says she. There isn't much to the matter, I guess, but she didn't sleep very well, and her head aches, and she's sort of chilly, and I told her I thought she'd better stay in bed until the house gets warm. It was a very cold morning. Maybe she's got a cold, says I. Yes, I guess she has, says Mrs. Dennison. I guess she's got a cold. She'll be up before long. Abby ain't one to stay in bed a minute longer than she can help. Well, we went on eating our breakfast, and all at once a shadow flickered across one wall of the room and over the ceiling the way a shadow will sometimes when somebody passes a window outside. Mrs. Dennison and I both looked up. Then Mrs. Dennison, she gives a scream. Why, Abby's crazy, then out of the says window. she. There she is out in the bitter cold morning, and, and, she didn't finish, but she meant the child, for we were both looking out, and we saw, as plain as we ever saw anything in our lives, Mrs. Abby Bird walking off over the white snow path with that child holding fast her hand, nestled close to her as if she had found her own mother. She's dead, says Mrs. Dennison, clutching hold of me hard. She's dead. My sister is dead. She was. We hurried upstairs as fast as we could go. She was dead in her bed and smiling as if she was dreaming, and one arm and hand was stretched out as if something had hold of it, and it couldn't be straightened even at last. It lay out over her casket at the funeral. "'Was the child ever seen again?' asked Mrs. Emerson with a shaking voice. "'No,' replied Mrs. Meserve. "'That child was never seen again after she went out of the yard with Mrs. Bird.'" End of The Lost Ghost Beyond the Wall of Sleep by H. P. Lovecraft This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by A. C. Bogus Beyond the Wall of Sleep by H. P. Lovecraft I have often wondered if the majority of mankind ever pause to reflect upon the occasionally titanic significance of dreams, and of the obscure world to which they belong. Whilst the greater number of our nocturnal visions are perhaps no more than faint and fantastic reflections of our waking experiences, Freud to the contrary with his puerile symbolism, there are still a certain remainder whose immundane and ethereal character permit of no ordinary interpretation and whose vaguely exciting and disquieting effect suggests possible minute glimpses into a sphere of mental existence no less important than physical life, yet separated from that life by an all but impassable barrier. From my experience, I cannot doubt but that man, when lost to terrestrial consciousness, is indeed sojourning in another and uncorporeal life, a far different nature from the life we know, and of which only the slightest and most indistinct memories linger after waking. From those blurred and fragmentary memories, we may infer much, yet prove little. We may guess that in dreams, life, matter, and vitality, as the earth knows such things, are not necessarily constant, and that time and space do not exist as our waking selves comprehend them. Sometimes I believe that this less material life is our truer life, and that our vain presence on this terraqueous globe is itself secondary or merely virtual phenomenon. It is from a youthful reverie filled with speculation of this sort that I arose one afternoon in the winter of 1900-1901, when to the state psychopathic institution in which I served as an intern was brought the man whose case has ever since haunted me so unceasingly. His name, as given on the records, was Joe Slater, or Slatter, and his appearance was that of the typical denizen of Catskill Mountain region, one of those strange repellent scions of a primitive colonial peasant stock 
whose isolation for nearly three centuries in the hilly fastness of a little-traveled countryside has caused them to sink to a kind of barbaric degeneracy, rather than advance with their more fortunately placed brethren of the thickly settled districts. Among these odd folk, who correspond exactly to the decadent element of white trash in the South, laws and morals are non-existent and their general mental status is probably below that of any other section of Native American people. Joe Slater, who came to the institution in the vigilant custody of four state policemen, and who was described as a highly dangerous character, certainly presented no evidence of his perilous disposition when I first beheld him. Though well above the middle stature and of somewhat brawny frame, he was given an absurd appearance of harmless stupidity by the pale sleepy blueness of his small watery eyes the scantiness of his neglected and never-shaven growth of yellow beard, and the listless drooping of his heavy nether lip. His age was unknown, since among his kind neither family records nor permanent family ties exist, but from the baldness of his head in front and from the decayed condition of his teeth, the head surgeon wrote him down as a man of about forty. From the medical and court documents we learned all that could be gathered from his case. This man, a vagabond, hunter, and trapper, had always been strange in the eyes of his primitive associates. He had habitually slept at night beyond the ordinary time, and upon waking would often talk of unknown things in a manner so bizarre as to inspire fear even in the hearts of an unimaginative populace. Not that his form of language was all that unusual, for he never spoke save in the debased patois of his environment, but the tone and tenor of his utterances were of such mysterious wildness that none might listen without apprehension. He himself was generally as terrified and baffled as his auditors, and within an hour after awakening would forget all that he had said, or at least all that had caused him to say what he did, relapsing into a bovine, hallamiable normality like that of the other hill-dwellers. As Slater grew older, it appeared his mutatant elaborations had gradually increased in frequency and violence till about a month before his arrival at the institution had occurred the shocking tragedy which caused his arrest by the authorities. One day near noon, after a profound sleep begun in a whiskey debauch at about five of the previous afternoon, the man had roused himself most suddenly, with ululations so horrible and unearthly, they brought several neighbors to his cabin, a filthy sty where he dwelt with a family as indescribable as himself. Rushing out into the snow, he had flung his arms aloft and commenced a series of leaps directly upward in the air, and while shouting his determination to reach some big, big cabin with brightness in the roof and walls and floor and loud, queer music far away. As two men of moderate size sought to restrain him, he had struggled with maniacal force and fury, screaming his desire and need to find and kill a certain thing that shines and shakes and laughs. At length, after temporarily felling one of his detainers with a sudden blow, he had flung himself upon the other in a demonic ecstasy of bloodthirstiness, shrieking fiendishly, that he would jump high in the air and burn his way through anything that stopped him. Family and neighbors had now fled in a panic, and when the more courageous of them returned, Slater was gone, leaving behind an unrecognizable pulp-like thing that had been a living man but an hour before. None of the mountaineers had dared to pursue him, and it is likely that they would have welcomed his death from the cold. But when several mornings later they heard his screams from a distant ravine, they realized that he had somehow managed to survive and that his removal, in one way or another, would be necessary. Then had followed an armed searching party, whose purpose, whatever it may have been originally, became that of a sheriff's posse, after one of the seldom popular state troopers had, by accident, observed, then questioned, and finally joined the seekers. On the third day, Slater was found unconscious in the hollow of a tree, and taken to the nearest jail, where alienists from Albany examined him as soon as his senses returned. To them he told a simple story. He had, he said, gone to sleep one afternoon about sundown after drinking too much liquor. He had awakened to find himself standing bloody-handed in the snow before his cabin, the mangled corpse of his neighbor Peter Slater at his feet. Horrified, he had taken to the woods in a vague effort to escape from the scene of what must have been his crime. Beyond these things he seemed to know nothing, nor could the expert questioning of his interrogators bring out a single additional fact. That night Slater slept quietly and the next morning he awakened with no singular feature save a certain alteration of expression. Dr. Barnard, who had been watching the patient, thought he noticed in the pale blue eyes a certain gleam of peculiar quality, and in the flaccid lips an all but imperceptible tightening, as if of intelligent determination. But when questioned, Slater relapsed into the habitual vacancy of the mountaineer, 
and only reiterated what he had said on the preceding day. On the third morning occurred the first of the man's mental attacks. After some show of uneasiness and sleep, he burst forth into a frenzy so powerful that the combined efforts of four men were needed to bind him in a straitjacket. Alienists listened with keen attention to his words, since their curiosity had been aroused to a high pitch by the suggestive yet mostly conflicting and incoherent stories of his family and neighbors. Slater raved for upwards of fifteen minutes, babbling in his backwoods dialect of green edifices of light, oceans of space, strange music, and shadowy mountains and valleys. But most of all did he dwell upon some mysterious blazing entity that shook and laughed and mocked at him. This vast, vague personality seemed to have done him a terrible wrong, and to kill it in triumphant revenge was his paramount desire. In order to reach it, he said, he would soar through abysses of emptiness, burning every obstacle that stood in his way. Thus ran his discourse, until with the greatest suddenness he ceased. The fire of madness died from his eyes, and in dull wonder he looked at his questioners and asked why he was bound. Dr. Bernard unbuckled the leather harness and did not restore it till night when he succeeded in persuading Slater to don it of his own volition for his own good. The man had now admitted that he sometimes talked queerly, though he knew not why. Within a week or two, more attacks appeared. But from them the doctors learned little. On the source of Slater's visions they speculated at length, for since he could neither read nor write, and had apparently never heard a legend or fairy tale, his gorgeous imagery was quite inexplicable that it could not come from any known myth or romance was made especially clear by the fact that the unfortunate lunatic expressed himself only in his own simple manner. He raved of things he did not understand and could not interpret, things which he claimed to have experienced but which he could not have learned through any normal or connected narration. The alienists soon agreed that abnormal dreams were the foundation of the trouble, dreams whose vividness could for a time completely dominate the walking mind of this basically inferior man. With due formality, Slater was tried for murder, acquitted on the ground of insanity, and committed to the institution wherein I held so humble a post. I have said that I am a constant speculator concerning dream life, and from this you may judge of the eagerness with which I applied myself to the study of the new patient as soon as I had fully ascertained the facts of his case. He seemed to sense a certain friendliness in me, born, no doubt, of the interest I could not conceal, and the gentle manner in which I questioned him. Not that he ever recognized me during his attacks, when I hung breathlessly upon his chaotic but cosmic word pictures, but he knew me in his quiet hours, when he would sit by his barred window weaving baskets of straw and willow, and perhaps pining for the mountain freedom he could never again enjoy. His family never called to see him, Probably it had found another temporary head after the manner of decadent mountain folk. By degrees I commenced to feel an overwhelming wonder at the mad and fantastic conceptions of Joe Slater. The man himself was pitiably inferior in mentality and language alike, but his glowing, titanic visions, though described in a barbarous, disjointed jargon, were assuredly things which only a superior or even exceptional brain could conceive how. I often asked myself could the stolid imagination of a Catskill degenerate conjure up sights whose very possession argued a lurking spark of genius. How could any backwards dullard have gained so much as an idea of those glittering realms of supernal radiance and space about which Slater ranted in his furious delirium? More and more I inclined to the belief that in the pitiful personality who cringed before me lay the disordered nucleus of something beyond my comprehension, something infinitely beyond the comprehension of my more experienced but less imaginative medical and scientific colleagues. And yet I could extract nothing definite from the man. The sum of all my investigation was that in a kind of semi-corporeal dream life, Slater wandered or floated through resplendent and prodigious valleys, meadows, gardens, cities, and palaces of light, in a region unbounded and unknown to man, that there he was no peasant or degenerate, but a creature of importance and vivid life, moving proudly and dominantly, and checked only by a certain deadly enemy, who seemed to be a being of visible yet ethereal structure, and who did not appear to be of human shape, since Slater never referred to it as a man, or as aught save a thing. This thing had done Slater some hideous but unnamed wrong, which the maniac of maniac he were yearned to avenge. From the manner in which Slater alluded to their dealings, I judged that he and the luminous thing had met on equal terms, 
that in his dream existence the man was himself a luminous thing of the same race as his enemy. This impression was sustained by his frequent references to flying through space and burning all that impeded his progress. Yet these conceptions were formulated in rustic words wholly inadequate to convey them. A circumstance which drove me to the conclusion that if a dream world indeed existed, oral language was not its medium for the transmission of thought. Could it be that the dream soul inhabiting this inferior body was desperately struggling to speak things which the simple and halting tongue of dullness could not utter? Could it be that I was face to face with intellectual emanations which would explain the mystery if I could but learn to discover and read them? I did not tell the older physicians of these things, for middle age is skeptical, cynical, and disinclined to accept new ideas. Besides, the head of the institution had but lately warned me in his paternal way that I was overworking, that my mind needed a rest. It had long been my belief that human thought consists basically of atomic or molecular motion, convertible into either waves or radiant energy like heat, light, and electricity. This belief had early led me to contemplate the possibility of telepathy or mental communication by means of suitable apparatus, and I had in my college days prepared a set of transmitting and receiving instruments somewhat similar to the cumbrous devices employed in the wireless telegraphy at that crude pre-radio period. These I had tested with a fellow student, but achieving no result, had soon packed them away with other scientific odds and ends for possible future use. Now in my intense desire to probe into the dream life of Joe Slater, I sought these instruments again. I spent several days in repairing them for action. When they were complete once more, I missed no opportunity for their trial. At each outburst of Slater's violence, I would fit the transmitter to his forehead and the receiver to my own, constantly making delicate adjustments for the various hypothetical wavelengths of intellectual energy. I had but little notion of how the thought impressions would, if successfully conveyed, arouse an intelligent response in my brain, but I felt certain that I could detect and interpret them. Accordingly, I continued my experiments, though informing no one of their nature. It was on the 21st of February, 1901, that the thing occurred. As I look back across the years, I realize how unreal it seems, and sometimes wonder if old Dr. Fenton was not right when he charged it all to my excited imagination. I recall that he listened with great kindness and patience when I told him, but afterwards he gave me a nerve powder and arranged for the half-year's vacation on which I departed the next week. That fateful night I was wildly agitated and perturbed, for despite the excellent care he received, Joe Slater was unmistakably dying. Perhaps it was his mountain freedom that he missed, or perhaps the turmoil in his brain had grown too acute for his rather sluggish physique. But at all events the flame of vitality flickered low in the decadent body. He was drowsy near the end, and as darkness fell, he dropped off into a troubled sleep. I did not strap on the straitjacket, as was customary when he slept, since I saw that he was too feeble to be dangerous, even if he woke in mental disorder once more before passing away. But I did place upon his head and mine the two ends of my cosmic radio, hoping against hope for a first and last message from the dream world in the brief time remaining. In the cell with us, was one nurse, a mediocre fellow who did not understand the purpose of the apparatus or think to inquire into my course. As the hours wore on, I saw his head droop awkwardly in sleep, but I did not disturb him. I myself, lulled by the rhythmical breathing of the healthy and the dying man, must have nodded a little later. The sound of weird lyric melody was what aroused me. Chords, vibrations, and harmonic ecstasies echoed passionately on every hand, while on my ravaged sight burst the stupendous spectacle ultimate beauty. Walls, columns, and architraves of living fire blazed effulgently around the spot where I seemed to float in air, extending upward to an infinitely high vaulted dome of indescribable splendor. Blending with this display of palatial magnificence, or rather supplanting it at times in kaleidoscopic rotation, were glimpses of wide plains and graceful valleys, high mountains and inviting grottoes, covered with every lovely attribute of scenery which my delighted eyes could conceive of, yet formed wholly of some glowing ethereal plastic entity, which in consistency partook as much of spirit as of matter. As I gazed, I perceived that my own brain held the key to these enchanted metamorphoses, for each vista which appeared to me was the one my changing mind most wished to behold. Amidst this Elysian realm, I dwelt not as a stranger, for each sight and sound was familiar to me, just as it had been for uncounted eons of eternity before, and would be for like eternities to come. Then the resplendent aura of my brother of light drew near and held colloquy with me, 
soul to soul with silent and perfect interchange of thought. The hour was one of approaching triumph, for was not my fellow being escaping at last from a degrading periodic bondage, escaping forever and preparing to follow the accursed oppressor even unto the uttermost fields of ether? That upon it might be wrought a flaming cosmic vengeance which would shake the spheres? We floated thus for a little time, when I perceived a slight blurring and fading of the objects around us, as though some force were recalling me to earth, where I least wished to go. The form near me seemed to feel a change also, for it gradually brought its discourse toward a conclusion, and itself prepared to quit the scene, fading from my sight at a rate somewhat less rapid than that of the other objects. A few more thoughts were exchanged, and I knew that the luminous one and I were being recalled to bondage, though for my brother of light it would be the last time. The sorry planet shell being well nigh spent, in less than an hour my fellow would be free to pursue the oppressor along the Milky Way and pass the hither stars to the very confines of infinity. A well-defined shock separates my final impression of the fading scene of light from my sudden and somewhat shamefaced awakening and straightening up in my chair, as I saw the dying figure on the couch move hesitantly. Joe Slater was indeed awakening, though probably for the last time. As I looked more closely, I saw in the shallow cheeks shone spots of color which had never before been present. The lips, too, seemed unusual, being tightly compressed, as if by the force of a stronger character than had been Slater's. The whole face finally began to grow tense, and the head turned restlessly with closed eyes. I did not rouse the sleeping nurse, but readjusted the slightly disarranged headband of my telepathic radio, intent to catch any parting message the dreamer might have to deliver. All at once the head turned sharply in my direction, and the eyes fell open, causing me to stare in blank amazement at what I beheld. The man who had been Joe Slater, the Catskill decadent, was gazing at me with a pair of luminous expanding eyes whose blue seemed subtly to have deepened. Neither mania nor degeneracy was visible in that gaze, and I felt beyond a doubt that I was viewing a face behind which lay an active mind of high order. At this juncture my brain became aware of a steady external influence operating on it. I closed my eyes to concentrate my thoughts more profoundly, and was rewarded by the positive knowledge that my long-sought mental message had come at last. Each transmitted idea formed rapidly in my mind, and though no actual language was employed, my habitual association of conception and expression was so great that I seemed to be receiving the message in ordinary English. Joe Slater is dead, came the sole petrifying voice of an agency from beyond the wall of sleep. My opened eyes sought the couch of pain and curious horror, but the blue eyes were still calmly gazing, and the countenance was still intelligently animated. He is better dead, for he was unfit to bear the active intellect of cosmic entity. His gross body could not undergo the needed adjustments between ethereal life and planet life. He was too much an animal, too little a man. Yet it is through his deficiency that you have come to discover me, for the cosmic and planet souls rightly should never meet. He has been in my torment and diurnal prison for forty-two of your terrestrial years. I am an entity like that which you yourself become in the freedom of dreamless sleep. I am your brother of light, and have floated with you in the effulgent valleys. It is not permitted me to tell your waking earth self of your real self, but we are all roamers of vast spaces and travelers in many ages. Next year I may be dwelling in the Egypt, which you call ancient or in the cruel empire of Tsan Chang, which is to come three thousand years hence. You and I have drifted to worlds that reel about the red Arcturus, and dwelt in the bodies of insect philosophers that crawl proudly over the fourth moon of Jupiter. How little does the earth's self know life in its extent, how little indeed ought it to know for its own tranquility. Of the oppressor I cannot speak. You on earth have unwittingly felt its distant presence. You who without knowing idly gave the blinking beacon the name of Al Gol, the demon star. It is to meet and conquer the oppressor that I have vainly striven for eons, held back by bodily encumbrances. Tonight I go as a nemesis bearing just and blazingly cataclysmic vengeance. Watch me in the sky close by the demon star. I cannot speak longer, for the body of Joe Slater grows cold and rigid, and the coarse brains are ceasing to vibrate as I wish. You have been my only friend on this planet, the only soul to sense and seek for me within the repellent form which lies on this couch. We shall meet again, perhaps in the shining mists of Orion's sword, perhaps on a bleak plateau in prehistoric Asia, 
perhaps in unremembered dreams tonight, perhaps in some other form an eon hence when the solar system shall have been swept away. At this point the thought waves abruptly ceased. The pale eyes of the dreamer, or can I say dead man, commenced to glaze fishily. In a half-stupor I crossed over to the couch and felt of his wrist, but found it cold, stiff, and pulseless. The sallow cheeks paled again, and the thick lips fell open, disclosing the repulsively rotten fangs of the degenerate Joe Slater. I shivered, pulled a blanket over the hideous face, and awakened the nurse. Then I left the cell and went silently to my room. I had an instant and unaccountable craving for a sleep whose dreams I should not remember. The climax? What plain tale of science can boast of such a rhetorical effect? I have merely set down certain things appealing to me as facts, allowing you to construe them as you will. As I have already admitted, my superior, old Dr. Fenton, denies the reality of everything I have related. He vows that I was broken down with nervous strain, and badly in need of a long vacation on full pay which he so generously gave me. He assures me on his professional honor that Joe Slater was but a low-grade paranoiac, whose fantastic notions must have come from the crude hereditary folk tales which circulated in even the most decadent of communities. All this, he tells me, yet I cannot forget what I saw in the sky on the night after Slater died. Lest you think me a biased witness, another pen must add this final testimony, which may perhaps supply the climax you expect. I will quote the following account of the star Nova Perse Verbatim from the pages of the eminent astronomical authority Professor Garrett P. Service. On February 22, 1901, a marvelous new star was discovered by Dr. Anderson of Edinburgh, not very far from Algol. No star had been visible at that point before. Within 24 hours, the stranger had become so bright that it outshone Capella. In a week or two, it had visibly faded, and in the course of a few months, it was hardly discernible with the naked eye. The End of Beyond the Wall of Sleep mm -hmm.